Et bon, bonjour à tous. Voilà, euh, euh, Pachi Elissa, je suis directeur de l'Estia, je suis euh, chargé par Serge Elisquet d'ouvrir la séance. Euh, voilà, je serai, je serai assez bref. Voilà, je d'abord euh, pour vous dire que je suis très fier d'accueillir ce workshop aujourd'hui à l'Estia dans le cadre d'un projet organisé dans le cadre d'un projet européen qui, dont le kick-off était hier, un projet européen à visée mondiale qui s'appelle Deep Farm, que, que, que Serge Miranda a, a monté avec des partenaires de euh, plusieurs pays, euh, Haïti, Côte d'Ivoire, Chypre, etc. Voilà, à partir d'une plateforme développée à, à, à l'Estia qui doit continuer à être développée euh, dans le cadre de, de, de ce programme-là. Donc l'ambition est d'utiliser les, les technologies de, de, de l'IA pour servir et contribuer au euh, développement de l'agriculture intelligente, notamment dans les pays euh, qui ont besoin de, de, de support pour améliorer la, la productivité, en quelque sorte, même si un, ça peut être considéré comme un gros mot, la, la, la productivité ou la compétitivité des activités agricoles. Voilà. Euh, donc, euh, merci à, à Serge d'avoir initié ce, ce, ces travaux au sein de, de, de l'Estia. Merci à tous les intervenants de cette mobilisée pour euh, contribuer à, à, au programme hein, qui, qui, est, qui est très riche aujourd'hui avec des choses relatives à l'observation de la terre et aux données satellitaires, avec des choses relatives à la surveillance des cultures par des capteurs intelligents et, et par, des, par des technologies du type drone, et, etc. Donc euh, voilà, donc merci à, à, à vous tous. Je suis sûr que de cette journée, plusieurs pistes euh, de, de, de nouveaux projets euh, naîtront et permettront d'être développés dans le Deep Farm ou dans d'autres programmes. Voilà. Donc pour l'Estia, École d'ingénieurs, c'est un projet important et qui euh, s'inscrit dans le cadre euh, de formation spécialisée dans le domaine de Big Data et de l'IA, donc de, du master Billard en particulier, et aussi dans le cadre du développement d'une plateforme de, de recherche appliquée, un démonstrateur d'usage de, 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 de l'IA dans plusieurs domaines, et en particulier dans le domaine agri-agro, viticole, etc., qu'on appelle le Data Lab, donc laboratoire d'expérimentation et de test d'usage de l'IA dans des contextes professionnels. Voilà, donc le Data Lab est monté en 2024. Et son démarrage, son lancement opérationnel se fait dans le cadre de Deep Farm et donc de la journée d'aujourd'hui que voilà, je, je, je souhaite fructueuse pour, pour vous tous. Voilà, merci de votre attention. Merci Michquette. Merci Serge, et puis je passe donc la parole à, euh, à, à, à Michette vais, ouais, pour la présentation la du programme. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, bonne journée à tous. Merci. Euh, alors maintenant, alors merci beaucoup Pachi pour, pour ces mots d'ouverture. Uh, now we will just switch uh, to English, uh, so we will have the pleasure to listen to Mark Lassus. So please, Mark, if you can join us on, this, on the stage, thank you. Thank you, Mishk. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we might wonder what I'm doing here. I've been invited by uh, Professor Serge Miranda, and uh, uh, well, I'm going to participate to a seminar about new technologies dedicated to uh, agriculture, digital agriculture. And uh, if you look at the first slide, well, I have nothing to do with that. Uh, I was involved in uh, GemPlus, a company who developed smart cards all over the world. You have a smart card in your pocket, in mobile phone, SIM card, telephone card. Uh, banking, but uh, nothing to do with agriculture. 
And uh, as you know, I'm not really ready, apparently, to talk about these new technologies around artificial intelligence, uh, big data, robotics, uh, IOTs, etc., etc. However, uh, I will try to explain to you why I've been invited. In addition here, you see that I'm going to talk about Kazao Deden. This is a local language uh, in the county close to here called Bearn. Kazao Deden means Garden of Eden, which is a paradise for most of the religions. So everything is strange. However, I will try to explain to you why it be, could be my contribution. Small is beautiful. Here you have an example of a shepherd of this country, very close to here. And this uh, gentleman, this guy, normally, every summer, he goes in the mountain, up in the mountain, here in the mountain, pushing the sheep to, uh, to have access to grass. Well, since he's uh, from the region in Bayonne, we are in Bayonne, close to Bayonne today, he has a ham, very famous ham from Bayonne. And also, what we like very much is the, the small paper from Espelet. This paper are well known all over the world, including in Japan, by the big uh, chef in China, America, etc. So this is coming from here. But uh, what, what, what I mean by that? Well, I'm not. I could have been the little guy because my grandfather used to push sheep in the mountain as well. He used to have goats, horses. But I didn't follow him. And uh, those guys, many of them during the last two centuries, used to go to United States, especially California, because they were pushing ships from Canada, the border of Canada in, uh, in north of uh, California, and uh, going down to Mexico. And I met some of those guys a long time ago in Arizona. So they were speaking Basque only and Spanish and a little bit of French. But uh, my decision was to also, I wanted to go to California. But I didn't go to California for pushing ships. I went to California to push electrons and transistor. Look at what was happening at that time. You have an IBM memory. It's the early, late 50, early 60, when I went to the States. And this is a hard ca this capacity of 30.7 megabyte. Today, or 30 or 40 years later, uh, we had a product, a memory, not larger than uh, the nail, the, the tip of the, your finger nail, with a capacity 13,000 times great, greater, 1 billion times lighter, access time 1 billion times shorter, and one billion times cheaper. This is small, is beautiful. This is really what this technology achieved. You have the same thing with a personal computer. And Mr. Steve Jobs from Apple did a much, uh, a much better job as well, few 30 years later. So it's where I've been involved, and I benefited from that. If you look at uh, the number of transistors per chip, in 60, only one per silicon chip. And uh, Dr. Shokre got the Nobel Prize for that. And then many people follow him, but only they were all professors of universities of Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley. All of them were professors like uh, Professor Miranda. And uh, after developing one transistor, they put 100 of them, so it became an uh, integrated circuit or memory. And then look at the today, today we are at 50 billion transistor in a in single device. Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel with Bob Noyce and, uh, and um, I forgot the name of the third one, <laughs> uh, 
Well, anyway, um, Andy Grove, Andy Grove. Also, Les Hogan, so they founded Intel. Everything starts with professors in universities. Les Hogan founded Motorola Semiconductor. Another came with National Semiconductor, Texas Instrument, uh, Fairchild, etc. So today we have the in a 50 billion transistor in a single device. Bec and the, the most law was, which was to announce that every year the complexity of the, the integrated circuits or memories were doubling has been beaten because the new technologies move from 2D to 3D. So what has to do with uh, agriculture? IT in, uh, in agriculture, so I'll let, I'll let you know. And the major problem today, not only for agriculture, but for all of us, is water. Access to water is a major problem. Scarcity of water is affecting all of us in the world. Two, people, two billion people on Earth lack access to drinkable water. Every day, 2,500 children die because water con corruption, consumption par parasitize. Disease related to qua water quality is terrible. But let's look at the pizza on the right side. 97.5% of water on Earth is uh, salt water, ocean seas. And only, only 0.01% is drinkable water. Well, drinkable, not necessarily, but river, lakes, etc. So the, the scarcity of the water on Earth is terrible, and uh, the population is increasing, the consumption is increasing, so we have a major, major problem today with water. And of course, this is affecting uh, agriculture. Of course, the temptation is to use this huge amount of salt water all over the world. And uh, major plants have been developed in the world, uh, Middle East, United States, Spain, Israel, with major desalination plant. It works, but this has many, many problems. Those factories are huge, very expensive, several billion dollars. It takes two years to build them, and they use only fossil energy, coal, gas, petrol, and oil, sometimes nuclear energy. And maybe the worst, they are throwing away in the water brine, which is highly saturated water. If you take uh, some volume of water, 50% will become highly purified water, very, very high quality, but the rest is highly saturated water. It's even worse than the, the Dead Sea. And uh, those plants are, have to be stopped because now they saw the water with big pipes, big, uh, big uh, uh, tunnel, with big pipes down in the, in the sea at uh, very deep, uh, deep uh, sites. But it's, it's very, very, very bad. And uh, only rich country can afford it. Only close to large cities to share the cost per inhabitant. So it's not really a solution which can be applicable in many places in the world, especially in poor countries, developing countries, or close to uh, people like us. So we developed at What Energy, which is a company we started a uh, few, few years ago, we developed an alternative to this big plant. This is a system which is very small, as you can see on the picture. It uh, uses uh, containers, marine containers. Inside the container is uh, the engine, which is uh, uh, the system used also by, by the big plant. is reverse osmosis. Everything is, the energy comes only from the sun. And sometimes on the seaside you have wind, so we have very small wind turbines. 
and uh, uh, the energy is free. The system is very inexpensive. We use uh, used containers. We have thousand, hundred thousand of them in the in the in the ports, and we can go up to fifteen thousand liters a day of drinking water, very very pure water. And uh, uh, this is uh, very inexpensive, and it can be installed anywhere with seawater. Well, we can also uh, purify water coming from the ground, deep aquifers, and uh, so even we need, we need less energy than for salt water to purify the water, so it's only it's only it's also usable inland. The beauty about our system, which is patented, is not is the fact that we are not throwing away th the brine, which is a highly salted, rejected water. We are keeping it, and we we collect the salt with the sun again. We collect the salt, highly purified, uh, pure salt, from the brine, which makes the, the cost of the water even much cheaper. It's where small is beautiful compared to these big plants. So it's one contribution, and it's one reason also I'm here to, today to talk about, about small is beautiful. I will show you now another system which we developed, and uh, it is installed in the uh, northeast of Australia, alo alo around the, the coral reef. Uh, there's no music, a little bit of music? Oh, no, okay, I'm sorry. So this is uh, it's totally autonomous. We just dig a hole in the sand and then try to reach the rock or the coral reef, and uh, we put a big tube, and then we, we mount the, the system which is using, you can see the so solar panel, and you can see also the wind turbine on the top. So this is totally autonomous. When the bird goes back home, and the sun is going down, we might have some wind, we are on the seaside. We don't have sun, but we have also the battery inside the pole, and so we have enough energy, sometimes with the autonomy of few days, to light the place. In addition, we have all kind of connections, antennas, Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, uh, satellite communication. And this is very totally autonomous, very inexpensive, and we can put this all over the world. We are thinking about using this as beacons for, the, for boats on many islands. So if you look at what we did on desalination of water, this system complete, complete our offer, and we are also the number one asset is the cost for both water desalination and this kind of system providing energy, communication. Our mantra is cost with uh, thanks to volume like we did in semiconductor. Semiconductor become very, very inexpensive because of the volume. So it's what we do here as well. Water, energy, and can be provided anywhere in the world, especially on thousands, hundreds of thousands of islands, which are not habited today. They are inhabited because we, we don't have water. So providing energy, water, then we can start making island for life because we can bring agriculture. And it's where we come to agriculture. So the next slide here show you a totally integrated system, what we call all-in-one, but also with small is beautiful. So we start with energy, solar, wind, biomass, recycling products like uh, uh, oil used by the Ladies, when they cook, today they throw away this uh, oil. And uh, eventually, we will use also hydrogen, of course. So energy. Then 
you saw that with energy we can make water from desalination or from purification. It can be used for agriculture, of course, for drinking. And also, we want to recycle the water. We don't want to send that away. We can purify the used water. In addition, we bring security. I forgot to tell you, but we have, uh, of course, car movie cameras in the, in the system. We have connectivity, of course, GS GSM, Wi-Fi, satellite. Education with MOOCs, and it's what we developed with uh, Professor Serge Miranda here at Estia. Very, very important. And uh, uh, food products, of course. We have water, we have energy, we have sun, well, vegetable food. Algae, algae is very, very important, especially in the thousands of islands where we algae are, very, are growing very, very fast. They purify the water, they collect the CO2, and uh, we can also make uh, uh, biomass in very large volume. Uh, Fisiculture is for fish, apiculture is for bees, and of course, we have uh, also greenhouses, uh, totally autonomous, using also sun and using also communications. Security with lighting, surveillance, so everything can be integrated into a single offer. And again, the motto, the mantra is quality, volume, and cost. Well, just an example here. I told you that we were, when we were young, we want to go to California. Here we are again in California, it's different. It's our system which is installed on the San Francisco Bay, and you can see the uh, the bridge on the, on the, the <laughs> oh, I forgot the name of the bridge, <laughs> Golden Gate, Golden Gate Bridge. So we have we sold not only to Australia, but we also start selling in uh, California. Now, with the people who are going to talk today after me here, we really need we really need your help. The the news are not good. Water is a major issue. Uh, big systems are sometimes in competition with small systems. And uh, you people who are going to talk after me, we need your help. Why? Do you know that during the last 20 years, 4 million small farmers disappear in the US, in the Europe? 40 million. Here in the region, in the county, it's about 1,000 a year, which is a lot. And unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, agriculture, but it's agro-industry. With big systems, big piece of land, they put together all the small farms to get more land. And uh, unfortunately, the system kills the bees and uh, pollinators, which is very bad for all the culture, and of course, uh, it kills and disseminates the, the small farmers. So today I'm talking about small farmers, and we need your help to s get them surviving. The young people don't, do, don't, don't want to be involved anymore in small farming. Well, today, if you go in outside, you don't, it's very rare when you see cows uh, eating uh, grass in the field. They are raised in huge stable and they are fed with grown cereals and they don't move. So we get the milk from cows which never saw the, the sun outside. It's uh, unbelievable. Well, for poultry also, the poultry are totally put together. Millions of poultry don't go outside anymore. So we get the eggs from <laughs> uh, uh, chicken. How do you say pool? Chicken? chicken? Yeah. yeah, but your chicken is a male, your chicken is a female. <laughs> In France, you have the pool. <laughs> eh? Okay. Okay, okay. And, and, okay. Sorry. Uh, 
And uh, our food industry with these big systems don't feed people anymore. They feed cattle or they produce biocarburants. Biocarburants with corn, uh, soja. Also, we destroy forest in uh, Asia to grow, uh, to grow, uh, um, well, uh, trees providing oil in uh, eh? palm trees. Yeah, in uh, in Brazil we we grow uh, sugar cane and we make oil. This uh, big uh, uh, big system in agriculture, they confiscate rare waters and, uh, and control also and modify the plant seed. The soils are destroyed with pesticides, chemicals, killing microorganisms, bugs and birds. And most of the food consumed in, the U U in the Europe is important. That's the bad news. Now, what we need to do with you guys is what we call a mission at Garden of Eden, Casa of Eden. We have to adapt digital agriculture and technology to the family farmer environment. It's what we, we want to do, it's what we're starting to do. If we don't do it now, these farmers, small farmers, family farmers, will be aband abandoned on forever on the side of the road. So it's very, very important, very urgent. And the key, the key factor to solve that is education. And it's what we are doing here today. And what is Serge Miranda with his, his partners at Estia are developing. And not only they are developing for France, which is important, we are in France, but we are already involved in many, many countries, in Asia, in, uh, <coughs> in the Madagascar, in uh, Haiti, uh, in uh, Polynesia, etc., etc. We want to, and we are going to help small farmers to grow higher value added products and to transfer their product to be able to market. So we, we need help, and uh, we are going to put together many, many small farmers, and we are going to collect their products and help them in selling them and transforming them. What is also quite interesting is to install what we call agrivoltaic structure over their plantation, which are uh, solar panels covering the, their land, their production. And uh, this is uh, very important to optimize the, the, the soil, the sun, but also to fight against frost and uh, uh, what we call grail. I forgot the name of the grail. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, I've got it here somewhere. Okay, it's the uh, ice coming from the s from the eh? hail. 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 hail, hail, yeah. So this is very interesting because they get uh, revenues from uh, uh, energy, from electricity, and also they protect and develop better their, their production. We want to help those small farmers, family farmers, to return to, to the traditional agriculture instead of using highly capital, enormous machines, tractors, and uh, trailers, all of them basically manufactured in the USA. And today there is a, <laughs> a strike of some of the uh, farmers in France and you see around the, the road, big, big trucks, big tra uh, tractor. I'm not calling that agriculture. It's industry. And uh, very important, and uh, with the support of uh, Serge Miranda, Professor Miranda and Estia, we would like to, to reinforce and to develop duplicate education. We want to promote the concept of uh, installing 10,000 schools with 10 students 
all of the places in the world, on the island, in the country, everywhere. And instead of having one university of 10,000 students. So again, it's worth small, it's beautiful. So that's the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Look at how they then is in a local language in, in the county here in Béarnais. And Esker is in a Basque language, means thank you very much. A wind turbine, you saw about wind turbine, this is coming from a local sport, Flotte Basque, with Haralai. And <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so the design of a wind turbine uh, as a source here with a <laughs> Shistera. Thank you very much. Merci. Sheshe in Chinese and Milesker in Basque. Thank you. So first, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me and giving me the, the opportunity to, to present a, uh, a project that was run a, a few years ago. And uh, thanks for the organizer. And um, as a context, I will talk a little bit about the, the, the feature of agriculture in Africa. Uh, a few slides of introduction uh, showing this feature, challenges and uh, and then an example of uh, a demonstrator, a digital initiative to support family farming in this continent. So a few words of myself, maybe uh, I'm Patrick Armango, I'm research program manager at INRIA. I'm in charge of the, the program uh, Agroecology and Digital Technologies. It's an initiative funded by uh, France 2030 program. And, uh, and uh, what I'm going to present today is a, a past project that I will show. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with African agriculture. So uh, on this slide, you can see a list of the feature of uh, African family agriculture. It's really a, a, a pragmatic and very operational uh, perspective. So my first point is that uh, when we talk about family agriculture in Africa, the first thing to, to remind is that Africa is a continent and there are very big differences between countries in terms of territories, uh, climate, also cultural uh, context, agricultural and commercial policies. Uh, the second point which is important is that there is uh, three main food security crops because as you will see, I will really focus on food security here. It's uh, maize first, the first uh, uh, of them, then cassava and sorghum. Uh, these uh, both uh, later crops are known to be drought tolerant. And we have just seen that water is really important. Now, what about small holders? Uh, small older farmers, who are they? In fact, uh, in Africa, everybody is a farmer. Uh, so that's why uh, Africa agriculture is managed uh, by 80% by smaller farmers. So it represents a lot of people, more than 30 million farmers. That has uh, less than two hectares in their surface. And uh, the project I'm going to show here uh, concern people that having uh, a quarter of an hectare in fact, so it's, it's like a garden. They are producing food in their garden, right? This is really important to realize. Uh, then it's a rain-fed agriculture and crops rely on adequate and timely rainfall to grow. It means there are a lot of accidents in terms of uh, sowing, germination and so on. And then as you know, it's a low productivity agriculture. Um, Maize, uh, cassava, and sorghum are, are really uh, low yielding uh, because of numerous reasons. And uh, I will mention a few of them here. Uh, of course, uh, there is a strong lack of infrastructure in terms of agro equipment, intrant access and harvest storage. And finally, there is no or limited access to markets and finance because you have to realize that to be able to buy some fertilizers, you have to, to subscribe to a, to a loan, to a credit, and to, to, uh, to pray for your production to be sufficient to be uh, able to reimburse this, uh, this loan. So these are the features. Now let's go to challenges. 
so the challenges are numerous. The first of them being food insecurity. Uh, and the, the last numbers are, are quite frightening. 61% of the 1.5 billion African people are exposed to moderate or serious food insecurity. Um, this food insecurity is further uh, aggravated by climate change, uh, with having more extreme, extrema, uh, tornadoes, uh, uh, storms, uh, keeping in mind that the rain failed, uh, rain fed agriculture, uh, there is no irrigation, there is also poor soil, poor soil fertilities and erosion issues. Then there are environmental issues, and uh, this is a very sensitive topic. Uh, uh, if we talk about forest preservation, and the European Union has uh, has uh, put a law on, on, on the importation of, uh, of food from Africa to, to guarantee that there are not issues from uh, deforestation. But there are also topics uh, that uh, deals with misuse of fertilizers uh, that are leading to lake atrophization. There are issues with wildlife intrusions in certain countries. Uh, now, the most uh, the strongest issues uh, this year was the geopolitical issues with the, the wars in Ukraine that lead to uh, increase the fertilizer prices by a factor of three that really hampered uh, also uh, or changed the agricultural policies of neighboring countries in their importation and exportation uh, possibilities. And of course, most of African countries are in debt. So the country economics is really important and agriculture is really a mean to, 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 uh, to, to change this. And uh, to finish a few, a few points on about uh, land tenure, there is poor or no cadastral data, poor or no land rights. Uh, another information is gender inequality. Uh, what you have to know is that most of farmers in Africa are, are, are women. Uh, and this is really important to realize. And the last word about technology adoption. Uh, in, in the project I'm going to show, uh, there was no issues with technology adoption. In fact, uh, they are really open to, to new technologies. They are using their smartphones uh, much more than us. Uh, and uh, this is really uh, the, 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 the good, good side of uh, African people. Uh, now, how digital technologies can improve this uh, African agriculture? So there are four means. The first one is simply access to information in terms of weather forecast, good agricultural practice, and so on. Uh, the second mean is a climate smart agriculture, and I will show an example, where uh, we are using the technology and particularly modeling uh, to monitor weather pattern, fertilizer use, and needs track carbon emission in order to prepare for a carbon market that can really be beneficial for, for Africa. And uh, of course, improve water management and reduce an environmental, environmental impact, sorry. And the last two points are market linkage because digital technology is, is very simple to, to connect farmers with, uh, with banks, with uh, finances in order to, to allow loans and uh, ensure uh, maybe uh, they are they are they're low, and this is also the case for financial uh, inclusion. So uh, the project I'm going to show is called uh, Kilimo. It's an example of an end-to-end -end approach to decide, apply, and monitor agricultural policy specifically uh, targeted to smallholder farmer. So it's really a project that uh, integrates technologies, but also different scientific topics from agricultural data crop model, decision support, also digital platform. And at the end of the day, uh, a deployment uh, that involve a lot of local resources in terms of human resources. And uh, so this demonstrator was really a proof of concept to integrate all these technologies. And I'm gonna show that right now. So this Kilimo, so Kilimo, it means, uh, it's an acronym for Kenyan Innovation for Low Input Maize Production but it means also agriculture in Swahili. So it's a project that was funded by the French Ministry of Economy, and it's a, a private consortium initiatives led by ITK, 
uh, with uh, French companies such as Airbus and GE Data, which is a GIS company, and a Kenyan company, uh, Locate IT. And all this project took place in the Viga County in the middle of, uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, west of Kenya. So this project, what is, the, uh, what is it for? It's really, again, it's really operational and practical. And it's really focused on the use case to provide authorities with global geostatistics in order to generate uh, data-driven uh, politics, which is not always the case in Africa. It allows to provide status and direction of agricultural policies using land use and cultivated surfaces by crop value chain, and also a dynamic agricultural geostatistic platform. This is related to operational services, to agricultural services that are called extension services, uh, which are scattered in each country where there are extension officers that can be uh, considered as agricultural advisors that are driving, that are supporting farmers in their operation. However, uh, they have issues with mobilities, they have issues with skills, with agronomy and so on, and they really need some support from science in order to strengthen their, their, their impact and operation. And uh, of course, the uh, uh, the, this platform is uh, first also for farmers in order to, to, to provide uh, agronomic practices that are tailored to what they have done in their own fields. So farmers are, are, are not structures like in Europe. They, uh, we are in villages, we are in group of farmers, and uh, it's, uh, they are really welcoming any form of support and advice and they are, they, are, they are really open to, to, to improvement in their practices that are traditional practices. So some of them are good, some of them are definitely to avoid uh, in order to, 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 to improve the quality of their soil. So for each of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, use case target, we have provided uh, uh, through technology different type of outputs that are illustrated here. So for geostatistics, it's maps and uh, decision uh, or, and perspective of uh, productivity and soil health. For agricultural services, we are provide, uh, in this project, we have provided digital platforms, allowing extension officers to clearly define and evaluate their own advice uh, that are translated into messages that will go to farmers uh, in order to, to support their own activities uh, and in the same time provide a validation of their activities so that we got, in, we got information back. It's also a data collection tool in order to uh, generate tailored advice and to be able to get data. Uh, data is really uh, the missing bit uh, in the, all this story. So I will illustrate a little bit uh, each of this of this component. Uh, so if we open uh, the box here, we have uh, three kinds of technology: geospatial imagery, crop modeling, and digital agriculture and capacity building. In geospatial imagery, I will illustrate that in a second. I will present only crop mapping and field acreage. I won't go into biophysical analysis that aims at monitoring crop within a field. Uh, because uh, we have deployed that and uh, realized that for smallholder farmers, it's uh, not the priority, it's more for commercial producers. Um, and this kind of biophysical analytics allows services such as early warning or anomaly reports. Uh, in terms of crop modeling, so there are several models available, but the model we have used here is really to uh, allow uh, and to decide what to do next week or in a couple of weeks within this particular plot. It's not a model for prospective studies and, uh, and, uh, and scientific analysis. It's really a decision-making crop model. And digital agriculture and capacity building means that there is also a part where we are using model output to translate into tailored intervention. 
and to uh, to uh, allow also the the data going back and being valorized for for, for authorities to take their decision and manage food territorial security. Of course, there is a strong uh, level of sustainability. I will show you how we have generated soil carbon storage and a sustainable practice index that is at the end designed to be very operational. It's, we are not in the scientific analysis here, we are in the, in the pragmatic operational action. And of course, some, a lot of time was spent on uh, extension service training. Okay, so uh, in terms of geo, statistics. Uh, the crop mapping, you are probably familiar with that, consists of analyzing uh, satellite imagery, which we have used spot 1.5 meter, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to analyze what crops are cultivated where. So this implies that there is a ground calibration. It means that the algorithms needs to be trained and confirm by uh, knowing that this particular plot it's maize. So at the end of the day, it's a mathemat mathematical optimization so that the model is trained to recognize certain types of crop. So here in this, in this campaign, we have focused on maize. So we have the best uh, confidence in detection in maize, but we could have done that for all the cultures you can see here. Uh, uh, an important component is that there is also two seasons a year. Uh, this in Kenya, what we call the short rain season and the long rain season. Uh, so here, the, the algorithms allows to 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 identify crops uh, in a, in a, in a map. Then this led to uh, this kind of output that is provided to authorities to identify the right acreage. So here on the left, you can see the short rain season and on the right, the long rain season. And you can see that crop acreage and maize acreage are, uh, is strongly increased in the long rain, which is the, also the most productive season. And this kind of numbers, it's the first time we see that. Uh, it has, the, the authorities know that the long rain, there is more maize, but here we have finally put numbers on it. There is a 30% increase of uh, maize air cultivated area during the long rain. So if we want to, to, to strengthen uh, food security, we have to, 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 to focus on this particular season. Um, so this allows authority, of course, to, to define and monitor lively uh, agricultural policies. And what you see here is the Vega County with different, uh, in different wards, different uh, area. So it's the equivalent uh, of a department, in fact. Uh, now, the other approach uh, we have engaged uh, is uh, field delineation. So here we have used high resolution satellite imagery, time series uh, to um, automatically delineate land. Why? Because area is a primary unit for agronomic analysis. And if you ask a farmer, what is the area of your, of your, of your land? He will tell you oh, approximately one acre. And in fact, when you measure that, it's half an acre. So when they ask for fertilizer, they will get fertilizer for one acre, but applied to half an acre, which leads to, to, to very bad use of nitrogen fertilizers. So using satellite imagery here, we, are, we have delineated uh, more than uh, 260,000 fields in a couple of months. And of course, the output of this analysis in, is injected directly into the, 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 the county GIS and extension service digital platform to be validated on the ground and to associate this polygon to a phone number of a farmer in order to receive advice and to be supported by the system. And of course, when you cross both map, field mapping and crop mapping, you have the exact acreage of, uh, of each uh, crop value chain. And in this project, for the short rain, we have identified 72,000 72, maize fields that allows territorial organization of extension services and allow assigning fertilizer subsidies to the right farmer and the right acreage. Okay, I will go slightly uh, uh, 
speed uh, slightly uh, faster on the crop model because I, I guess you are familiar with crop model. Uh, the crop model, why using a crop model? <coughs> I think you, you know it's, it's to integrate multiple effects and predict complex system behavior. And on a crop system, so this model are fuel with climate data that comes from commercial database that is connected to open source worldwide soil database uh, in order to have the, 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 the characteristic of the soil because the model uh, contains the cycle of, of carbon, the cycle of, of nitrogen and potassium. And the last data that comes into a model is the, the management of the farm. So, so that's why it's really important to know if a farmer has already engaged in practice or not, because this will change the output. Uh, and again, so you have more detail about this model here. Uh, what it generates, uh, it's uh, a growth and key stage schedule uh, in order to drive um, fertilizer management with regards to the impact in terms of productivity and sustainability. Uh, so all that is translated, so I, I'm cutting a long story short here, all that translated into a schedule, uh, what we call a crop itinerary. It's when to do what practices and where. And all this uh, uh, crop itinerary is, is then uh, translated into into uh, sorry is then translated into a recommendation by by SMS. So uh, again, this model I will go rapidly on that. Uh, we have implemented uh, a sustainability index and a carbon uh, indicator to provide extension officers with some evaluation means of the of this crop itinerary in order to evaluate how productive and how sustainable will be uh, the agriculture uh, advice of his farmers. And this is the kind of output that we generated. Uh, according, this is five different uh, fertilizer scenario because this project also aimed to better assign and better use subsidized fertilizers. So as you, as you can see uh, on the top, it's yield, on the low, it's the carbon flow, uh, the more you uh, fertilize uh, with, mineral, uh, with mineral fertilizers, the more you are uh, uh, degrading soils. So the good compromise is, is, the, is, the, is between organic and mineral fertilization. So this is agronomic uh, component that helps authorities to define their policies. And finally, to finish, uh, I'll give a word to, uh, on the digital integration and the capacity building because it's good to integrate technology. It's another story to deploy on the ground. So this is some snapshot of the digital farm, uh, the digital management platform that allows extension officers to drive their group of farmers. And with a, a dashboard that uh, where you visualize the, uh, the, 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 the model output and the sustainability score, and also automatically generate reminder for practices and collect uh, practice intervention from the farmer themselves. And uh, this is the example of this crop itinerary. And of course, all this is received in Swahili. And this allows also to, 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 to preserve the continuum between farmers, extension services, and authorities. And I will thank for your attention. I'm a bit uh, long here. Thank you. No, no, it was okay. It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. So now I think we have some questions from Professor Serge. So, yeah, thank you. It was very interesting, uh, Patrick, listening to you. Um, um, first of all, do you have any public uh, report on uh, this Kilimo project? Um, um, student report, research report, public. Uh, there, there is indeed a report. Uh, there is a report uh, generated to uh, the Ministry of, uh, of Economy, and this project is currently uh, looking for funds to, uh, to start again, but uh, attached with uh, uh, an, an impact study directly to the farmers with uh, public institutes such as CIRAD and INRIA, of course. Okay, so because we're studying this European project with three African countries, 
And definitely what you did on uh, geospatial data uh, coming from satellites will be of prime importance in terms of land monitoring uh, beyond the field, beyond the farm, which it will be the target of the project. So that will be interesting too. And a second question concerning the soil um, measurements. Do you use sensors, captors, special sensors? Uh, what kind of sensors did you use uh, to measure um, nutrients uh, in the in the field? So f for the soil yeah. and because of scalability objectives, we the model is connected to uh, an international database. Okay. However, because we have de because the uh, a carbon model has been developed, we have also engaged some soil measurements. And soil measurements that were that were engaged uh, with a with a with a lab with a Kenyan lab, uh, simply for scalability issues. And in these soil measurements, we could uh, observe that the car carbon dynamic is still okay, but the nitrogen dynamic is a catastrophe. Uh, for example, uh, we have measured soil nitrogen content at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the season, uh -huh. and there was more nitrogen at the end of the season. Wow, okay. So there is really an emergency of doing something that is really operational. Um, deploying sensors, it's not, it's not scalable at all. So it's important to deploy sensors and calibrate a good model and go using the model for scalability issues. Okay, and finally, for data storage, all the data you g you aggregate from uh, satellites, from uh, measurements, uh, database, etc., you use. Uh, what did you? What kind of uh, storage do, did you use? C the cloud. Oh, uh, what kind of cloud? Eventually. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's in the cloud. It was it's within the digital platform. It's it's provided. It's a SQL database connected also with a with a. Uh, on the cloud, it's a, it's a, it's a ready-to-use digital platform provided by a, a French company called Itumba okay. uh, that is dedicated in managing data for uh, that relates to agricultural practices and uh, performances. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much, and we'll keep on talking on that in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. be sure of that. Don't hesitate. Sure. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Mishket. And now my turn to talk about, well, different project and uh, I would say the philosophy behind that project. And that's a very important one from a computer science point of view. And of course, with the target of developing farm family um, solutions. So today in France, I, j I, I cannot start without this. Uh, um, so there is a major cri crisis in agriculture, so it's not uh, on purpose. Somebody said, okay, search, you did it uh, uh, voluntarily, not at all. So uh, motorways are blocked around uh, Bayonne, and that's an opportunity to give a figure concerning the situation of uh, the agriculture in France. As you may see, um, the number of farms which exist in France is about uh, 400,000 but minus 100,000 than 10 years ago. So in 10 years, 20% of the farms disappear. That's not the case, and that's interesting to see in terms of uh, uh, agricultural territory. Uh, it's about st it's, uh, more or less stable. That means um, there are kind of concentration and development of existing farms getting bigger and bigger. So the average size is um, uh, 69 hectares today, just control, um, it was um, 50 hectares uh, 10 years ago, but in the US it's about 180, so four times more, or three times more. So, uh, so agriculture globally is entering a disrupting era based upon data. We had a very interesting talk from uh, Patrick demonstrating in a given area of um, uh, Kenya, how data coming from satellites, coming from the soil, could enable to have a um, real agricultural strategy in terms of um, uh, uh, production uh, in the in this field. So I will give my my vision about 
data-driven agriculture for family farming. Um, and then I will look into more detail in what we, we are going to develop in uh, six countries in, this, uh, in the world with this uh, Erasmus Plus uh, grant uh, managed by STM. So I use the word data-driven agriculture to emphasize the, to, uh, the, the word data because everything we cannot imagine having analysis, uh, artificial intelligence application without the data. And that's big data, as, as we see. And there are different synonyms we can use. So I use the term data-driven agriculture from uh, Clerc. Uh, we use the, the, that word. And um, that you may see in the literature. And I could use also digital agriculture, connected agriculture, precision agriculture, agriculture 3.0, smart farming, precision farming. All, are, for me, are synonyms or part of this. So there are four key factors which have been uh, indicated uh, um, by um, Mark and Patrick before. The population growth, the water scarcity, even though the, we see there is a rain um, water, watering in uh, many countries in, uh, in Africa, but water scarcity globally, not only in, uh, in, in Africa, but in Europe and everywhere in the world, it's a major resource we have to optimize in the future. Um, the reduction of arable r land in Europe is not the case in Africa where we have 60% of the world reserve there and that means that um, Africa could become in the future the garden of the world. Um, we say sometimes Asia is the plant of the world but here the garden of the world could be Africa and that has been identified by Mr. Dangote from Mr. for example in Nigeria at the first business resource for Africa in the future. So there is a major demand on how to improve uh, agricultural production in Africa. In uh, Europe, we may see, and uh, I gave the figure for France, the reduction of uh, uh, agricultural labor. So that means there is room for um, robots, there is room for uh, drones, there is room for uh, sensors from physical device in order to help um, to collect data and to help uh, uh, agricultural production. And of course, uh, globally, the climate warm-up is changing the rule completely in uh, every part of the planet. So digital plan, and um, I would like to start, I had many ways to start. I hope um, uh, I put the picture here of Jean and Frédéric. I hope there are somewhere between uh, uh, their facility and Estia, but due to the uh, agricultural blockage in the motorway, I hope they are coming um, quietly. Otherwise, you have um, an interesting um, point, um, a video concerning this. It's not only production, something interesting. Is that uh, I will go beyond what they are doing. And I think the key idea, like any objects in IoT is to consider a plant, a green plant, as a living being. Living being. It's uh, that's fundamental. And how, why I say that is because um, what is life in biology? I have uh, different colleagues at the University of Nice with whom I had a, a long uh, talk uh, comparing uh, what they're doing with what we're doing in computing. And um, they gave me a very simple equation. Life is a couple of is data and communication. You are in life. We are to the today in life. You are uh, more than uh, 150 online. But um, we are uh, um, alive because we are sharing data. We are communicating, sharing data. So well, all the listeners and myself, we are today uh, in life. And that's interesting because uh, Bruno... Uh, Bruno Bernard was a great friend of mine, and uh, Bruno told me he is a word specialist on baldness. And um, for instance, he told me that, uh, is, uh, believe me, it's very rapid, but it's just to emphasize what is life. Uh, hair is falling because it doesn't communicate with its neighbor. That's part of the rule. 100 people at L'Oréal 
in the research group on hair, and there are, you could imagine, a lot of business are working on this rule uh, concerning concerning it. So I could talk a lot about that, but just this life um, is this couple data and communication. And today, what we learn is that green plants and whatever agricultural product is producing data. And some people can take that data and do music with that. That's uh, Jean and Frédéric will do that, but they did more than that. Since uh, we're talking about a uh, uh, digital vineyard, they had an experiment and they will talk about it uh, if they're coming in Champagne, where they use a nectar and they, they did some processing on the field uh, using the data produced by the um, vineyard. And um, they, they are kind of medicine in case of problem for this. And they are with a, a hail, uh, after a hail session, they demonstrated that uh, uh, their, their, their field uh, had a better improvement and a better um, uh, recovery than the other fields. So that's not only for fun, for po poetry, it's beyond that. That could be also a medicine. So data are coming from plants. And that's, and I read a very interesting article from um, Serge Morin, and we need to talk also on that. Um, Serge is uh, working within a project called One Health. He's working in uh, Thailand, and he has an important CNRS contract there. He's a biologist, and the consequence of his work is 10 years' work there is very interesting. There is only one health. So if we have healthy plants, healthy products, then that means we'll have a globally healthy world. And that's, that's a push also towards um, family farming. That's a push towards um, um, quality uh, of farming and not putting um, uh, too much chemistry in the soil, etc. So to use about agricultural um, ecological agriculture. And that's interesting because we were faced two years ago with a pandemic and when he said that if we take care of the plants everywhere on the planet, and that's the case we, when we have a small farmers, uh, then we could take care of the health of the global planet. And that's very interesting not to imagine there. So life, data plus um, communication. And then I look at the UN Sustainable Goals, 17 goals. Uh, out of them, are we not going to that, but 14 uh, concern uh, digital agriculture. So we may say in terms of um, digital assistance provided by technology and the data um, analysis could uh, lead to better production better prevention, better prediction of the crop and the quantity, etc., the maturation of the field, better personalization. Every field could be different, uh, treated differently because the soil could be different, and more precision in the time to harvest, in the, in the seed propagation, etc., and more precision also what is the... I will give a couple of effects also of that later. So in IT, we have disrupting IT technology which could be used inside um, uh, digital farming. So we learn, um, when I talk about the future of IT, I can take every letter of the alphabet A, B, C, D up to Z, and I just take the five one. A, uh, AI will be everywhere. B, big data. AI big needs big data. Then the cloud is a solution for 80% of data management and data analysis. And then among AI, I need uh, to put a focus on deep learning engineering tools. Uh, that's a very old um, uh, neural nets existed before the computer um, in the 40s. Um, but there was kind of winter and revival 10 years ago, which led to the Nobel Prize uh, to uh, three person, and one of them was a French guy, Jan Lecan. And then Concerning E, it's edge computing, 
and e-commerce, so you can put edge computing means we put the processing, the AI processing, where the data are produced. Could be tomorrow in the drones. So data is the raw resource of this millennium with plenty of um, uh, interesting uh, capabilities. So uh, I will not go into that. So data is the raw resource. And uh, if you want, uh, I could comment why it's a, there is this beautiful equation E equal MC2 to define what is data as an energetic resource. Then every system will be more ubiquitous. So it means we will we'll use smartphone as a personal computer in the pocket in order to process data, produce data, and process data and get uh, applications. IoT, so objects become alive in the sense I just presented before, meaning every object is exchanging data with its um, environment in order to do predictive maintenance, in order to do uh, um, to detect anomalies, to detect uh, problems, etc. So every object in the future produce data, share it, communicate, and that of course will be the case with the car industry, but with the drones, with the sensors, and the robots in the field. Then we talk about satellite. Patrick talked about the importance of satellite, uh, like spot, but there are many satellites coming around and in the field also there is a problem of communication. We'll see today the, uh, the use of uh, low, low quantity uh, systems like LoRa and um, with a beautiful application in Vietnam this afternoon. But uh, beyond that, in the future, we have to look at the broadband internet coming from low orbit satellites with two major approach. Of course, there are many contenders, Amazon and Chinese are going into this market, but the first one, the first, uh, the, the company we shot first was uh, Starlink, uh, was um, uh, the company from Elon Musk, and then Europe is trying to, to get an interesting answer with OneWeb. So both are major contenders to provide um, broadband internet in the field, in the agricultural field, and of course everywhere. Then big data management, we talk about SQL standard, and SQL will be there in the next 50 years to manage data, including no SQL. SQL will include no SQL. That's interesting. Oop. And then uh, deep learning, of course, and generative AI, which is the most recent tool which has been developed with, um, which will impact every sector of the economy. So just a summary of what I say, um, we have to think at this couple, disruptive couple of data and artificial intelligence. I put uh, this image of an iceberg. And that's confirmed also what by Jim Gray, we got the, Turing Award. The Turing Award is like uh, the Prix Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize in um, computing. And um, when he gave his um, uh, speech for the Nobel Prize, he talked about the data paradigm after physics, after mathematics, after computing. Then we enter this fourth paradigm of science, data paradigm. And of course, we, c we do not forget the GPU, the power of um, the chips in order to be uh, the third musketeer. So whatever the situation in the field, we have to build what we call data lakes. Data lakes uh, means structured data. So traditionally, like pa Patrick said, uh, SQL somewhere. So second, semi-structured data, any data coming from the web, could be a database in the web, could be website, uh, etc. So semi-structured data, what we call the graph database for us, and then unstructured data, no SQL. And we see decision support database with OLAP, columnar oriented, and the present and future is what we call vector database. Uh, here again, 20 years ago, everybody was talking about vector for data analysis, and now it turns out, for instance, the last version of Oracle, the 23C, integrate for AI, for um, AI analysis, whatever the 
input uh, the vector database. So data lakes are there and computing people and people we educate at uh, STI and the BR master are working on that and that will be part of the project uh, within deep form from um, an education point of view. Then mobiquity. Mobiquity is a word, it's a, a word between a couple uh, merging mobility of the cell phone and ubiquity of internet. We have a computer in the pocket. Look at this picture the, on this uh, January the 1st, this year in the Champs Elysees. Uh, during the, that's interesting to see everybody. There are more smartphones than inhabitants on this planet today. And um, as Patrick said, and it's surprising that in Africa um, it's a case and they go and they use the smartphone even on a payment tool much more than we're using it in Europe. So agriculture will be mobiquitous, I say, and the smartphone will be the remote controller of the digital form. Then artificial intelligence, of course, I will not comment on that. I just quote... Um, our friend uh, Luc Julia, we came here at Estia virtually last year and say first, AI does not exist. It's augmented intelligence. He, he preferred to use that word. And think about AI as a set of tools. Uh, Chat GPT and deep learning are new tools in the, in the bag in order to develop applications. Um, but AI needs big data and needs a GPU. And AI will be ubiquitous. Every aspect, every business on this planet will be impacted by, um, by AI. And we may say differently that every job on the planet will have a digital assistant in marketing, finance, human resource, whatever, will have a, an, an assistant and which will use uh, generative AI. And that's for Mark. Uh, that's a picture for you. I ask um, um, Doll E, Generative AI to say, what is a look if AI was a person? And, and I ask, uh, and I, I put some uh, enrichment on, on this, just saying, okay, it could be a person. I leave the, um, uh, the generative AI to produce that picture. So it's not a picture, it's produced by AI. And, um, and I say, it could be at sunset, because sunset is good. And I'm thinking about um, uh, books you may find in a train station, you were in a train station somewhere, and that's produced by AI, it's, it's a beautiful woman. So that was a beautiful woman produced by AI. To well, Who is AI? So you have the answer here by AI. So disruption of deep learning, you see around just deep learning, which is part of machine learning, which is part of artificial, artificial intelligence, how we may have different fields of interest today and we need to educate students in all that fields. ChatGPT from software and hardware is everywhere. Big battle, I put a couple of pictures from the CES in Las Vegas, so some days ago, and you see new hardware coming out. Um, I put here the Rabbit, the R Rabbit, which is not that much expensive, it's less than 200 compared to the price of a, a top smartphone today. It's just 200 euros, and it plays the role of going into all your applications. When you open your smartphone, you see, let's say, 50 applications. So you have to go in one and another. Here, they can do the synthesis about any application. I have to take, I have to go to my home tonight. Uh, due to the blockage on the motorway, I don't want to go into GPS and saying GPS, what is the best road. I would like to get uh, information. You have to, to be there at 5 p.m. You have to leave at 4.15 and take that road and do whatever, uh, whatever I need to go there. And eventually integrate the data on what I have to do on the trip, uh, person I have to call uh, eventually, etc. So uh, there is kind of automatic generation of information from all the apps you have in your pocket, including, of course, telephone. And you have um, even a pin. The concurrent of um, Rabbit is a pin. And I see end of this, end of next week, end of next week, we will have um, the new Samsung phone, which try to integrate also that with the first um, uh, hard generative AI integrated into the smartphone. So I try to summarize also three dimensions for digital agriculture. 
And that's something which is true also not only for digital agriculture but for digital education and digital health. First of all, we have to talk about the six W. Three concern the past. What, where, when. Everything there is on internet. Past data existing somewhere. And three are for the future. Why, where about, and warranty quality of the result uh, of the result of the output. And why is just um, a way to say a prediction, um, eventually to identify prediction, to identify prevention, etc. So that's part and. Um, this concept of 6W is of prime importance. We are shifting from another world to a new digital world. And then we have a digital tutor. Every, uh, and it will be customized. Of course, you th have to think about um, chat GPT. But, and we are working in education, for instance, today in Madagascar in a project to have a prompt generator automatic for um, edu for education, but also for um, um, nurses, in order to propose um, telemedicine to nurses with a chat enrichment with a chat GPT. So every person will have a digital assistant, every person will have a digital tutor, and that word tutor has a, some specific meaning even in agriculture that has been used physically and that will be used virtually tomorrow. Every farmer will have a digital expert in his pocket, a digital assistant to monitor the, 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 the to monitor its crop. And more than that is the fact that it's true in education but it's true in the way uh, people will react, farmers, uh, students, etc. is the fact that we are changing, we are shifting from since the Middle Age and now, somewhere in the way we take the knowledge. Um, and we are tipping from an answer era, where students, for instance, or farmers have to build answers, to the question, to an era of the question. And that's interesting, so that means prompt engineering. Because we have to do st top analysis, giving all the variables or all the detail to the system and leave the system do the synthesis for you. You don't have to do the synthesis, the system will do that for you. And that could be with real-time data. So that's an interesting because that's a completely shift in the way we are carrying knowledge. Uh, sorry. Uh, this picture are, is generated by DOL-E also, by AI. Example of Madagascar. Uh, yesterday we had a presentation in Madagascar. And it's very interesting, uh, the first uh, agricultural product there, which will be part of the farm, is rice. If we look at the production of rice, and uh, uh, Madagascar 10 years ago was, um, this year they are importing, <coughs> sorry, they are importing 20% of their um, consumption. And the production of an hectare there is um, half the production of the world level. And the fourth in China. <coughs> so here, working with... Uh, whoa. I need water. Maybe Irulegi, maybe some wine from Irulegi could be better. Tu avais peur, hein, tu vois, ce matin, Michkette, pour toi, mais c'est moi qui perds la voix. So, excuse me. So, that's an example of rice in Madagascar, where you see that uh, we need to improve production. And working with the Department of Agriculture at the university, at the public university there, in order to work, and that's very important in digital agriculture, as a multidisciplinary team with the um, Department of Agriculture and Department of Computing. So we have to work together in order to improve the production of the an, an hectare and to make a country which is self-sufficient. So Erasmus project, 
We started yesterday formally. Um, is a project which involves uh, six countries, and there will be four digi five digital farms being developed by uh, um, different partners. So we are working with Turkey on olive trees, Ivory Coast on cacao, Madagascar on rice, <coughs> Dominican Republic on banana, Haiti on mango and vegetables, and maybe Benin on um, manioc. So um, what we try to do everywhere is to provide um, every country with a generic IoT open source platform being developed at Estia. There exists already one version, which will be um, given to every country. Um, they will take that platform and customize that platform with eventually different sensors and different um, products um, uh, and different uh, drones and different uh, eventually using satellite uh, data or not. We're trying to make it low tech, open source in terms of tools and of course the standards. Um, we promote family farming. 80% of the food of the planet is provided, by the way, by fa family farming, not by industry farming. But that's a very important uh, um, context. Um, second, we have uh, computing students uh, there coming from, uh, we are online, coming from EBR, master program from Estia. So there are online students. We have digital connected campus there. We will produce MOOCs to um, improve their curriculum. And the MOOCs we'll produce are more practical uh, than the one existing today. That was a demand from them. So we'll educate better the students in computing in the connected digital campus in Ivory Coast, uh, Madagascar, Benin, as, as when uh, Africa is considered. And um, second, we'll provide also courses, MOOCs for agronomists, introduction of AI in the Master of Agronomy there. And we'll, I, we'll do what is also called a Gradeo, a micro master, where we'll use the use case of the local digital farm, which has been used as um, an example, um, uh, a use case in top of the Gradeo, education of the agronomes and agronomists of the future. So. That's a double education uh, transfer from Europe to Africa. And we're working in Europe closely with the University of Siena, which, is one, uh, which has one of the most important master in artificial intelligence in Europe, which is totally complementary of the master we have in Estia, which is more practical oriented, more application oriented. So um, portfolio of monitoring services, the first service will provide from Estia on this platform will be disease identification, depending, which of course will be different from uh, uh, whether we're talking about uh, cacao, cabos, or uh, uh, rice, or uh, olive, but disease identification using uh, image from drones, that will be the first service we're providing. And then other service will be provided locally depending on the demand could be a maturation service uh, to demonstrate the level of um, uh, of the proc of the uh, and estimate of the crop. So, what is um, what is important there is also what we call data governance uh, and data sovereignty. We don't want to use the the cloud platform proposed by the GAFAM. Uh, yesterday, I had an important talk with Microsoft, and they say for all your projects, we will provide for you the Azure, it's called Azure Data Platform for Agriculture, so that exists, but Oracle is exactly the same, um, and uh, Microsoft uh, is proposing the same, um, I didn't check the other, but they all propose to store the agricultural data of the planet and share that data to the farmers, and I said, uh, well, up to now, for the D farm project, we will not at all look at this opportunity. We'll use 
on data on-premise or data in a free cloud we could have around, but we'll not go into that. But if there is, um, and that's part of the project also, to generate startups in, the, uh, in Africa and um, in the other countries, if there is a startup taking that, pro that proof of concept and trying to make a product, then he will have to use this kind of platform, and that's another story. But um, for the project itself, we will avoid to use the, this uh, kind of uh, platform. But look, it's not the hazard that Oracle, Microsoft, and uh, Amazon are providing this uh, free for students and uh, for uh, applications. So I will not use this example here. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's not the end of my talk. I will try to use... No, it's I have to switch to um, Agul. Um, well, just because I don't want to come back here. Um, CL? Okay, perfect. So it's fini. But the Eagle is, is over. Um, from Eagle presentation, um, I would take what she developed during her, her master thesis at Estia, uh, with the support of Google, by the way. Um, it's a platform we, are, we will provide in June uh, this year to every partner. So that will be um, the updated version of uh, that platform, which we may say which exists today. We need to do the transfer between what she did and uh, the team, uh, the existing team. But w that's the version zero we'll provide to everybody by June. And students are, will work locally on that version. And we will provide a version one, a new version built on that by September. So you will see here in terms of what she called perception layer, the data coming from satellites, coming from drones, and real-time data coming from uh, sensors. Then we'll have the, at the network level, we're using LoRa. Uh, we will propose to use LoRa and maybe in the future low orbit satellites. Then data processing layer, that's very interesting. She did a very good work in order to use uh, open source uh, systems. So we're not, we didn't use Oracle and we may use in the version one Postgres uh, system instead of click um, clickstream, just because the Postgres is proposing the vectorization. So in the version one, we'll propose by September, we'll use uh, Postgres to manage uh, the um, the data lake. So we'll have SQL and no SQL data coming there, and we use also Hadoop and MapReduce. And just here. Uh, the this um, data lake architecture use and that's what we're going to propose uh, the um, Synefis sensor for uh, humidity so the real-time data are coming from Synefis we use um, she did use that platform for digital vine yard in the southwest of France because we got historical data we need real-time data coming from drone sensors uh, satellites but we need also real-time uh, historical data in order to build time series applications and compare the situation after a climate uh, effect or whatever. So, and uh, they were provided uh, by uh, Synafis uh, for uh, this uh, vineyard in the southwest of France. So that's the reason also why we work and we had the pleasure to welcome uh, later after my talk, uh, Ari will talk about these sensors, this type of sensors present in the future. Um, and uh, as far as we're concerned, we'll provide in the version zero this uh, platform. And then every partner is free to use this sensor or another one and then implement in the generic platform we have. Then same with, uh, with the drones, working with the uh, AgroDrone, which is um, uh, a startup from Bordeaux, from the Aquitaine area. It's a local uh, company, so we will provide uh, integration of data coming from the drone. Today, it was kind of an, off, uh, an offline uh, integration through SD, but that will be part of the version zero extension we have to do 
is integration in real time of data coming from drones. In order to detect diseases, what did um, Aigul in the version zero of the platform? And she used a series of uh, application um, based upon de -learning, deep learning and Kaggle data, data from Kaggle. That's an example we'll use whatever the product will have um, data concerning um, uh, disease of agriculture. And then satellite image, and you will have a presentation of Sophia Engineering, which has been there, which has its own, um, its own satellite, its own um, um, satellite for uh, data collections, and uh, they are going into the digital uh, uh, agricultural field, and that will be also part of the next talk. So that's the end of my presentation. And I just wanted to finish with a Gascon proverb for digital agriculture future. In an apple, you can count the seeds, but in a seed, you cannot count the apples. So plenty of opportunities to build services. And uh, that's also generated by Dell E. And I put the word education and uh, agriculture, and they provide this book open with an apple. And that's, uh, that's the way they interpret the proverb. And that's a picture, that's a dedication to my grandfather, which was a Gascon peasant uh, somewhere uh, close to uh, Toulouse. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a problem. When we talk about climate, we talk about climate in the big sense. But one of the things that our experience has been is that we need to talk about microclimates. And those are the climates that are around the plant, around the rows of the plants, around the rows of trees, and in the plot where all of those trees are planted or all the plants are planted. And what we need to do is to be able to measure what's happening in, that, uh, in those uh, locations. So we can approach, um, we can apply a regenerative agriculture approach <coughs> and use those measurements to increase soil fertility, uh, better orchard management, uh, a variety of different uh, activities. So when we're measuring that microclimate, what am I talking about? I'm talking about measuring the temperature and the humidity of the air in the canopy of the plant, measuring the leaf humectation in the foliage of the plant, and measuring the temperature and humidity of the soil in the root structure of the plant. So we're looking at uh, gaining this information right in the field and what's happening in the orchard, for example. That data gets translated, or gets transmitted via SIGFOX, LoRa, any sort of low frequency ne network that you'd like to use. And we can then visualize it on a website where we have, um, for example, here we see that the peaks in the air and leaf humidity during the dew points, and then we see sustained uh, air and leaf humidity during rain periods. So that with this, it's important to underline here the correlation between observation and measurement. We measure something, we measure a temperature, we measure a humidity, and then we observe what's happening in the field. And that can lead to a variety of different conclusions depending on the type of crop that you're, you're, you're raising. Uh, the advantages here that we have generated over six years of data are optimization of water resources, one of our big topics for today, uh, the reduced quantities of pesticides and soil contamination, uh, the improvement of uh, flora and fauna biodiversity, increased fertility of the soil and carbon levels, and as a low-cost solution, managing the budget constraints. So I'm just going to go through, um, I'm not going to go through because I have lots of slides with the results. I'm going to hit on a couple of the ones that are pretty important. So with the um, walnut trees, we were, talk we were working with uh, disease uh, anticipation, depending on the temperature and humidity of the air, the, um, uh, the, types, the different types of, uh, of bacteria that can attack the leaves and the conditions. One of the most important things that we found was from our olive groves. So we've got, uh, in three years of monitoring the soil temperature and humidity and the air temperature and humidity, one of the um, 
results that, uh, that came out was the ability to uh, anticipate the emergence of the larva, the, the Bacterosa oleae, which is uh, the larva that hibernates all winter long and then migrates to the surface in the springtime when the soil temperature is at 12 degrees. When the soil temperature is at 12 degrees, you have one week before the larvae emerge on the surface, they develop into pupae, and then they become the flies that attack the olives. And what's curious is we repeated this experience with cherry trees near Lyon. The same type of, it's not the same larva, it's a different larva, but the same behavior. The larva uh, hibernates all winter long. In the springtime at a certain soil temperature, it, it migrates to the surface, develops into a pupae, develops into a fly, and attacks the cherries. So this is something that's consistent with about any pitted fruit. Again, it's a course, it's observation. What, when do the larvae come out? What's the soil temperature? What's the air temperature? How can we then decide what treatment we're going to use? Uh, during for vegetable production, uh, this is uh, Olivier Plessis, is one of our testers from the pilot program. Uh, he has been using the system since 2018. We're now in 2024. Uh, over the years, he has um, constituted a reduction of about 20% of water usage per year. Uh, and a corresponding, of course, uh, cost of irrigation and cost of wear and tear on his electric pumps. So these types of results are allowing small farmers smallholder farmers to really uh, take advantage of this data, take advantage and make the correlation with the observation and reduce their, their environmental impact. And I'm just going to hit on two last ones. Um, so if you're, you're monitoring the uh, air humidity and the leaf humectation, what you can identify is the optimal moment to apply any of your phyto or organic treatments. Why? Because the leaf surface is dry, the air humidity is low, so you have a better adhesion on the surface of the leaf and less uh, spillover, and so you use less phyto treatments. Uh, in this case, in a vineyard in the tarn, a reduction of 25% in terms of conventional phyto treatments. And for Copert, who is a biological systems producer, uh, they constituted uh, a better application, a better and application of their organic treatments on the leaf surfaces as well. Uh, Copert also had uh, constituted an interesting uh, corollary in monitoring the interior of a kiwi farm they were able to deploy the bumblebees that are used for pollinization two days earlier because inside the canopy of the kiwi tree, uh, they could measure the temperature, the air temperature at eight degrees. The weather station at the end edge of the plot was reading seven degrees and bumblebees are only effective above eight degrees. So they actually gained two days on 10 days of pollination, which is a 25% increase. That's, again, we need to know what's happening at the micro level, below the soil and in the plant uh, canopy. So when we combine this with a bunch of agroecological farming practices, so this, these are just basic ones, permanent ground cover, uh, no plowing, tilling, or herbicides, um, carbon soil analysis with, with a laboratory, uh, establishing an equilibrium, uh, around the plants, planting hedges where you have flowers that attract insects and bees, uh, planting forests for windbreaks. All of these practices are not uh, chemically based, <laughs> so we try and move towards that and towards things that are also um, indigenous. So the type of, of uh, trees that you're going to plant are indigenous to the area it can serve as a windbreak. The type of hedges are plants that are flowering plants that are indigenous, that are drought resistant, all that sort of thing. Uh, so the cumulative effects are principally uh, increased soil fer fertility with an increase of uh, carbon, 
in the soil, reduced water consumption, uh, early pest detection, uh, uh, reduced phyto treatments, uh, and the ability to scale up these practices on a large scale. Uh, and when I'm talking scale, I'm not talking about one farmer with a lot of land. It's more like one farmer who sort of validates the practices, and then you apply the same thing to other farmers in the same type of crop system in the, cr the, other t the same region. Uh, so the, the impacts are environmental, financial, organizational. Uh, you can see the list when, you, when um, Mishkit will diffuse the, the slides. And the last thing that I'd emphasize is that, in fact, this is one part of the toolkit. Okay, it's uh, the correlation between observation and the data. Uh, so we're getting sensor data. It can be uh, soil sensor data. It can be uh, uh, light data, for example, how much luminosity data. It can be any types of sensor data that you can collect. You're combining that with weather information. So that may be a weather station uh, in the plot itself. It may be a weather station from Meteo France. Uh, you're combining it with satellite imagery. Then you have to go into the yield history. What's happening? What, what is the, the, the tendons of the crop and the production? And then you have to go with the climate history. What's happening? What is the historical climate measurements that have been taking place? And let's keep in mind that we're going to have to develop new models. At the moment, Meteo France is accurate within three days. In, their, in terms of their predictions, because they cannot apply the historical five-year and 10-year cycles to the weather data that they're collecting. And, and with the climate change, they can't apply those models and have an accurate forecast for much more than uh, less than three days. So all of that gets, all of this data gets fed into an AI analysis or prediction uh, engine. And you're combining it with uh, regenerative farming practices. And that's where all of that together will help determine how we're going to meet the uh, sustainable goals. And that's it. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. So, um, hello, everybody. So I'm Patrice Rosier. Uh, I am a co-founder uh, of uh, Agrobone Company, uh, which is a startup. Uh, which is also a spin-off of uh, Reflet du Monde Company, which is uh, our, our main company concerning uh, drones. Um, so the activity of our company um, is split uh, into four parts. Uh, so our business is to accompany uh, our customers in the use of uh, drones uh, in agriculture, but not only, also build, building, uh, so con construction industry, um, uh, video, movies, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so we, sorry, uh, so we perform missions with our drones. Uh, we train drone pilots uh, all over the, the country, so France. Uh, we also sell drones and accessories. Uh, so we have a, an online shop, uh, which is called... Uh, aerial-shop.com um, uh, and we have also a design office to to manufacture uh, things and to propose uh, tailor-made uh, projects uh, so in 2015 uh, we had a project called agrodrone which uh, started uh, in our company and uh, uh, years years after, after years uh, we decided to to create, uh, to fund a startup uh, called Agrodrone. And so in 2023, uh, we funded uh, Agrodrone, which is uh, completely dedicated to uh, agriculture applications. Um, so we have a fleet of drones dedicated uh, for agriculture, uh, so from different manufacturers. Uh, the story started in 2015 with uh, uh, the innovation uh, startup from uh, Maisadour and Vivadour uh, cooperatives. And so they asked us to, to, to sow seeds uh, in the crops 
thanks to uh, to our drones. And so we designed a 20 kilograms uh, drone uh, this year, and uh, we we have um, um, added uh, years after years some other drones to perform our missions. Um, so Chinese drones uh, from DJI, for example, and we have also uh, other drones dedicated uh, to uh, multispectral imaging. Um, this year, we started to, to develop, in 2023, uh, to develop another solution with uh, uh, 100 kilograms and uh, including 50 kilograms of payload, which is uh, the biggest drone in France for agriculture applications right now. And so uh, we, we will start to, to work with this uh, very big drone this year in 2024. Uh, so you have uh, an overview of uh, the different applications um, of our drones uh, in agriculture right now in, in France. So we have seed spreading. Uh, so we implant uh, um, green cover in crops uh, between two cultures, uh, in corn, in wheat, uh, in barley, and these kinds of, um, of, uh, of cultures. Uh, and the idea is to avoid to let the soils completely naked between two, um, two cultures. And uh, it massively uh, traps uh, CO2 in the soils. And it's a very interesting uh, um, a way of doing uh, for, for the future to, to trap massively CO2. Uh, we also drop trichograms, uh, so tiny tiny wasps uh, protecting the, the corn crops uh, from uh, some uh, parasites. Uh, so the corn borer, uh, which is a small insect uh, eating the, um, eating the, the, the mice. Um, we, also, we are also able to spray biocontrol products in the crops. Uh, so it's simple spraying with uh, rotatives, rotatives um, um, parts in the drone um, and uh, it's more recent but we are also able to um, drop uh, ginkgo rings so pheromone rings protecting uh, the um, chestnut trees and the walnut trees uh, from uh, from uh, other insects uh, damaging uh, the, the nuts and the, the chestnuts um, so obviously, uh, the drone is also used uh, to to make some uh, diagnostics. Um, so, for example, uh, determine the uh, NDVI uh, index to detect drug uh, stress uh, in the in the crops. Um, we can also use all simply uh, thermal imagery, so infrared imagery, uh, to to see uh, the the irrigation uh, to check if everything is, is normal, if, if there is no problem in the irrigation process of the crops. And so we also we are also able to, to perform a very specific missions. Uh, for example, right now we are uh, asked uh, to perform a new, so innovating um, uh, things in, uh, in the Apple, so Apple Orchards, uh, to to drop also uh, pheromone rings uh, in this new um, uh, in this new new crop, so it's a new very new application. Uh, so to to go specifically on uh, all parts of what we do, uh, for example, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, crop covering with uh, uh, so vegetation cover. Uh, this kind of practice uh, can limit the TH in the in the crops, so the, the soil is not damaged uh, uh, at each um, uh, each work of the, the big machines uh, that are very heavy and prevent the uh, the, the life in the soil. Uh, so it's good to use that. Uh, for example, uh, you, you can see here uh, some vegetation cover uh, installed in the mice crop before uh, uh, 
uh, before that the, the mice are, uh, are cut. And so when uh, everything is cut, you can discover this, uh, this vegetation cover and uh, it's really well working uh, because we spray the, we, we spread the seeds at the perfect moment when uh, there is uh, irrigation in the crop, when the weather is completely sunny and when the conditions are perfect to develop this uh, vegetation cover. If we if we uh, if we do um, if you do all that after uh, cutting the the, the mice, uh, the problem is that the, um, the the soil can be frozen. For example, uh, you don't have uh, much sun to to help the, the vegetation to develop and so on. So it's very important to do that at the best mo the best uh, time. Uh, so. This, pr practice, this practice also uh, strengthens the biological activity and it's a way also to reduce the, the phytosanitary treatments and also uh, to limit the, the chemical entrants. Uh, concerning the, the dropping of trichograms, so it's uh, uh, specific to corn borer control, so to avoid that this uh, it's small uh, caterpillar uh, eats the, the crops. Uh, and um, this, uh, this thing is, uh, allows also to, to limit the use of uh, phyto products. So it's a general approach right now uh, to limit this, uh, this use of phyto products. And uh, the drones in general uh, are a perfect tool to do that, uh, to, to go to precision agriculture. Um, so we also spray liquid. liquid. Uh, so spraying liquids is, uh, is famous with drones, but uh, in France and in Europe, you cannot uh, use uh, phyto products. So it's why this is why we, we use the biocontrol products. Uh, and so this is a, uh, the, the most obvious use of drones when you are talking about uh, drones. And uh, it's very precise because uh, we can uh, uh, put the products exactly uh, where it's needed and not everywhere massively. Um, and uh, the drone can work just after uh, a, a diagnostic uh, with, uh, for example, multispectral imagery. Um, for example, in France, uh, there was uh, uh, some experimentation with uh, EGALIM law, and so this, this, uh, the use of drones can limit the exposure of operators to the, to the products uh, when uh, uh, on specific spots, for example, uh, um, around the mountains and so on, where, where the the machines on ground cannot go easily and when it's dangerous for operators. Uh, finally, the operators spray directly everything uh, directly by the end. And so it's better to use drone in this case uh, to protect the, the workers. Um, and also, also another uh, innovating uh, thing uh, in agriculture is the cool roofing. Uh, that is to say, the use of uh, white products that uh, we uh, white painting that we apply directly on the roof of the the breeding farms, for example, to limit the the heat uh, uh, during the, the summer and to to protect the, the animals. Uh, so it's uh, something completely new. Uh, and there are specific paintings used use for that, and uh, so it's a, it's a new um, a new way of uh, of doing also. And so we can do that with drones. Uh, so concerning the pheromones, I talked about the the protection of chestnut trees and walnut trees. We have a project internally uh, in partnership with uh, Invenio, which which is a laboratory uh, uh, for fruits and for uh, um, different um, uh, cultures, and so they ask us to use drones to to drop uh, pheromone rings directly uh, uh, five meters high uh, on the top of these trees 
to protect uh, the trees uh, against uh, this butterfly. Uh, and so this is uh, also an, innovated, uh, an innovating application. So drone is really often linked to a very, very innovative uh, uh, application in agriculture. And this is why there is a, a massive uh, uh, arrival of drones in uh, agriculture uh, in France and in Europe right now. Um, here you can see uh, maps uh, when we can uh, see, for example, the hydric stress. Uh, and so thanks to this kind of auto mosaics, uh, we can decide the better uh, moment to, uh, to, to act in the, um, in the crops. So it's a very interesting tool. Uh, you can also uh, have a digi digital terrain model uh, allowing to know where there is there will be uh, too much water or too too uh, or not enough water, and so uh, uh, you have plenty plenty of applications with uh, these diagnostics, and so uh, we also work in this uh, in this way. Uh, we we are able to, to to propose these maps with our tools. Uh, so. When you work with multispectral imagery, uh, you analyze different uh, wavelengths. Uh, and among these wavelengths, there is all uh, simply uh, some infrared wavelengths, uh, already very interesting uh, to, to check the irrigation, to check the, the different uh, problems that you can have uh, directly in the crop. And uh, there are also here many, uh, many applications. Um, so the drone can be used also for different, uh, very, very uh, uh, original things like depollution. This is the picture here when we are able to drop specific products, able to gather um, the petrol components in water. And then after that, there is a boat collecting uh, the, the, the product resulting of this, uh, uh, of this uh, gathering. And so it's uh, a way of depolluting the, the, the water and the lakes and so on. So it's uh, very interesting. We also work a lot in uh, bleaching the greenhouses. Uh, so the greenhouses are here to protect the cultures uh, during the winter. But as soon as the sun is coming back um, during the spring, uh, the warm in the grasses uh, in the greenhouses can reach a very high temperature, and so um, it's a, it's a problem. And so there is a need to bleach uh, very quickly the greenhouses. Uh, most of the time, this, is, this was done by helicopter, and now the drones are coming and are replacing progressively the helicopters. Uh, so it's uh, less polluting, it's less uh, noisy, and so on. There are plenty of, uh, of uh, strong points with the drones, and uh, we, we propose uh, that. Uh, it's also possible to clean solar panels, for example. Uh, so plenty of other applications that we can propose. Um, in our value chain, the value chain of AgroDrone, so we propose uh, service to farmers, uh, all simply, but not most uh, of the time, the farmers uh, uh, get very interesting in the drone and they, they want to uh, integrate uh, the drone service uh, inside the farms. And so we they got trained. Uh, so we train them, then we can sell them the, the drones. And after that, we, we have a, a follow-up of, uh, of the drones. Uh, so we have uh, after sales service and maintenance that we propose. So thanks to our company, we can uh, have a full, uh, um, the, the, they are completely accompanied during the, the use of drones. Um, so uh, this service of uh, two farmers is, uh, as I uh, explained, uh, precision agriculture, uh, this service of uh, mapping of crops, uh, spraying, and so on. Uh, in our training center, uh, so we are able to, to train people. 
And it's very interesting for them to know that we we already work in agriculture, and so we have a, an experience in, directly in the field. And this this is this is what we that they, what they look uh, for when they they come to see us. Uh, so we train about regulation, about the use of drones, of course, uh, about s s safety, uh, safety uh, about the, the drone operations. And uh, we are able to, to train them in, in English. Uh, so uh, this is why we have uh, some requests uh, uh, abroad uh, coming from other countries right now. Uh, and anyway, it's uh, a field in uh, completely in, uh, in the full development right now with drones. Um, so this is our, our shop and our rental and sales service. Uh, it's another way of uh, accompanying the, the farmers uh, and concerning the, the after sales and, and the maintenance. Uh, we are able to, to guarantee the, the, the products and most of all to react really rapidly uh, when there is a failure with the drones. And uh, it's very practical for the farmers. Otherwise, most of the time they depend uh, they depend on uh, uh, services coming from china so very far from them and so it's very complicated for them to 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 react and uh, and agriculture is a field uh, where you need uh, this service absolutely because uh, you don't have time and the culture cannot wait for, for you uh, so this is what we propose uh, so we have, of course, a website, uh, which is uh, agrodrone.fr. And so uh, you can join us uh, by email, thanks, uh, thanks this, uh, this website. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I am available for questions. So yes. you, if you have questions about what we do uh, and about what I said, uh, do not hesitate. Yes, indeed. There, there are a lot of questions. So here is uh, Professor Miranda, who has some questions for you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question You're concerning welcome. the future of drone. I see in the yes. literature the people talking about putting AI, uh, NVIDIA chip in, inside the drone in order to control and to provide the services at the edge as uh, kind of services you propose, like a disease uh, detection, etc. Um, are you working on that field too also or uh, in terms of research? Where do next generation uh, drones from Agodon will come from? Uh, are you working? Uh, what kind of futuristic drone you're working on? Okay. So, um, obviously, uh, the artificial intelligence is a, is a very important point in what we do. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, is implemented uh, inside the flight controllers, so the autopilots inside the drones um, on one side. And on the other side, it's also used uh, for... Uh, uh, other applications linked to the payloads, for example, the cameras and so on. You can detect automatically some things. So for example, right now we are working to protect uh, forests against fires, and we are working on uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, able to detect uh, very, very early uh, fire uh, starts. Uh, so we have partnerships with our companies for that uh, because it's a, a full-time job and it's, it can be uh, somehow different to what we, we do every day. But we are currently reinforcing uh, our skills in this way. And for example, we work a lot right now in open source with uh, autopilots. Uh, one application can be uh, uh, specific uh, pathways for our drones, uh, allowing to stop them on each tree uh, every 10 meters or 15 meters, for example. And this is what we do with uh, the drop of pheromone wings, for example. And uh, so that's just one example. There are plenty of examples of what uh, AI can do with drones. Uh, anyway, we know that it's a, a very important point, and this is why we are completing, uh, we are really developing our skills uh, right now uh, this way. We have uh, hired new people, engineers, technicians, and so on, uh, 
And so we are developing this part. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So You're welcome. no more questions. Okay. So I think we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you again, Patrice. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks you. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Well, sorry to address the audience in uh, in French, but I thank uh, I can pick questions in in English if uh, if you want. Uh, no problem. So I will switch uh, to to French. So bonjour. I am uh, as it was said uh, the. Uh, Je suis, pardon, le cofondateur et responsable de la Société Générale d'évaluation des, des territoires. Euh, société dont le domaine d'intervention porte sur l'adaptation des territoires euh, aux enjeux, et il y en a un bon nombre, euh, liés au changement climatique et au développement durable en général. Alors, à la base, nous sommes un agrégateur d'informations géolocalisées information qui provient, de, comme vous vous en doutez, de multiples sources, de multiples formats. Et nous utilisons le très fort potentiel, euh, auquel nous croyons beaucoup depuis un moment d'ailleurs, des images satellitaires pour compléter ces informations. Ces informations, nous les mettons à disposition sur une plateforme qui s'appelle Terreval, qui place toujours le territoire au centre sous forme de, de cas d'usage, d'aide à la décision et de suivi de l'évolution du territoire euh, en mode plateforme as a service. Donc, on est un, une société de type SaaS et donc nos services sont diffusés par abonnement et, et souscription. Euh, notre équipe est principalement basée à Toulouse. Elle est euh, multidisciplinaire. Euh, nous combinons des, des profils de data science géomatique, algorithmique, pour traiter toute la masse de données euh, disponibles. Une partie de l'équipe est focalisée sur les aspects cas d'usage décisionnel, quelles sont les décisions qui se posent aux décideurs locaux. On a un très fort focus sur la décision locale, parce que même si cette crise est planétaire, finalement, elle se résoudra au niveau local. Et donc, euh, d'adresser les décideurs locaux et de comprendre leurs problèmes, c'est le rôle de la deuxième euh, ensemble de notre équipe. Et le dernier, c'est la partie tech, Euh, qui comprend des spécialistes IA, puisqu'on utilise l'IA de manière assez euh, extensive dans ce que nous faisons. Euh, le nom de notre société euh, contient le mot évaluation, c'est vraiment un focus particulier que nous avons pris dès l'origine, qui est de comment aider à évaluer l'efficacité euh, des politiques d'aménagement du territoire, euh, tant pour décider ces politiques, mais surtout pour faire en sorte qu'elles soient mesurables, dont les effets soient mesurables dans le temps. Voilà, alors comme le montre cette slide, je vais vous présenter ce, ce matin un exemple de contribution des images satellites au développement de la résilience des territoires à ces enjeux dont je viens de parler à l'instant, changement climatique et développement durable. L'exemple le, que je vais traiter, c'est le projet FLOAD, euh, dont l'origine se situe en octobre 2018 euh, lors d'un événement particulièrement catastrophique de pluie diluvienne euh, qui a frappé le village de, de Villegayenc dans le département de l'Aude, en France. Euh, ces pluies torrentielles ont provoqué euh, la mort de 15 personnes, euh, détruit entièrement 30 habitations et endommagé plus de 300 euh, autres. Alors, ces épisodes Sévenol euh, sont connus hein, depuis longtemps, mais celui-là a été particulièrement violent et avec les trajectoires que nous promet le GIEC, Euh, le département de l'Aude a interrogé le CNES, donc euh, Centre national d'études spatiales, pour savoir si les images satellites pouvaient aider à faire face à ces situations et à mieux s'y préparer. Donc le CNES a formé un, un partenariat euh, public-privé euh, qui a d'ailleurs très bien fonctionné. Euh, pas toujours évident à faire fonctionner, mais là, dans le cas présent, ça a été très, très productif et agréable, je dois dire avec le, le département, la DDT de l'Aude, euh, qui représente le département, le CNES, bien sûr, Météo France, euh, l'INRAE, l'Institut National de Recherche Agronomique, l'Université Toulouse, Jean Jaurès, et nous, en tant qu'opérateurs privés pour équiper le, le process. Le tout sous financement euh, Copernicus, qui est donc euh, l'Agence Européenne Satellite, euh, European Eyes on Earth, tel qui est tagline, et... Euh, Et en fait, vraiment, l'objectif, c'était comprendre ces phénomènes hydrométéo intenses et surtout développer des, des, des actions de prévention et de réduction des risques 
pour les décideurs locaux en eau et en Occitanie en, en utilisant les données disponibles, euh, appelons ça classiquement, combinées avec des données euh, satellites. Je ne sais pas s'il est prévu de prendre des questions au cours de la présentation, mais pas de problème pour moi. Euh, le focus du projet, il est euh, sur euh, la pré- et post-crise. Euh, nous ne nous sommes pas focalisés sur la crise elle-même, euh, qui est probablement euh, euh, le, le, le sujet sur lequel il y a le plus de solutions, d'actions, et c'est bien compréhensible, qui ont été entreprises, mais plutôt sur tout ce qui se passe avant en matière de prévention et après pour analyser ce qui s'est passé, ce qui a marché, pas marché, de façon à faire une boucle d'apprentissage continu. Vous vous doutez bien que sur ce genre de sujet, euh, ce n'est pas du quick fix et on ne trouve pas des solutions comme ça du premier coup qui sont efficaces. Et il y a un gros travail d'apprentissage et de packaging de ce qu'on a appris pour le rediffuser. Et donc, ça prend forme de recommandations qui sont diffusées aux, aux décideurs locaux pour leur planification territoriale. Les événements intenses, euh, tous, on regarde tous les médias, donc on, on en voit quantité, euh, malheureusement, hein, que ce soit des vents, la sécheresse, les incendies, les pluies diluviennes, les canicules, enfin bon, euh, malheureusement, c'est de plus en plus euh, visible. Donc en fait, le changement climatique prend toutes sortes de formes, en tout cas pour ce qui concerne les risques, et nous nous sommes euh, concentrés sur euh, le sujet de la résilience à ces événements extrêmes, provoqué par les euh, ruissellements intenses en territoire, en, en zone agric majoritairement agricole. Et donc, ça a été le, le focus euh, du projet, ce qui est déjà en soi euh, un, un sujet assez, assez vaste. Et en fait, les, les questions qui ont été posées à, au, part, euh, au partenariat, à l'équipe, par le département de, de l'Aude, ça a été, euh, peut-on évaluer l'impact potentiel des inondations par ruissellement sur une large échelle. Le département de l'autre fait 6 000 km euh, Donc, aller su surveiller ou inspecter ou faire des, des enquêtes, même avec des engins aériens sur une telle surface, n'est pas évident. Et donc, il, la première question, c'est est-ce que le satellite permet d'évaluer l'impact sur une, une chaîne de telle dimension comment, La deuxième question, c'est comment ralentir l'eau hein, Le problème du ruissellement, c'est comment on freine l'eau et d'ailleurs, surtout, et aussi comment on l'infiltre. Quelles sont les zones les plus vulnérables La troisième question qui nous était posée. Quels sont les leviers d'action pour réduire la vulnérabilité Et enfin, c'est peut-être le plus important, c'est comment euh, faire comprendre le phénomène, comment on peut agir, d'abord qu'on peut agir, et euh, surtout euh, alerter sur les risques euh, et lutter contre l'inaction. Ça n'arrivera pas chez moi. Et, et ce qui, en fait, est de moins en moins probable, mais ceci dit, pas partout sur, sur le territoire. Donc, suite à un grand nombre, de, vous vous en doutez, d'ateliers, de, de, de visites terrain, de séminaires, on a, on a travaillé ces différentes questions, travaillé avec Météo France, en particulier le CNES, pour exploiter les données disponibles avec la DDT également en matière de, 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 de mapping des risques, enfin vous imaginez. Et en fait, les interlocuteurs auxquels on s'est adressé, c'est les collectivités territoriales, bien sûr, les, qui planifient, les agriculteurs et les chambres d'agriculture, les syndicats de, de bassins, euh, mais aussi les assureurs, puisque le, les, les coûts d'assurance de, ce, de ces phénomènes sont, sont gigantesques, et de voir si on peut voir des, des scénarios d'adaptation qui... qui euh, améliore la prévention euh, ou non. Donc, euh, tout ça a été rassemblé dans un portail qui s'est appelé FORO, un flot d'Observatory for Resilient Occitanie. L'Occitanie, c'est la région dans laquelle se trouve l'Aude et euh, qui euh, mettait à disposition, euh, à, à travers ce portail, un ensemble d'outils, de, de, de connaissances et de guides de mise en œuvre pour aider les décideurs locaux. Alors, euh, le, ce portail FORO, je vais vous en donner quelques aperçus, mais c'est un démonstrateur, c'est la mission qui nous a été demandée, un démonstrateur qui est appelé à s'enrichir et à évoluer avec le temps. Donc, c'est ce que vous allez voir, il faudrait être très prétentieux pour penser avoir réglé ce problème sur un portail. Non, c'est un portail qui diffuse, qui, qui capitalise la, la connaissance, la, la, la compréhension, euh, accumule aussi les outils et surtout les diffuse pour être pris en main par les décideurs locaux. Ce, ce portail a 
été perçu comme suffisamment euh, avancé pour pouvoir être euh, déjà utilisé. C'est ce, le processus en cours de déploiement par euh, l'association française, enfin initialement par la mission interrégionale Inondation Arc Méditerranée, la MIAM, qui a avait comme mission de, d'aider à la prévention euh, dans la région euh, Arc Méditerranée, qui regroupe 23 départements, et c'est ce que je vais vous présenter, est en cours de déploiement euh, sur, sur cet Arc Méditerranée. Alors, à quoi sert euh, Foro, cette, euh, ce portail c'est un service que l'on veut opérationnel au sens de la planification, c'est-à-dire comprendre, euh, comprendre le phénomène, déjà, euh, et c'est, c'est vraiment le, le point de départ qu'on s'est donné, analyser et localiser les risques, parce que pour tout décideur local, ils ont tellement de sujets à traiter que d'abord, est-ce que vraiment j'ai un risque là où j'ai mes responsabilités euh, Ensuite, c'est de décider, à décider des priorités pour les actions de prévention, il y a un assez grand nombre de leviers qui peuvent être utilisés. Nous, on s'est focalisé sur certains d'entre eux. Encore une fois, je vous rappelle, c'est un démonstrateur. On a, on a traité des leviers qui portent sur les haies, euh, les haies comme euh, un, un des moyens les plus évidents, en tout cas déclarés comme tels par l'INRAE, pour freiner l'eau. Euh, et donc les haies, mais aussi la typologie des cultures, l'orientation des cultures, ont été les, les premiers types de, d'actions que l'on peut équiper et, et donc à charge pour les décideurs locaux de décider des priorités en fonction de leurs problématiques locales et aussi des volontés sur place. Hein, parce que vous savez qu'un homme politique ou un décideur local, il doit obtenir l'adhésion pour avancer et sinon il ne se passera rien du tout. Donc décider des priorités est un exercice difficile qu'il faut un peu doser. Ce n'est pas que de la théorie et de la logique, c'est aussi tenir compte de la situation locale. Et enfin, choisir les mesures incitatives ou prescriptives qui vont être décidées localement pour être intégrées dans des plans. Euh, la France est un peu les spécialistes des normes, on en parle beaucoup actuellement avec les agriculteurs. Je confirme, il y a toutes sortes de plans au niveau local, les plans climat, air, énergie, les SCOT, un schéma de cohérence territoriale, les plans locaux d'urbanisme. Les, les, les SRADET qui sont au niveau régional, les plans de protection des risques au niveau départemental. Bon. Et de voir comment ces différentes actions peuvent être intégrées dans les plans de ces différents acteurs en fonction de leur rôle et de leurs responsabilités. Le message qu'on fait passer, nous, c'est que la conjugaison des efforts est indispensable face à ce type de problème. Aucun acteur ne peut prétendre pouvoir régler le problème tout seul. Et que ce soit des acteurs privés, ou des assureurs ou des, des, des décideurs locaux de, du secteur public. La coopération, alors évidemment, si tous les gars du monde se donnaient la main, ce n'est pas ça dont on parle, mais de comprendre les problématiques et les rôles de chacun, de voir comment partager l'effort. C'est aussi ce que l'on cherche à faire à travers ce, ce portail. Alors, qu'est-ce que fait euh, Foro Donc, euh, je vous ai montrer qu'au au tout début, on aide les décideurs locaux à se demander est-ce que, euh, est-ce que j'ai un problème ou pas dans mon territoire d'intérêt ou de responsabilité. Et donc, la première chose que fait ce, ce portail, c'est, dès le, d'ailleurs, vous le voyez ici, comment se positionne la vulnérabilité de mon territoire. Donc, on peut rentrer sur ce portail, on tape un nom de commune ou de, de PCI ou de ou de territoire, et euh, la, la, le, le portail vous produit une carte de vulnérabilité des surfaces agricoles au ruissellement intense. Euh, cette carte, euh, elle est, on peut zoomer jusqu'à des carreaux, hein, chacun de ces carreaux euh, fait au zoom maximum 100 mètres par 100 mètres, et je vais vous expliquer comment les calculs sont faits de façon synthétique, parce que je ne suis pas un spécialiste, mais l'idée c'est de, voir, de pouvoir localiser le, euh, les risques on ne peut jamais tout faire, surtout dans ces sujets, ça coûte très cher en plus, beaucoup d'énergie, et donc l'important, c'est de choisir ses combats et où est-ce qu'il faut prioriser l'action. C'est ce que permet de faire ce, cette carte pour un décideur local. Donc en espèce, le focus a été mis sur la commune de Montréal, ce n'est pas au Canada, c'est dans l'Aude, commune assez grande, très agricole, très exposée, puisque vous voyez beaucoup de carreaux rouges, L'intérêt de ces notations par carreau, c'est qu'on peut les additionner et faire des synthèses euh, au niveau euh, d'un département, 
au niveau d'une région et au niveau local, on peut nommer des communes par euh, communauté de communes, etc. Donc, c'est aussi pour ça que nous faisons, c'est d'alerter du risque à différents niveaux. Et alors, comment ça marche euh, Ça marche avec des modules de calcul qui s'appellent IRIP, produits par l'INRAE, et qui sont disponibles hein, en accès public. Ces modules permettent de calculer les zones de, de production de, de ruissellement, d'accumulation d'eau, de transfert et d'accumulation d'eau en fonction de la typologie des sols. Je ne vais pas vous demander trop, on a des spécialistes avec qui on a travaillé là-dessus, mais c'est l'idée. Et donc, on fait une sorte de morphologie du risque d'un territoire que l'on corrige avec les, ce qu'il y a sur territoire en termes de facteurs d'augmentation, de réduction de ce risque. La présence de haies, si elles sont efficaces, réduit le risque. Euh, la, la, certains types de cultures augmentent le risque, d'autres le freinent. L'orientation des cultures freine ou accélère le, le, le risque selon que les cultures sont dans le sens contraire ou dans le sens de la pente, comme on peut tous le comprendre. Donc ça, c'est un, un outil qui permet de se faire une idée rapidement sur dois-je m'intéresser au problème Et après, le portail permet de voir de quoi on parle, les leviers d'action possibles. Et je ne vais pas vous montrer, pas faire une démo, ce n'est probablement pas le, pas le lieu, mais après, vous avez différents types d'analyses plus fines qui permettent de zoomer sur les haies, quelles sont les haies qui sont sur une partie de ce territoire, lesquelles sont efficaces et donc doivent être protégées. Là où il manque, il manquerait potentiellement des haies qui seraient intéressantes, où sont les cultures qui peuvent poser problème Quel est leur sens de culture Il y a des zones qui sont proposées pour aller plus loin dans, dans l'analyse. Alors maintenant, pour en revenir au, au satellite, comment le satellite est utilisé pour, pour produire ce type d'outils euh, on, on fait appel en, en, dans les traitements de base plutôt à de l'orthophoto pour justement, par exemple, l'orientation des, des cultures. L'orthophoto, le problème, c'est que souvent, elle date et qu'en qu matière de suivi, il faut une information euh, rafraîchie et, et peut-être aussi plus précise. C'est ce que permet de faire le traitement d'images satellites Pléiade. Pléiade, c'est ce, en fait un couple de satellites et à 700 km d'altitude qui ont une résolution invraisemblable de 50 cm, donc des pixels de 50 par 50, ce qui est, vous imaginez, à 700 km, de voir un pixel de 50 par 50, c'est quand même assez incroyable. Satellites qui peuvent permettent une revisite théorique de deux jours. Hein, ça dépend de la couverture nuageuse, ça dépend de, de l'angle de prise de vue. Enfin, il y a toutes sortes de, de contraintes techniques avec les satellites à prendre en compte. Ces images sont payantes. Euh, elles ne sont pas gratuites du tout. Elles sont très à des prix extrêmement favorables pour tout ce qui est collectivité territoriale. Elles peuvent se les procurer à des conditions défiant toute concurrence. Le CNES, sa mission, c'est de diffuser les images satellites aussi largement que possible notamment pour ce genre de, de sujet. Donc, quel, un exemple d'application de ce euh, traitement satellite sur cette, euh, sur cette carte ici, et là, vous voyez le trait bleu, c'est le calcul de l'orientation des, des, des cultures sur une, cette, euh, ce secteur. On voit d'ailleurs les autres tracés, ce n'est pas très facile à voir ailleurs sur la, la carte. Et là, en fait, ça permet d'évaluer si l'orientation de la culture est un problème ou pas vis-à-vis -vis de la réduction du, du risque. Et là, ça se fait par des algos de, de traitement d'images satellites qui permettent de produire ce type de résultat. Donc, voilà un cas d'utilisation des, des images satellites. Alors, chacun de ces cas, c'est un process hein, de, de, de mise au point des algos, de vérification terrain. En fait, ceux qui ont fait de l'IA, et on en fait pas mal, savent que le problème de l'IA, c'est comment valider sa fiabilité. Et donc, nous, on est très... Euh, très, euh, à, la, à, la mani à la vérification de, 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 ces, de ces calculs, de voir si par des enquêtes terrain, ça recoupe bien de façon à avoir une bonne, une bonne certitude, en tout cas aussi forte que possible, sur les résultats donnés par l'IA. Mais les résultats sont très convaincants. Les visites qu'on a faites à Montréal, par exemple, les agriculteurs étaient euh, étonnés, euh, ils parvenaient assez vite à des conclusions qui, qui corroboraient nos... Nos, nos calculs. Quels sont les autres sujets auxquels on s'est déjà attaqué en cours, mais qui ne sont pas encore matures hein, Comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, tout ça, c'est un processus d'apprentissage évolutif. Sur les embâcles, les satellites sont très efficaces pour détecter des embâcles. Une embâcle, pour ceux qui ne savent pas ce que c'est, c'est des accumulations 
de bois ou de débris euh, aux, aux, aux bordures de cours d'eau, dans les virages des, des rivières ou des, ou des cours d'eau, mais aussi sous les piles de ponts. Enfin. Et ces accumulations de bois peuvent avoir un effet favorable ou défavorable en cas de, de, de pluie de, de torrentielle. Et donc, euh, on travaille là-dessus, on a bon espoir d'aboutir assez vite. Sur les, sur les cultures endommagées, en particulier les vignes, ce qui permet après à large sel de dévaluer suite à un dégât, à un événement cataclysmique, enfin catastrophique, les, les dégâts causés avec une mesure par satellite. Les haies, les haies aussi, de détecter les haies. Aujourd'hui, on s'appuie essentiellement sur une base d'inventaire des haies au niveau national. Il y a beaucoup de travail en cours sur comment, avec le satellite, détecter les haies, ce qui est aussi et quelque chose d'assez, euh, on est très fort probabilité d'aboutir, on n'est pas les seuls à y travailler euh, d'ailleurs. On met en ligne souvent des, 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 des outils qui ne sont pas nécessairement produits par nous. Euh, ce qu'on veut, c'est équiper la décision locale. Et donc sur l'EF, vous savez que la France a demandé 50, enfin l'État français a demandé 50 000 km de haies supplémentaires euh, dans les dix euh, ans qui viennent, je crois, si ma mémoire est bonne. Et le dernier point qui est celui sur lequel finalement on travaille le plus, c'est comment corroborer l'efficacité des actions de prévention. Et là, le, le, le projet sur lequel on travaille actuellement, avec une demande d'un autre SPO, donc ces projets type float que l'UFNES finance avec Copernicus, euh, qui n'est pas encore approuvé, mais on est au cours. Le but, c'est de, après chaque événement climatique euh, euh, intense, euh, de comparer comment le territoire a évolué depuis le dernier euh, image. Euh, satellites disponibles. Vous savez que les images sont disponibles pratiquement euh, systématiquement à chaque événement intense. Et donc, de voir si, euh, comment le territoire a évolué par rapport aux aménagements qui ont été faits depuis, favorablement ou défavorablement, en constatant les, les, les écarts et, et les différences sur le terrain. Mais aussi de voir quelles sont les stratégies d'aménagement à base de haies, de cultures en terrasse, de ripicides, euh, ont été les plus efficaces et d'avoir une approche plus statistique de quels sont les scénarios de prévention les plus efficaces ou non. Vous imaginez l'importance que peut avoir ce type de vérification et le satellite est idéalement la solution pour participer à ça. Ça ne réglera pas le problème, mais en croisant différents types d'actions, le satellite permettra d'attester de façon beaucoup plus forte la, la, la valeur des algos de prédiction, dont les nôtres, hein, ou des scénarios d'aménagement recommandés. Et c'est aussi une action qu'on mène, enfin qu'on envisage de mener avec l'INRAE, l'ONERA et le CNES et Météo France également. Donc voilà un peu pour les autres cas d'application des, des données satellites. Et enfin, ben finalement, à quoi tout ça sert Et on a des sites pilotes dans le cadre de notre déploiement Arc Méditerranée, hein, où on a une assez grande surface et quelques sites pilotes sur lesquels on travaille pour voir quelle valeur ajoutée est vraiment apportée localement. Évidemment, sur les pertes humaines, inutile d'en parler. C'est le, le premier sujet, mais le, le, celui d'érosion de, des sols est devenu très préoccupant. Je suis sûr qu'il y a beaucoup de personnes bien plus compétentes que moi dans l'assistance sur ce sujet. Et, et la perte de productivité agricole, si vous allez voir sur le site de McCain, qui produit des frites, il se plaigne d'une perte de production, je ne sais plus si c'est 10 ou 20 sur ces dix dernières années, de leurs fournisseurs à cause de l'érosion des, des sols. Et le, le ruissellement intense, on le comprend très bien, euh, provoque et accélère, surtout quand il est couplé à de la sécheresse intense, de la perte de sol et donc de productivité. Mais c'est aussi les dommages aux infrastructures. On a un de nos sites pilotes dans la Lomagne, Tarn et Garonnaise, pour, pour être précis, qui se préoccupe de l'augmentation des coûts d'entretien des routes. Ils veulent savoir quels sont, comment mieux les maîtriser, mieux anticiper. Euh, ces coûts euh, qui, sont, qui deviennent trop lourds pour, euh, pour eux. Il y a aussi les infiltrations de, des particules arrachées par le ruissellement qui passent dans les usines de traitement d'eau, tous les systèmes de filtrage. Ces particules sont, sont ce qu'on nous désintime, catastrophiques hein, pour toute l'efficacité et le coût d'entretien de ces installations. Et évidemment, les pertes de culture et de matériel agricole et qui sont euh, corrélées à ce type de, de défis. Voilà, écoutez, euh, j'ai fait terminer ma présentation sur un, un cas d'application de ces images satellites et de ces nouvelles technologies. Enfin, nouvelles. Cette technologie a des enjeux 
euh, majeur de notre, de notre époque, sur lequel nous, nous cherchons à apporter notre contribution. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Alors, moi, j'aurais une question, euh, juste par curiosité, euh, par rapport à la carte que vous avez montrée tout à l'heure, euh, la carte de, sur Foro des... Voilà, c'est ça, des, des zones potentiellement vulnérables. C'est des données, comme c'est des données, du coup, si je comprends bien, qui viennent des images satellites, c'est en temps réel ou est-ce qu'il y a une mise à jour peut-être mensuelle des données ou euh, voilà, c'était juste pour savoir. Euh... Non, alors, ce n'est pas, pas en temps réel. Si vous voulez, nous, on est à l'échelle de la planification. Euh, les horizons de planification sont longs. D'accord. Euh, et donc, en fait, si vous voulez, nous, on peut mettre ces cartes à jour euh, de façon euh, presque immédiate. Ce qui n'est pas du tout immédiat, c'est la donnée sur laquelle on s'appuie. Elle est très souvent annuelle. Pour les satellites, elle peut être euh, très régulière, mais encore faut-il avoir demandé la production de l'image. Donc, en fait, si vous voulez, on se place, et ça fait partie euh, des, des offres que l'on propose, c'est quel est le pas de temps euh, d'un territoire ou de, des responsables d'un territoire avec lequel ils souhaitent euh, piloter euh, l'évolution des choses sur le terrain. Donc, le rythme, euh, aujourd'hui, est, est dicté par le, le, le rafraîchissement des données, euh, qui, par ceux qui les produisent. Nous, on ne produit pas la data, sauf celle qu'on extrait des images euh, satellites et tous les croisements qu'on fait entre les données disponibles. Donc, la réponse est non, ce n'est pas temps réel et c'est quelque chose qui est fait sur un rythme, on n'a qu'à dire annuel ou biannuel. Euh, par contre, on, avec ce système de surveillance post-événement catastrophique, Là, on prévoit des zooms juste euh, après les événements catastrophiques, d'actualisation de ces informations, euh, des projets dont je parlais euh, euh, tout à l'heure. D'accord, ok. Bah, merci beaucoup. Et Oui, et on a une deuxième question. Oui. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, moi, je me Bonjour. demandais juste si vous avez euh, en fait une boucle de retour pour mesurer l'impact positif, par exemple, de la plantation de haies, si elles ont bien pris ou mal pris, et euh, comment du coup, améliorer le processus continuellement. Excusez-moi, je ne vous entends pas très bien. Quelle est votre question oui. Est-ce que, est que vous avez une, une, un processus de mesure pour voir l'impact positif ou négatif des différentes actions que vous préconisez Typiquement pour la oui, plantation alors, de haies, si elles ont bien pris ou pas bien pris. Quoi. Oui, oui. Bah, c'est le sujet essentiel. C'est pour ça que j'ai terminé là-dessus en disant qu'avec le, le système de mesure post-événement, catastrophique, c'était probablement le moyen le plus crédible pour euh, mesurer euh, l'impact réel. Nous, qu'est-ce qu'on fait là déjà à ce stade C'est qu'on reproduit cette carte dans le temps. Euh, une fois que les haies sont plantées, on les prend en compte dans les calculs. Euh, une fois que les sens d'orientation des cultures ont varié, ils sont aussi intégrés dans les calculs. Donc, la couleur de ces carreaux évolue euh, en fonction… De, de ce qui s'est passé sur le terrain et qu'on est capable de détecter avec les, les data que l'on processe. Donc, c'est en ce sens qu'on mesure euh, l'évolution vue de ces algos. Après, euh, est-ce que pour autant, les algos ont la précision nécessaire euh, et la crédibilité nécessaire C'est là où je dis qu'on veut rajouter cette couche de vérification euh, avec les, des détections de différences sur le terrain par les images satellites et c'est ce qui intéresse particulièrement les assureurs, l'INRAE et ce, ce type d'organisme, de pouvoir avoir un bilan coût-avantage, savoir est-ce que ça vaut le coup d'agir ou pas en ce sens et quels sont les gains qu'on peut anticiper. Mais donc, pour répondre à votre question en synthèse, oui, on suit l'évolution. Cette carte est actualisée aussi souvent qu'elle est demandée et la fraîcheur des informations et on voit si ça s'améliore ou pas. D'accord, merci. Merci beaucoup. Donc, je pense que là, c'est bon. Donc, euh, merci encore, Arnaud André. Euh, on va passer à la suite. Donc, euh, la suite, ça va être euh, la démonstration euh, de, la, de, de la musique des plantes. Ça, ça va être super intéressant. On va juste prendre 5-10 minutes, euh, petite pause, le temps que... Euh, voilà, euh, Monsieur et Madame Toby puissent euh, bien installer euh, tout, tout leur équipement. So, for all those uh, who are English speakers in the chat, we will take five to ten minutes break, just a quick, quick break, so Mr. and Mrs. Toby can install all their setup, uh, set up all their material. So, yeah, stay tuned, and we will be back very, very soon. Just 
five, ten minutes. Hi again, everybody. So for English speakers in the chat, uh, we, we are back. Uh, and now we will have Jean Toby who will do his presentation along with uh, his wife, I think. Yeah, Frederic Toby. Um, the presentation will be in French, but as I said earlier, uh, in the replay, you will have all the subtitles uh, in English. Uh, so you, when you will watch the replay, you will be able to understand everything that has been said. Euh, maintenant, on va parler en français, on va switcher, donc on reprend. Euh, merci d'avoir patienté durant la pause. Euh, on, je vais passer euh, la parole euh, et le micro euh, à Jean Toby, voilà, qui va nous parler de musique des plantes et phytoneurologie. Bonjour à toutes et tous, euh, merci d'être là. Merci pour l'organisation, merci pour l'invitation. Alors, euh, on, je vais commencer tout de suite la présentation avec ce que vous avez à l'écran et un exemple un, de quelque chose qui, ne fonctionne, enfin, qui fonctionne, mais qui montre que ça ne fonctionne pas. Dans le sens où ce que j'ai branché, alors sur euh, la plante que j'ai ici, chlorophytum, j'ai branché en fait deux électrodes. La première sur le feuillage, que vous voyez peut-être à l'écran, et la deuxième au niveau du pot pour capter en fait, l'activité électrique de surface du végétal. Et les, la boîte noire qui est là va transcoder cette activité électrique de surface en son. Alors c'est des boîtes suprasensibles parce que l'activité électrique d'une plante de surface c'est de l'ordre entre 0 mV 001 et 1 mV maximum en termes de surface. Donc il faut des boîtiers très sensibles, mais la plante elle est suprasensible, c'est ce que l'on va voir. Alors on a une courbe à l'écran, cette courbe à l'écran c'est donc le transcodage que nous avons. Alors c'est un équaliseur, c'est un logiciel de musicien parce qu'actuellement on travaille avec des logiciels qui existent et ce sont des logiciels qui ne sont pas dédiés à nos travaux, mais on prend ce qui existe sur le marché pour étudier. Donc, euh, cette particularité, c'est que ça nous donne une action très particulière sur ce qui se passe sur la plante. Par exemple, ici, le chlorophytum, eh bien, très clairement, jusqu'à présent, elle n'aime pas beaucoup être là, puisqu'elle est bloquée complètement dans son activité. C'est pour ça que vous avez un, un encéphalogramme plat que vous voyez euh, au début. Et donc, on voit que la courbe, c'est toujours la même, en fait, mais ça nous donne quand même un principe de base. C'est-à-dire que, et c'est l'essence même de si quelque chose peut être résumé de mon intervention aujourd'hui, c'est que, et même ce que l'on peut entendre très couramment dans les, sur les, tous les professionnels de l'agriculture, c'est qu'on a complètement oublié deux éléments importants de l'agriculture. Un, le règne végétal, et je pèse mes mots. Aujourd'hui, on ne comprend plus rien des plantes. On fait tout ce que l'on fait au niveau des cultures. On va tronquer l'activité du végétal et donc on a moins de rendement. Là, on a entendu tout de suite plein de choses sur les végétaux, etc., les problèmes de rentabilité sur les cultures. Mais dans tout ce qui est fait aujourd'hui, toutes les techniques, je dirais toutes, hein, essentiellement toutes, même parfois en bio, vont à l'encontre du développement du végétal. Et c'est un peu le message que j'aimerais passer. Toutes les nouvelles techniques qu'on peut mettre en place aujourd'hui sur les cultures, si elles ne tiennent pas compte de les cultu de les, des cultures elles-mêmes, c'est voué à l'échec, comme les cultures d'aujourd'hui. Ça, c'est très, très important. Et là, c'est un peu une bonne démo parce qu'en fait, on prend une plante qui est en pot, on a fait de la voiture, on la met ici. C'est tout à fait l'ambiance que les plantes n'aiment pas. Il y a beaucoup d'électronique, il y a beaucoup de fils de câble. On est arrivé depuis pas très longtemps. Et eh bien, elle est... Voilà. Alors, si je monte le son de ce que l'on a, je ne sais pas si vous entendez. Donc, normalement, ça fait des sons très mélodieux parce que quand on transcode en son une activité hydrique d'une plante, c'est très mélodieux. Et là, on voit que ça tourne en boucle. C'est joliment en boucle, mais ça reste en boucle. Voilà. Donc, alors, quand on voit un écran comme ça, on va dans un champ, on va brancher une, une vigne, par exemple, où, eh bien, on peut dire tout ce qui est en dessous de 2000 Hz correspond au système racinaire. Et donc, par rapport à la courbe que l'on va avoir, on peut dire si la plante est effectivement avec toutes ses racines ou pas. Par exemple, ici, on s'aperçoit que la courbe électrique... Là, on Voilà. Donc, je... Donc là, on voit qu'elle plonge vers les 46 Hz. Ça veut dire que c'est une plante qui n'a pas ses racines principales, il n'y a pas de pivot. Une... Donc c'est normal, c'est une plante qui a été faite par division, donc ça on le sait. Mais quand on va dans un arbre en pleine ville, par exemple, en branchant la plante, on peut savoir... J'ai un problème du micro. Euh, si euh, effectivement le pivot est entier ou pas. Au-dessus de 1000 Hz, ça correspond à la partie aérienne. Et donc, on peut savoir, en branchant une plante, si elle est cultivée avec des molécules de synthèse ou s'il est en bio, euh, tout ce genre de choses. On peut définir un certain nombre de critères. C'est une, une aide au diagnostic qui est assez intéressante. Si on va sur des pommiers, par exemple, au mois de février, 
on regarde l'activité hydrique, et si le climat reste dans une gamme normale de climat, on peut dire si la plante va produire complètement, superbement, ou, ou pas du tout, ou, moyen, ou dans quelle moyenne. Rien qu'en analysant l'activité hydrique en février, on peut avoir les résultats euh, sur l'avenir de ce fruitier. Alors, comme là, il bon, n'y a pas de musique, bah, ce n'est pas grave, ça montre que la plante, si on ne s'en occupe pas bien, eh bien, elle ne fait rien, et c'est assez logique, y compris pour les cultures. Alors, tout ce que l'on peut dire, c'est qu'effectivement, plus euh, une plante a une activité hydrique importante, et mieux c'est pour la plante. Alors, qui sommes-nous Eh bien, euh, Jean et Frédéric Toby, nous sommes pépiniéristes, je dirais, depuis euh, le milieu du 19e. Nous, on n'a pas de cursus euh, universitaire. Tout ce que l'on va dire, c'est la récurrence de nos travaux euh, depuis donc 2012, maintenant qu'on a commencé à s'inquiéter de l'analyse de l'activité hydrique et des sons des végétaux. Et, ce qui, et pour pouvoir conférer cela, eh bien aussi pour, on, on va s'appuyer sur des aides euh, de différents scientifiques qui nous appuient. À partir de 1985, on a créé un jardin, le Plantarium de Gaujac. Et parce que l'on cultive régulièrement des végétaux, on s'aperçoit que, effectivement, quand on fait des boutures, des greffes à longueur d'année, eh bien, à un moment donné, les végétaux ne répondent pas complètement comme on a appris à l'école d'horticulture. Il y a autre chose. Non, je pas ça, c'est le plan général. Pour dire aussi que lorsqu'on fait des cultures, on a parlé tout à l'heure de planter dans le sens de la pente ou pas, etc. Eh bien, il existe depuis le XIIe siècle une étude assez intéressante avec, à l'époque, on c'était que les récoltes qui donnaient les résultats, si la, la méthode était bonne ou pas, puisque la forme d'un champ sa longueur sur sa largeur, ou les formes géométriques favorisaient euh, ou pas certaines cultures. Donc ça, c'est un savoir qui a complètement disparu aujourd'hui. Et pourtant, alors, le professeur Ernst Rocher s'y intéresse aujourd'hui. Mais c'est assez des, des savoirs perdus. Alors, notamment, ce que l'on pourrait dire aussi dans cette démonstration, c'est que toutes les personnes qui souhaitent faire carrière aujourd'hui euh, au niveau euh, des cultures, au sens large du terme, eh bien, en s'inquiétant de savoir la, tout ce qu'on peut appeler de la phytoneurologie. C'est assez rigolo parce que la plante a démarré là. Non, je ne peux plus vous passer à l'écran, mais je mettais tout à l'heure, mais là, ça y est, la plante, elle fonctionne. Là. Alors, et, en fait, les gens pourront travailler où ils veulent, quand ils veulent. Tous ces savoirs-là vont impacter complètement positivement toutes les filières. Quand je dis toutes, il n'y en a pas une qui échappe. On pourra en parler après si vous voulez. Donc, le premier métier qui euh, est en devenir absolument incroyable, c'est celui de musinierie. C'est ce que l'on fait nous aujourd'hui. C'est quelqu'un qui cultive pour entendre les sons des végétaux. Et c'est tout à fait intéressant, on va voir pourquoi. Alors, pour appuyer nos travaux, on a toujours... Voilà, oui, ça a l'air de notre... C'est bon. Donc, depuis 2015, nous avons toujours travaillé à la maison avec différents scientifiques pour apprendre, euh, je dirais, euh, tout le côté adaptation par rapport à un climat, l'acclimatation, la sélection massale, etc., depuis, donc avec Ernst Zorcher, Michel Courant euh, et différents scientifiques de Suisse, beaucoup. Et depuis 2019, le professeur Marc-Henri travaille assidûment avec nous. Et donc, je lui ai demandé un peu son cursus scientifique, parce que c'est un des scientifiques aujourd'hui les plus, euh, euh, comment je dirais, cités. Donc, il a mis sous tout son tableau, etc. Euh, lui, est spécialiste de l'eau. Et la deuxième grande oubliée de la culture, c'est l'eau. Aujourd'hui, on fait des tas de techniques. On oublie les plantes, on oublie l'eau. Et si vous vous occupez des plantes et de l'eau, vous allez voir, vous allez pouvoir transcender toute l'agriculture. Et on a plein d'exemples. Alors, dans nos travaux, qui peuvent paraître bizarres, au prime abord, mais il faut savoir que, notamment, vous avez ici différentes publications qui ont été faites et que vous pouvez retrouver en fonction de ce que je vous ai mis là, euh, qui ne sont pas forcément des, 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 des études sur la phytonologie elle-même, mais tout ce qui tourne autour de la connexion des plantes avec leur environnement. Et notamment, ce que, une étude qui a été trouvée, donc celle de Bertolon, en 1783, sur l'électroculture. Donc, en, depuis 1783, on sait que les végétaux possèdent une activité électrique et que déjà au XVIIIe siècle, on pouvait jouer sur la, 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 la fertilité sur les récoltes en, en augmentant l'activité électrique d'une plante. Qu'est-ce qu'on en a fait depuis Strictement rien. Et aujourd'hui, on a aujourd'hui des, des applications. On va vous montrer tout ça. Alors, on a eu, euh, on a travaillé aussi sur, euh, avec Michel Courant, l'université de Fribourg sur la communication. Est-ce que l'activité électrique d'une plante est une forme de communication ou pas Donc, elle est venue au plantarium pendant deux jours et effectivement, elle a donc fait 
qu'on retrouve dans le livre tout le résumé de ce qu'elle a pu faire. Mais euh, je dis en résumé, les expériences de Jean et Frédéric Toby donc, m'apparaissent comme une mine pour la recherche scientifique. Si j'avais les moyens d'un mécène, je mettrais les équipes entières pour découvrir les plantes. Parmi les premiers défis à relever, je verrais notamment décoder la musique des plantes avec et sans correspondance lexicale, en variant et en multipliant les expériences afin de comparer, d'analyser, d'évaluer l'étendue de l'initiative de la plante à base de ses choix et le sens de son action dans l'espace mis à sa disposition. Idem pour les expériences thérapeutiques, on en reparlera tout à l'heure, et puis étudier les mécanismes de répétition, d'imitation et de création qui se manifestent dans la musique des plantes. En mots, établir un état des lieux du potentiel cognitif des plantes, en général et par espèce. Voilà, ça c'est Michel Courant, maître de conférence en informatique, Université de Fribourg. Alors, on a quelques règles qui changent par rapport à l'agriculture générale. La première pour nous, c'est que les mauvaises herbes n'existent pas. Aujourd'hui, on voit beaucoup de luttes. On lutte, on fait la guerre aux insectes. On... Non, les mauvaises herbes n'existent pas. Et d'ailleurs, si on voit beaucoup d'érosion dans les sols, c'est parce qu'on a lutté contre ce qu'on appelle des mauvaises herbes, alors que ce sont des alliés absolument incroyables. Donc, pour ça, dire, on fait beaucoup l'inverse de ce qu'il faudrait faire aujourd'hui. Tous les végétaux sont utiles. Tous les insectes sont utiles, tous les champignons sont utiles. Les problèmes sont liés au déséquilibre entre les populations. Et si on ne connaît pas le rôle positif d'un être vivant, c'est que nous n'avons pas compris ce rôle. Voilà, nous ne l'avons pas assez étudié. Ça, c'est vraiment capital. D'ailleurs, aujourd'hui, on a une petite anecdote qui fait rire ou pas rire. C'est qu'on cherche désespérément une personne qui souhaiterait, dans son étude universitaire, ruiner sa carrière dès le début en acceptant d'étudier le rôle positif du milieu sur la vigne. Alors ça paraît incongru, parce qu'on sait bien que lorsqu'il y a beaucoup de mildiou, il y a un problème. Sauf que je peux vous assurer que lorsqu'on va dans une vigne où il n'y a pas de mildiou du tout, il y a des problèmes de culture. Alors que quand il y a un petit peu de mildiou, il n'y a pas de problème de culture. Il y a un équilibre qui se crée. Donc il faut trouver le rôle positif du mildiou sur la vigne. Et quand on aura développé ça, on fera un grand pas en avant. Pour nous, on a une idée, c'est dans l'assimilation des oligo notamment bord et molybdène. Mais à prouver d'une manière plus... Universitaire. Ensuite, les plantes sont intelligentes. Alors, je ne peux pas faire une démonstration totale aujourd'hui, mais voilà, on le fait régulièrement à la maison. Nous devons tout faire pour les comprendre, faire des recherches sans comprendre ce règne et évoluer à l'échec d'avance, exactement comme les techniques actuelles. C'est ce que je disais en préambule. C'est très, très important de remettre le règne végétal au cœur des études que l'on peut faire. Aujourd'hui, c'est ce qu'on ne fait pas. Alors, comment on s'en s'est aperçu, nous, des applications à force d'étudier en branchant des plantes et en écoutant les végétaux, on s'est aperçu que, eh bien, on avait une amélioration de notre santé, de notre vue, etc. Alors, je vous passe les détails. Grâce à un musicologue, Pascal Marmol, à la clinique Bretéché de Nantes, on a appliqué une musique des plantes sur trois patients de la clinique. Donc, et le staff médical a signé ce qu'on appelle une DME, démonstration médicale expérimentale, comme quoi, effectivement, il y a bien une amélioration des patients après la musique des plantes qu'avant. Donc ça, ça a été les premières sources d'études. Ensuite, on a eu vent euh, des travaux de Joel Starheimer et on a pu déterminer... Alors les travaux de Joel Starheimer sont très importants à comprendre parce qu'ils ont pu euh, mettre en avant que les, par rapport aux études à euh, un prix Nobel, Louis de Broglie, en 1929, pour avoir démontré qu'à chaque masse correspond une fréquence. Et Joel Starheimer qui était, lui, euh, donc élève en physique de Louis de Breuil, eh bien, il a pu dire, ben, en fait, puisqu'on connaît la masse des acides aminés, donc, si on fait par calcul mathématique, on connaît la fréquence, et donc, une chaîne protéique, et une suite de notes, et donc, une suite musicale. Et il a pu le démontrer, effectivement, que ça marchait comme ça, euh, notamment avec euh, la première étude qui a fait son brevet, c'est euh, en démontrant que, lorsque l'on va euh, sonoriser dans un champ de tomates la synthèse d'une protéine qu'elle fait pour elle-même, la TS14, qui était une protéine qui a été découverte par un chercheur espagnol, eh bien, par calcul mathématique, on va aller voir quels acides aminés, quelle masse, donc quelle fréquence. On fait une phrase musicale avec ça. Et quand on diffuse la phrase musicale dans le champ de tomate, il y a jusqu'à 20 fois la récolte. C'est tout à fait exponentiel. Et donc là, on explique très bien que lorsqu'on a une note diffusée, eh bien, la note bleue, c'est ce qui va stimuler l'acide aminé en question, la note rouge, c'est ce qui va l'inhiber. Donc on peut stimuler ou inhiber des chaînes protéiques dans une culture, grâce notamment avec la musique des plantes, on va y revenir. Donc, 
c'est ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui la génodique, c'est un calcul mathématique qui transpose donc des protéines déjà découvertes qui sont dans une database. À chaque fois qu'un universitaire, un scientifique trouve une chaîne protéique, il va la mettre dans une base où on aura accès, on pourra comparer si effectivement euh, ça existe. Et si elle, est, et si elle existe, eh bien on pourra la transcoder en son. Et notamment, alors vous avez genodix.net, genodix.com, vous pouvez aller voir, c'est tout à fait intéressant. Et nous, on a essayé sur nos cultures, notamment on cultive pour la Maison Chanel depuis 1997, notamment ici des gardénias, sans la musique de la plante, enfin de, de, de l'acide aminé transcodé euh, en son, eh bien, on a 40 kg de récolte. Et puis, lorsqu'on met une fois le matin, une fois le soir, le son qui correspond à cette chaîne protéique, qui est la, la séquence de la pétala dans, le, dans cet exemple-là, eh bien, on récolte 180 kg. Donc, on a, nous, la démonstration, c'est très factuel pour nous. Là où ça devient intéressant, c'est grâce à ces travaux de Jalester Heimer, on peut comprendre qu'un son peut stimuler ou inhiber une chaîne protéique. Alors maintenant, premier exemple que nous avons dans les cultures, euh, c'est un peu dans l'ordre chronologique que j'ai mis ça, ici aux pépinières euh, Estibaux, euh, pas très loin de chez nous, des cultures très malades, notamment ce sont des lagastremia, euh, avec des problèmes d'oïdium. L'oïdium, c'est un champignon du feuillage, et lorsque le champignon se met extrêmement, euh, lorsqu'il est très virulent, il finit par se développer, y compris l'hiver, sur rameau. Et donc, ça fait 12 ans qu'il luttait contre ça, en mettant entre 20 et 26 traitements chimiques par an. Et à chaque fois, il changeait de molécule, ça allait un peu mieux, puis après, ça retombait dans un désastre encore plus grand. Alors, la, la méthode, qui paraît un peu bizarre encore une fois, mais on a différents scientifiques qui sont là pour prouver que, effectivement, euh, ça fonctionne comme ça. On va prendre une fougère, c'est pour ça que je vous ai mis une fougère ici, parce que, effectivement, la fougère, c'est l'organisme le plus ancien, euh, enfin, en termes de végétaux, euh, structuré. Et avec 450 millions d'années, elle a beaucoup plus d'activité électrique qu'un arbre qui n'a que 200 millions d'années d'évolution, qui a beaucoup plus d'activité électrique qu'un simple chlorophytum qui n'a que 100 millions d'années d'évolution. Et donc aujourd'hui, on fait un lien entre l'activité électrique d'un organisme vivant et sa longévité d'évolution. Et comme on transcode en, en son une activité électrique, bah, la fougère, bien sûr, on a des sons tout à fait intéressants et importants qui peuvent effectivement, si c'est le cas, stimuler ou inhiber une chaîne protéique. Donc on prend une fougère, c'est la, la raison pour laquelle on prend une fougère. On va la mettre dans la culture qui est malade, on va sonoriser la fougère, on va enregistrer les sons, et ces sons, on va les mettre dans l'eau du biodémiseur, qui est un appareil qu'on a coproduit avec des amis, chercheurs et, et fabricants. On va y revenir. Et la personne va traiter non plus qu'un produit chimique, mais avec une eau informée. Alors on peut dire, oui, mais l'eau informée, c'est bizarre, il y a eu plein de trucs dessus. Mais Benveniste, Montagnier, sont des gens qui avaient tout à fait raison. Euh, ça a pu être mal dit, mal compris, ça peut être dérangeant pour différentes choses. N'empêche que ça fonctionne. Et nous, aujourd'hui, on a à peu près 50 entreprises qui fonctionnent 100% avec cela. Et donc, euh, ces entreprises ne fonctionneraient, ne fonctionneraient pas. Elles arrêteraient tout de suite la méthode si ça ne fonctionnait pas. Donc, ils vont euh, pulvériser une fois par semaine ces taux informés, avec différents... On va y revenir après. Et donc, huit mois après, on a commencé en février, 99% des végétaux sont sans champignons. Et comme on, a, on lui a interdit d'employer tout ce qui est insecticides et fongicides, bien sûr, les insectes mycophages commencent à revenir et font leur travail de manger les champignons. C'est le rôle des insectes. Donc, en fait, si on a un équilibre, on n'a plus de problème avec euh, les animaux. Au contraire, on est bien content de les avoir. Le plus intéressant, c'est au bout d'un an seulement d'application de la méthode dans ces cultures. Aujourd'hui, 100% de sa pépinière est faite comme cela. Et donc, il nous dit, alors qu'il mettait 26 traitements chimiques par an, cette vision, cette nouvelle vision plus large de la culture nous a permis de ne plus rester focalisés sur nos problèmes phyto ou d'attaque de pucerons sur la gestroémia. Ainsi, cette approche est pour nous plus systémique. On considère désormais l'ensemble de l'écosystème serre et abord dans sa diversité et sa complexité. Tous sont liés au sein de ce système. Chaque maillon de ce système chaîne a son importance dans l'équilibre global et doit être considéré afin d'atteindre nos objectifs de production. En dix lignes, tout est dit. Si vous avez compris ça, vous pouvez travailler n'importe où avec n'importe quel végétal. C'est très important parce qu'il avait, lui, en mettant ses produits chimiques, oublié complètement que la plante était vivante, que les insectes étaient vivants, que les champignons étaient vivants et que si on bouscule l'équilibre qui est en place, eh bien, on fait plus de problèmes que de solutions intéressantes. Et aujourd'hui, cette pépinière-là 
n'a plus aucun produit phytosanitaire. Vous savez peut-être qu'en France, il y a une loi qui a été promulguée il n'y a pas très très longtemps, il y a deux ans, je pense, qui oblige tous les organismes publics à étudier les méthodes alternatives aux molécules de synthèse. C'est une loi qui est intéressante, dans le sens que l'AMSA, Mutualité sociale agricole, a fait une enquête sur des différentes entreprises qui utilisaient notre méthode, et ils ont validé qu'effectivement, il y a eu bien les résultats, à la fois économiques, sociaux, dans le, dans, notamment au niveau de l'AMSA, le cadre, c'était la prévention des risques phytosanitaires. Et là, il n'y a pas de risque phytosanitaire, et avec les résultats à la clé. On a un, quelqu'un qui fait des fleurs coupées. Alors, toutes nos actions dans les différentes cultures n'ont pas été couronnées de succès tout à fait au début. Ce n'est pas une méthode miracle, dans le sens que plug and play, euh, voilà. Non, il y a. Parfois, ça marche très rapidement. Des fois, on adapte. Pour les pommiers, on a mis trois ans pour trouver la méthode. Pour là, ça a été un exemple un petit peu à l'inverse. Les fleurs coupées, c'est très compliqué de faire en bio parce que c'est des plantes exotiques, parce qu'elles sont, elles demandent certaines conditions un peu spécifiques. Elles demandent de la chaleur, souvent de l'eau, etc. Et euh, Camille Pénisson a lui en, en, a mis, en a mis six mois. Donc là, c'était vraiment très, très rapide pour trouver l'intégralité des techniques dont il avait besoin pour, pour, pour ces cultures. Alors l'exemple du lysianthus à gauche est très intéressant. C'est une plante très compliquée. Et là, aujourd'hui, il n'a plus aucun engrais de synthèse. Il n'a plus aucun insecticide, plus aucun fongicide. Tout est fait uniquement avec de l'eau informée et tout en ayant entre 10 et 70 de récolte en plus. Ici, Dominique Dayat. Alors, il y a trois hectares de serre. Alors, ça marche aussi en extérieur, mais je parle là des premiers exemples qui nous ont suivis, parce que c'est eux qui avaient le plus de problèmes. Sous serre, on a plus de problèmes qu'en extérieur, le plus souvent. Et là, à droite, c'est une serre qui est cultivée. Non, maintenant, ça fait depuis six ans qu'ils cultivent avec cette méthode-là. Et à gauche, eh bien, euh, c'était lors de la présentation de ce qu'on appelle les songrais. Aujourd'hui, on sait qu'on a un problème avec l'azote, euh, dans les problèmes de cours d'eau, etc. Et, euh, mais c'est vrai pour tous les engrais de synthèse de manière générale. Plus évidemment la molécule est mouvante dans le sol, plus elle, se, plus elle est mobile, plus l'impact est connu. Les, les problèmes de phosphore et potasse sont connus beaucoup plus tard, parce que ça migre beaucoup plus lentement dans le sol. Le, la potasse, en général, ça migre à peu près 1 cm par an. L'azote, c'est 3 mètres par an, donc ça suit le cours d'eau. En fait. C'est pour ça qu'on a des problèmes d'azote aujourd'hui, mais il ne faut pas s'attendre à ce qu'il n'y ait pas de problème avec les autres, ça va venir. Donc lui, euh, donc les, les chiffres que vous voyez, euh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, donc on a fait sur piment, on a fait sur tomate. Chrysanthème, c'était intéressant, parce que c'est très compliqué de cultiver des chrysanthèmes sans produits chimiques et sans engrais. Et là, en fait, il montre qu'il peut faire une culture ben, sans rien de tout ça, uniquement en employant de l'eau euh, biodynamisée. Euh, on va y revenir après. Sur le maraîchage, là aussi, depuis 2018, aucune molécule de synthèse, aucun fongicide ni insecticide. Et depuis 2023, aucun engrais, juste du son grès, donc de l'engrais par le son, par la même méthode euh, que le, du prix Nobel Louis de Breuil. À chaque masse correspond une fréquence et on fait une musique avec l'azote et on a le résultat de l'azote, sans les effets secondaires. Alors, ce qui nous amène aux cultures les plus euh, compliquées, parce que la vigne, c'est une culture qui est très compliquée, dans le sens où c'est peut-être le végétal qui est le plus massacré. La vigne, c'est un, une plante grimpante. Ça, on l'a beaucoup oublié. Euh, et je pense que le, les résultats dans les vignes seront d'autant plus intéressants que si on considère tout à nouveau, on repartir de zéro. Aujourd'hui, on a les vignes que l'on a. Elles, certaines sont en bio, en biodynamie, c'est parfait, très bien. Mais globalement, on, on, on s'est très, très éloigné de la dynamique biologique de la plante. Et si on... Alors, euh, réunir des efforts techniques pour euh, euh, enlever les phyto des, des vignes, c'est parfait. Mais je pense que la grande réussite euh, sera quand on aura cultivé différemment, y compris dans l'itinéraire technique. Et j'ai un bon exemple pour ça. Alors nous, aujourd'hui, dans les vignes, c'est assez récent. On a commencé à, euh, il y a deux ans dans Tursan. Et euh, par manque de moyens financiers, parce que nous, on supporte tout financièrement, finalement, mais voilà, donc ça, c'est limite. Donc, euh, on n'a pas eu les résultats escomptés. On a, un, depuis l'an dernier, un essai dans les vignes de Margot, euh, sur un tout petit protocole, euh, j'irais presque trop petit, où on n'a pas euh, les essais comptés, dans, il, y a, il y a deux ans. Euh, et puis, euh, Marc Augustin euh, voulait absolument un biodynamiseur. Il dit, bah, moi, pro... je suis en biodynamie depuis 2012. Euh, j'ai arrêté toute la chimie, ça va déjà beaucoup mieux, mais j'ai toujours des problèmes qui sont ceci, ceci, ceci. Et il m'a dit, j'aimerais bien faire un protocole avec le BBG, donc le biodiviseur botanique de Gojac. 
Donc, on lui a livré un appareil, des consignes, on lui dit, bah, attention, survigne, nous, on a aujourd'hui pas de résultats concluants à 100%, c'est encore à recherche. Il me dit, bah, je veux bien faire partie de la recherche. Qu'est-ce qui vous manque dans vos recherches actuelles Et en faisant euh, la recherche passée, on s'est aperçu quand même qu'on avait un problème d'eau, et dans cette eau, on n'avait pas fait pour les vignes encore, il fallait structurer l'eau avant de l'informer comme on fait, et ça c'est très important. Donc on a complété la technique du BBG avec deux autres techniques, qui sont la génodique, donc des sons euh, donc, euh, dans les vignes euh, sur euh, la stimulation de la photosynthèse, par exemple, euh, par des protéines, des, ce qu'on appelle les protéodies, par le son. Euh, une structuration d'eau à, à la source, parce que son eau était quand même très mauvaise, ce qu'il ne savait pas finalement, son eau, euh, enfin, on peut la catégoriser en, avec les ppm par exemple, euh, une eau de source c'est entre 7 et 25 ppm, une eau de osmosée c'est entre 7 et 25 ppm, et puis euh, on trouve euh, à Margot par exemple une eau de rivière c'est 600 ppm, donc ça veut dire qu'il y a une pollution chimique énorme, et donc l'eau perd sa catégorie euh, de pouvoir porter une information, et donc c'est très important. Donc il a mis un filtre euh, qui vient de chez LM Innovation, plus la génodique, plus le BBG. Mais il cultive aussi en bidinamie et avec un... Par exemple, il ne va pas tailler les vignes comme, comme les autres, il ne va pas épamper comme les autres. Donc il y a quand même toute une autre technique. Et, ça, et pour moi, il a le, tout à fait, il est dans, dans le vrai, dans l'approche la, la, de la culture future des vignes. Alors, il a fait un petit protocole sur 2000 mètres carrés près de chez lui pour voir. Bon, il a bien compris qu'on n'avait pas de résultats concluants par ailleurs, mais en apportant les solutions qu'on lui préconisait. Il a fait ses 2000 mètres carrés pour voir comment la plante réagissait. Et là, le 8 juin 2023, il a eu une grêle. Une grêle suffisamment importante, parce que quand on a de la grêle sur la vigne, évidemment, il y a des blessures assez graves et le rendement peut chuter entre 20 et 100%, comme on a vu le cas dans différents endroits cette année et l'an dernier. Et il a vu que son petit protocole, où il passait la technique nouvelle pour lui avec les éléments que j'évoquais, eh il a vu que les plantes ont réitéré directement des feuilles nouvelles, euh, les bois euh, donc sont cicatrisés, cicatrisés, et donc il a généralisé tout de suite, il m'a dit, écoute là, euh, je protocole, là, vu la, le, le dégât par, le, par le, la grêle, je vais généraliser sur l'ensemble de mes surfaces, donc 13 hectares, et euh, de toute façon, je ne récolterai pas grand-chose, donc je ne risque rien d'essayer autre chose. Voilà. Donc c'est ce qu'il a fait, et c'est très intéressant, parce qu'il nous a fait son petit retour, donc c'est un producteur hein, depuis longtemps, et il dit, petit retour de la saison, achat du biodiviseur en début d'année, donc 2023, deux passages de carbone cuivre, le 15 juin, orage de grêle sur une, euh, une parcelle que je garde pour le vin rouge, nous savons qu'après un épisode de grêle, il y a des difficultés pour la maturité, aussitôt nous élaborons un passage de cuivre carbone afin de préserver au mieux la restructuration foliaire, puis... Sous vos conseils, nous mettons en place du carbone bord pour restructurer les fibres fragmentées afin de rétablir un peu d'ordre dans la circulation de la sève brute et élaborée. Toute la saison, nous observons une nette coloration du feuillage par rapport à nos voisins touchés également par l'orage, une pousse active et lors de la récolte, une perte de poids minime, 8% seulement, mais surtout un degré alcoolique élevé, ce qui nous a permis de ré réaliser notre programme rosé complètement. Pour ce qui est du reste des parcelles, qui ont reçu carbone cuivre souffrent. Il faudra observer plus finement lors de la campagne d'avenir, c'est 2024. Mais pour moi, il y a une véritable osmose végétale avec l'application de l'information minérale. Ses voisins ont perdu 60% des récoltes. Voilà. Donc lui, il n'a perdu que 8 par rapport à la moyenne. Donc voilà nos, 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 nos survignes, ce que l'on peut tirer. Alors, comment marche l'appareil ici J'ai le temps de dire un peu là. Alors, euh, Ici, cet appareil qui euh, paraît un peu archaïque comme ça, mais en fait, il part sur un principe bignon violet qui a été euh, fait entre 1948 et 1956. Donc, Bignan a pu définir que lorsqu'on fait passer un courant très faible dans un métal pur, l'information de ce métal va rester dans l'eau. Donc, on met ici une, euh, une électrode de carbone, 99,98% pure. Idem pour le cuivre. Quand on cultive, les premiers champignons sont très importants. Donc, on va mettre l'information de cuivre. Et là, il euh, faut bien comprendre qu'il n'y a pas de matière. Il n'y a que de l'information. Et on sait aujourd'hui qu'il y a des restrictions de cuivre euh, dans les cultures, parce que ça, le cuivre peut être une source de pollution également. Et bien là, on va mettre de l'information sans la matière, et la plante va réagir. C'est-à-dire les champignons vont réagir, dans le sens que s'il y a une information de cuivre, les champignons ne vont pas se développer. 
ils vont être là, ils ne vont pas mourir. Ça, c'est très important. On ne tue rien avec cette, ce procédé-là. C'est très important que tous les insectes et champignons puissent vivre, mais d'une manière équilibrée. Ce qu'on peut dire aussi dans nos travaux, c'est que quand on dit qu'une plante, plus elle a une activité très importante, mieux elle est, c'est la plante qui va décider insectes, champignons euh, et tout son environnement. Quand on voit euh, un, un arbre appelé un oiseau, euh, pour, euh, quand on voit un oiseau se poser sur un arbre pour manger une, une chenille, par exemple, il faut bien comprendre que c'est une interaction volontaire de l'arbre pour, sur les oiseaux pour venir débarrasser des insectes ou des, 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 des chenilles, par exemple. Donc ça, c'est le principe de base, mais il a été amélioré, bien entendu, puisqu'en plus, on va avoir une diélectrique qui est qu'on va prendre sur, euh, par la prise de terre eh bien, euh, certaines ondes du cosmos grâce à un concentrateur à cire d'abeille qui se trouve à l'intérieur. Et puis, on va rajouter une lumière, une LED ici, qui va diffuser une lumière, qui va pouvoir diffuser dans l'eau différentes informations, et notamment des informations qu'on appelle, nous, botaniques. Ça veut dire une musique de fougère, par exemple. Et avec euh, cette musique de fougère, eh bien, on voit que les, les applications, euh, ça va fonctionner très, très bien. On va avoir des végétaux qui vont non pas être boostés, mais retrouver leur plein potentiel. Ça, c'est très important. Nos cultures sont tellement abîmées qu'on a l'impression que lorsqu'elles font 20 ou 30 de plus, eh bien, ça va booster la, la culture. En fait, elles reviennent seulement, ces cultures-là reviennent dans un état normal. Quand on regarde, et je vous invite à le faire, de voir euh, toutes les premières statistiques euh, qui, qui, qui commencent à partir de 1830 jusqu'à 1890, les statistiques de récolte, parce que les premières chambres d'agriculture, c'était ça, c'était voir combien de carottes on avait à l'hectare, combien de pommes on avait à l'hectare. Quand vous regardez les statistiques du 19e, vous vous dites, mais si on avait ça aujourd'hui, mais ça serait génial. Et c'est ça qui est important. Aujourd'hui, quelqu'un qui fait des carottes industrielles, c'est très rare quand il dépasse 50 tonnes à l'hectare. Euh, au 1850, 100 tonnes à l'hectare pour les carottes, c'est normal. Vous voyez Donc, en fait, notre, notre affaire ici ne va pas booster la plante telle qu'on l'entend. Elle va redonner son plein potentiel. Donc, on retrouve nos 100 tonnes de carottes à l'hectare, par exemple. On a une, alors on a un, tous les mois de novembre, on a un symposium euh, organisé à la maison où justement euh, euh, on fait venir donc les scientifiques qui travaillent avec nous. Donc ils sont euh, huit, mais là, qui viennent au symposium, ils sont trois. Et puis euh, on a tous les témoignages des gens qui utilisent la méthode. Donc il y a beaucoup de témoignages parce que vous avez compris que nous, euh, notre manière de mesurer l'information, parce qu'on n'a aucun appareil officiel pour mesurer une information, on met de l'information dans l'eau. Bon, d'accord, comment on la mesure ben, Nous, on va la mesurer, parce que si on applique la méthode, on a euh, euh, 200 tonnes de tomates à l'hectare. Si on enlève ça, on retombe à 50 tonnes. Alors, et on remet l'information, on retrouve notre potentiel d'avant. Donc, on, euh, no, notre mesure, c'est la couleur, le goût. On a des, un, un documentaire qui a été fait euh, il y a deux ans, euh, du côté de Nantes, sur un maraîcher qui était en biodynamie et qui a pu démontrer qu'en employant la méthode, on a plus de quantité, plus de goût, plus de couleurs, ce qui, pour les gens qui font de la vente directe, c'est très, très important, bien sûr. Et dans, dans certains cas, on n'a pas forcément plus de volume, mais on a un goût bien meilleur. Ça dépend des végétaux. Voilà. Et euh, donc, voilà ce que je voulais partager avec vous. Mais là, je peux rebrancher la plante si je, parce que là, elle veut bien. Alors, comme ça, on va pouvoir euh, éventuellement euh, faire ce qu'on n'a pas fait au début. Donc, euh, hop donc toujours notre logiciel de musicien. On voit en haut à droite les notes qui défilent. Donc plus... Alors en fait, comme c'est l'activité électrique qui est transcodée en son, c'est-à-dire qu'en théorie, on pourrait mettre n'importe quel type de son sur l'activité électrique. Ce qui n'est pas le cas, la plante s'entendant elle-même, elle pourra très bien effectivement euh, s'arrêter si ça ne correspond pas à, à, à ce qu'elle souhaite. Et on peut, par les sons, euh, on peut augmenter ou diminuer son activité électrique grâce à cela. Alors je vais faire comme ça. Sinon, voilà. euh, et qu'est-ce que je voulais faire de plus Ah oui, je voulais faire ça pour qu'on puisse voir. Là, j'enregistre pour montrer. Voilà. Donc là, on a une plante. Voilà, ça y est, elle a démarré. Donc si je monte le son de ce que on a là ici. En plus, si on comprend pas tout. C'est très joli. Alors, je laisse défiler un peu. Alors, je répète ce que j'ai dit tout à l'heure. En dessous de 1000 Hz, ça correspond à la partie racinaire de la plante. Et au-dessus de 1000, à la partie aérienne.
Donc, tout à l'heure, la plante n'a pas démarré parce qu'on était arrivé pas si longtemps à l'avance. Il faut quand même plus de temps. Vous voyez, il, faut, il fallait une demi-heure de plus pour que la plante puisse dé, définir. Alors, ce qui est intéressant, c'est quand on a un graphique et sur ce graphique, on peut définir effectivement euh, ce qui, euh, les interactions passées. Bon, par exemple... Et vous voyez, j'ai fait changer le schéma. Donc tout ce que l'on peut avoir dans une, une pièce va pouvoir interagir avec la plante. Et quand on va dans un champ, on a pu le démontrer sur un champ de kiwi à sort de l'abbaye, euh, on branche euh, un pied de kiwi et on observe ce qui se passe. Et la personne passe avec son... Parce que la problématique, c'est que c'est quelqu'un qui était en conventionnel et qui est passé en bio. Et il avait 25% de rendement en moins et il voulait savoir pourquoi. Donc nous sommes allés et on a branché le pan de kiwi. Et euh, donc, lui, avec son tracteur, il venait. Et au fur et à mesure qu'il venait avec son tracteur, nous, l'activité de la plante branchée diminuait. Et en plus, pour éviter le désherbant sur la ligne, il avait donc un désherbeur mécanique sur brosse. Et il y a un palpeur qui touche le tronc pour que la brosse se rétracte pour ne pas toucher le pied. Eh bien, imaginez qu'à chaque fois que la plante reçoit ce palpeur qui est apparemment très doux pour nous, eh bien, la plante arrête complètement son activité électrique. Ça ne lui va absolument pas. Et elle peut rester bloquée pendant 2, 3, 4, 5 heures. Au mois d'avril, il fait ça toutes les semaines. Et donc, 5 heures toutes les semaines, eh bien, vous avez 20% de rendement en moins après. Ouais. Et aujourd'hui, on voit des matériels, euh, notamment en viticulture, où on voit c'est la brosse carrément qui pousse le pied. On a le pied qui tremble. C'est juste un, un drame pour la plante. Comment voulez-vous qu'elle n'ait pas de mildiou après Et pour nous, les techniques modernes aujourd'hui, je prends un exemple qui est un peu simpli, simple, simplet, mais si vous prenez l'avion à Biarritz pour aller à Nice, vous arrivez, vous êtes content, c'est dans les temps, c'est parfait. Bon, bah, si vous faites des techniques qui ne correspondent pas à rien de végétal, vous avez du mildiou et vous n'êtes pas content. Bah, vous avez tout fait pour l'avoir. C'est un peu comme ça. Donc on a des possibilités, on a vraiment un, une, 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 une trame de, de travail là qui est très, très importante, parce qu'il faut déjà pouvoir entendre que les végétaux puissent faire des sons, par l'activité électrique, par les ultrasons, par différents moyens que l'on peut employer là. Je n'ai pas le temps de le faire là, mais c'est très, très intéressant. Et on voit que la plante peut interagir avec son environnement et que c'est un moyen pour nous, l'activité électrique et son analyse et les applications. Et aujourd'hui, on a des applications. Hein, parce on peut se passer d'insecticides, on peut se passer de fongicides, on peut se passer d'engrais. On peut tout mettre par information, par la nouvelle technique que nous sommes venus vous présenter. Après, je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions, pas de questions. Une question là. L'eau qu'on emploie pour le. Oui. Alors, déjà, il faut effectivement choisir une eau qui ne soit pas polluée pour informer, sinon ça ne marche pas. Euh, si on prend de l'eau du robinet, c'est 375 ppm, c'est pas possible. Donc vous prenez soit une, une eau de source, une eau de pluie, donc beaucoup de gens euh, chez qui on intervient, euh, euh, eh bien, récoltent, s'ils ont, ont des hangars, bah, ils récoltent l'eau des hangars, ça fait suffisamment d'eau pour l'année. Donc en fait, mais votre question est très intéressante, parce que l'information se multiplie, ça ne se dilue pas. Donc nous, à chaque fois, on va préparer 2 litres d'eau. Mais ces 2 litres d'eau-là, si je les mets dans un pulvérisateur de 10 litres à dos, par exemple, ça arrive dans les petites productions, si on les met dans un pulvérisateur de, de tracteur de 400, mètres, de 400 litres, ben, en fait, les 400 litres seront informés la même année que 2 litres. Mais si je mets dans un bassin d'irrigation qui fait 15 000 mètres cubes, et je mets mon eau dans les 15 000, les 15 000 mètres cubes seront informés de la même manière. Et donc, vous pouvez, avec 2 litres d'eau, traiter 2000 hectares sans problème. Alors, alors, non, tout à fait. Là, en fait, il va, il va, au lieu de traiter avec un produit chimique comme ils font d'habitude, ils vont traiter avec de l'eau informée. Voilà. Donc, la première année, on, on fait des passages plus fréquents pour voir comment, euh, par rapport au climat, par rapport au cépage, comment ça marche. Mais globalement, on commence, et surtout si la plante a été en chimie avant, eh bien, il faudra quelque part euh, désinhiber cette problématique-là. Donc, on va passer toutes les semaines, c'est un peu contraignant la première année. Mais la deuxième année, on l'a exemple, nous, sur des poiriers. Euh, première année, on a passé euh, donc, euh, toutes les semaines. Deuxième année, tous les mois. Troisième année, tous les trimestres. Et, et ça fait maintenant 4 ans qu'on n'a plus rien mis dessus. Vous voyez Donc en fait, c'est un peu chronique au début, mais après, on peut très bien... Et 
pour les cultures qui passent dans l'irrigation, c'est le cas de Pépinière Scrive, où il a changé son irrigation qui avait connu des molécules de synthèse par les désoatrons et tous ces méthodes-là. Et bien aujourd'hui, il, euh, il a un bassin, il met son bocal toutes les semaines dedans et l'irrigation suffit, donc il n'a plus aucun traitement à faire tout en augmentant sa production. Il avait, comme nous sommes intervenus, il vendait globalement 50% de sa production. Alors ça, je voudrais le dire aussi, on rencontre beaucoup de personnes. D'ailleurs, si on vient nous voir, souvent, c'est que les gens sont financièrement très, dans une manière très compliquée. Euh, et, euh, et donc, bah, quitte à essayer quelque chose, bah, ils ont tout essayé, donc ils viennent chez nous, bah, bon, bah, bah, ça leur paraît un peu bizarre, mais euh, avant d'arrêter, au moins essayer tout, y compris ce qui paraît bizarre. Et... Euh, dans, dans la, la Gestremia, euh, il vendait à peu près 50% de sa production, maintenant il y a 97%. Euh, sur euh, les euh, Dominique Dayat, ses chrysanthèmes, c'est 100% de sa production, 100% vendu. Alors dans toute culture, il y a toujours un petit reliquat, quelque chose. Là, il arrive à avoir 100%, ce qu'il n'avait jamais vu en 40 ans de carrière. Bon, Jean, c'est impressionnant. Hein J'avoue que, en tant que même euh, informaticien, je m'imagine même des applications IA avec. Euh, je pensais à quelque chose qui s'appelle la mémoire de l'eau, qui à un moment avait fait beaucoup parler. Oui. Et là, avec toutes les datas collectées, les musiques associées à un tel type de, de plante, on pourrait imaginer un travail après, lorsqu'on a toutes ces datas, et pouvoir à partir de la musique, j'écoute la musique et je peux savoir exactement comment elle se situe par rapport à une bonne croissance, etc. Tout à fait. Alors on fait déjà, nous, euh, sur des pommiers, par exemple, on fait alors, le graphique que vous avez à l'écran ici. Mmh. On a un graphique, quand une plante se porte bien, un tel genre, un pommier, par exemple, qui se porte bien, aura globalement tel équilibre au niveau de l'équaliseur. Mmh. Donc on fait une photo de l'équaliseur au moment opportun, et quelqu'un qui n'a pas l'appareil, euh, bah, s'il branche ses propres sons par rapport à ce qu'il voit au niveau de l'équaliseur type, on peut savoir si la plante a une déformation par rapport aux racines, par rapport... Euh, et après, et après, c'est la porte ouverte à la traduction, à la parole. Tout à fait. Demain, on peut dire, pourquoi pas, j'ai soif, il faut que tu penses à moi, j'ai faim, il y a le déjeuner qui arrive, c'est ça Alors, euh, par rapport à l'eau, toutes les cultures qui euh, suivent ça demandent 50% d'irrigation en moins. Alors ça, ce n'était pas prévu au départ, ça c'est très factuel pour nous, c'est le résultat très concret, parce que vous avez compris, nous, c'est que la recherche appliquée. Et ça, c'est tout à fait intéressant. Et euh, Pépinière Scrive, eux, c'est 70% d'irrigation en moins. Donc, aujourd'hui, ça pourrait compter. Juste pour le plaisir de te faire un peu de pub, mais aujourd'hui, un appareillage comp complet comme ça, pour, euh, si quelqu'un arrive et dit, bon, j'ai une production dans mon coin, je veux utiliser ton système, oui. est-ce qu'il peut arriver et puis monter en, en, à l'échelle pour euh, traiter son vrai Qu'est-ce qu'il lui faut pour, pour bah, En fait, euh, quelqu'un qui cultive, il ne lui faut que l'appareil. pour euh, Donc, il va remplacer ses pulvérisations par de l'eau informée grâce à cet appareil-là. Donc, cet appareil-là, nous, le coût aujourd'hui, c'est 3 900 euros hors taxe, en sachant que ça remplace tout ce qui est insecticides, fongicides et même les engrais. Donc, euh, la, le retour sur investissement peut être très rapide suivant les structures. Et avec ça, comme tu l'as dit, mais je n'ai pas fini la fin de ta requête, avec 2 litres d'eau, tu peux traiter... Euh, 15 000 mètres euh, cubes euh, ou plus donc, en fait, il faut bien comprendre que l'information se multiplie. La matière, on le sait, ça se dilue. Hein. Si on met un kilo dilué dans 15 000 m3, on n'a plus grand-chose. Euh, euh, pour ça, on peut prendre euh, monnaie. Si j'ai 10 euros que je partage, euh, là, euh, on est peut-être une vingtaine, ben, on n'aura pas grand-chose chacun. Mais là, aujourd'hui, je vous ai donné une information, vous l'avez et moi, j'ai toujours. Ça s'est bien multiplié. Donc, l'information, c'est très important, ça se multiplie, ça ne se dilue pas. Donc, effectivement, les deux litres peuvent servir à traiter des très grandes surfaces de culture. Je peux t'assurer, là-dedans, puisqu'on dépose un dossier euh, agriculture numérique à l'ANR pour le 15 mai, j'aurais un plaisir à avoir un work package hein, avec nos amis vignerons, soit de Champagne, j'ai vu que là, déjà, ils sont convaincus, mais pourquoi pas du côté du Bordelais, puisqu'ils vont travailler avec nous, ou de la Loire, euh, faire une expérimentation avec toi. Tu vois, ça, oui. bah, la, la vigne, c'est là où il euh, euh, y a le plus de problèmes. Euh, c'est là où on a aussi, nous, le moins de... Parce qu'on a commencé par le maraîchage et l'horticulture, parce que c'est notre métier de base, en fait. Hein. Le... Aujourd'hui, on peut dire tout ce qui est floriculture, sylviculture, euh, voilà, ça, ça marche très, très bien. Euh, euh, la viticulture, c'est en cours, mais on voit qu'on a un résultat très concluant en associant d'autres techniques complémentaires. Ça, le, le... On va dire que la, 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 la biodiversité botanique telle qu'elle est présentée là, seule pour les vignes, euh, ça a ses limites. Par contre, quand on euh, la mélange avec deux autres techniques, notamment euh, celle de la génodique et celle de l'eau structurée, eh bien là, on a vraiment le résultat escompté. Merci à vous. Merci. Ah, une question. Ah. Alors, vous faites plantarium.eco. Oui, à Gojac. Gojac, c'est à une heure et demie d'ici. Un tout petit village. 
Et c'est grâce à ça qu'on a une salle de sport qui est très importante. Et grâce à cette salle importante, on peut faire le symposium où on a 600 places assises. <rire> Alors là, on est en travaux. Donc euh, vous faites plantarium.eco, vous avez les dates d'ouverture qui s'affichent sur le calendrier. Euh, là, pour tout 2024, il faudra voir le calendrier euh, pour, avant de se déplacer à Merci. cause des travaux. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. Euh, donc euh, là, on va, je vous invite tous à aller au buffet. Euh, on sera de retour à 14h avec le docteur Tran Van Lick de l'Institut d'Anan au Vietnam qui présentera l'aura en tant que norme de communication dans les champs. So for all English speakers in, uh, on YouTube uh, watching us right now, we will be back at 2 p.m. with Dr. Tran Van Lick from Danang Institute in Vietnam uh, who will present l'aura as a communication standard in the field. So stay tuned, we will be back in one hour. Um, and yeah. Bon appétit. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Lis. I'm from uh, Vietnam. Uh, yeah, this is the different time zone now. I'm. Uh, it's the uh, 8 p.m. o'clock now in Vietnam. So today I will uh, represent for Da Nang International Institute, Institute of Technology to present our research. It's related to our culture. <coughs> We uh, applied the LoRa, uh, the LoRa technique to uh, water quality monitoring strategy for sustainable aquaculture in Vietnam. So first, I uh, <clears throat> I will in uh, in uh, to you a little bit about uh, the aquaculture in uh, Vietnam. Uh, the the aquaculture production in Vietnam has reached over 5.4 million ton. Uh, and uh, the importation of uh, our artist products estimates this uh, can be around uh, 9.2 billion of USD. And the total uh, our culture area in uh, 2023 is projected uh, to be uh, about 1.3 million hectares for island our culture and uh, 9.5 million to be smarter for sea cap farming. So, <clears throat> so uh, what is the big problem that the fish farmer were facing now? And uh, what's the problem the farmer only worry about? Uh, that is the, the massive fish death. Yeah, they, uh, they only worry about us. So not only uh, uh, in the, the fish, Famine, but also snail famine. So, uh, following uh, some statistics, each farmer lost more than uh, 100 million Vietnam dollars in uh, 2023 because of snail death. And you can see this is snail farming in the Ho Tien, Ho Van, in uh, Da Nang, Vietnam. And uh, following now the statistics, uh, <clears throat> you can see. Uh, uh, more than 10 billion Vietnam dong, and uh, the farmer who lost an overturn of fish deaths. Church, uh, the the this is started church in uh, the fish farming village in the year 2023. You can see this is the, the very big problem in the, for the farmer in in Vietnam and. <clears throat> And if the if the, the fish death occur, the, the farmer will will carry a bit death on your back uh, on their back, and and that's the reason why all every farmer always worry about the the, the massive fish death. And what is the reason? So the farmers don't know exactly the reason. So, uh, so we, uh, that's we, we, uh, we uh, propose the, the, the system to monitor the, the quarter, water quality. And this also the strategy uh, for our the sustainable our culture in, in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, you can see it, uh, this is our system design. We, uh, we use, uh, some sensor like uh, PS 
uh, temperature, resolve, motion sensor, or turbidity sensor to monitor the quality of water. This is the, the, the basis uh, parameter of uh, to ev evaluate the, 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 the water. And we, we transfer this data with you to transfer this data with you LoRa one te technique. This is the, the, the long range and low power wireless network. And then you can see uh, the data sent sent to LoRa Wayway, and then we can collect this data for analyzing and um, display it on web interface or mo mobile app to uh, uh, to alert the, the, the abnormal data to farmer, and uh, the farmer will have the uh, the, <clears throat> the reasonable solution for for uh, uh, when they see the data. A square LoRa, you can see uh, this uh, image is the comparison of LoRa Wi-Fi and cellular. And why we choose this uh, LoRa? Uh, uh, this image uh, is the comparison of uh, LoRa Wi-Fi and cellular in terms of RAN and bandwidth. And you can see that LoRa is good, is very good as RAN. Yeah, they can uh, cover uh, 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 maybe uh, 50 kilometers. Yeah. And uh, this is very suitable for uh, our recursion application. But you can see that uh, uh, the LoRa um, uh, will be low at the bandwidth, but we we uh, we don't worry about that because uh, our um, because the, the the data from sensor uh, don't need the very uh, high bandwidth like uh, uh, like like email or uh, <clears throat> or camera or something like that. So just the the, the, the sensor data and. And that's the reason why we, we choose LoRa technology in, in our application. And this is the new case of our uh, LoRa way, way deployment. Uh, we deployment we, we deploy the gateway on the top of a uh, uh, roof building. And you can see the, the gateway is, uh, is not really big. The size of gateway is, uh, it can, uh, can be like your double hand. It's not so big and easy to deploy. And we also test the LoRa coverage. You can see in the image, uh, the distance that we take, the long, longest distance that we take is about uh, uh, five kilometers. It's, uh, it's five kilometers far from the gateway. And we also decide the, the, the sense knot. You can see in the image that the sense knot can plot can uh, be plotting on the water, and we we put uh, a separate sensor like PS to be T, dissolve oxygen temperature sensor. And we also use the, the solar panel to power uh, for uh, for this the this sensor not. And uh, this sensor not uh, can be very easy to. Uh, uh, to push it anywhere in on the uh, in the water, so to to monitor, and the, this the, uh, we 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 now uh, already deploy this uh, prototype, and we we also deploy it in uh, in real real experiment. We deploy it uh, in, on the two position of uh, of fish farming to monitor. The, the cut quality, and you can see we uh, we had a web interface to monitor and analyze this data. Uh, depend on the, the kind of fish, we will have uh, the uh, biological characteristics. For example, in, in this this kind of fish, the the turbidities of water is good from uh, uh, twenty five to eighty. The uh, dissolved oxygen of water is uh, uh, from uh, uh, two to five ppm is good. PS the uh, five to seven is good for this uh, fish. The temperature of water from uh, thirteen to twenty 
Celsius degree is good. And, and beyond this one, we will have uh, some uh, analyzing and analyzing data uh, to let the farmer or, <clears throat> or, or um, the manager of, of this village uh, to alert to the farmer to, to have some uh, solution to show the problem. And uh, I will show you some uh, demo demonstration that I will share the, the, the real data that we uh, already collected uh, for a long time. Like this is the, the data for the last uh, seven days. You can see <clears throat> this is the, the result for oxygen. Yeah, the data that yeah, we can uh, we can see the data look like very parrotly. Yeah, is it chain uh, like parrotly like like that? And this is the PS and uh, temperature to be T. Okay. Come back to the slide. Yeah, and following that, uh, and uh, following this project, uh, 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 the farmer will be uh, will less will be less when they are. Uh, unusual chain of uh, of uh, observation data. So the, the this is good for uh, the farmer uh, to uh, have some uh, action. Like uh, for example, the the when the ocean uh, the silver ocean uh, were low, uh, the farmer will will run the permian oxygen uh, to the water. Or if the PS is uh, not good, they can uh, have some uh, a solution to add the adding the the calcium oxygen to regulate the PS, and this that static data uh, is very useful to know the natural chain, the natural chain rule with the water quality indicator. So, uh, in uh, the net plan, we 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 uh, we uh, not only uh, two knots, two cents not we will uh, find the funding. From the government, from the company, to 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 build more to sense not, and we can have the best uh, best data for analyzing, and I I think it's yeah, be very good for farmer in the future. Okay, time for your listening. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there is a question here from Ari Kamburis. Uh, Tran, Tran, what kind of um, an installation uh, are these basins? These are man-made basins that were constructed to raise the fish, so they they don't have any connection with uh, natural water. And uh, the second thing is, um, <clears throat> sorry, the second question is, the all of the lore equipment that you um, you assembled is it off the shelf or was it custom made? Okay, so sorry, I, I cannot uh, hear so much about your question. Can you? Uh, the first you question, again? yeah. The first yeah. question is the 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 fish farms. Are they man-made basins? Are they nets in existing bodies of water, or uh, mm -hmm. do they con they connect with the ocean around? And the second question is. The LoRa equipment that you used, is it uh, stuff that you bought uh, off the shelf or is it something that you had uh, specifically made? Okay, uh, the first question is, uh, we uh, deployed uh, this uh, sensor knot in, uh, in the, the two prison. The first prison uh, is uh, uh, on the, the river and the second prison we, uh, we uh, we deploy it on the, the, the maybe like uh, uh, 
uh, some uh, some blade, something like that. It's not connect to the ocean. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And and the second question. Um, sorry, I I don't understand uh, so much about your question. Can you? Uh, the second question is about the equipment, the, the LoRa equipment. Uh, equipment, okay. Did you buy it uh, ready-made on the internet, or was it something that you had manufactured for the project? Ah, okay. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, uh, in this uh, sense not we we uh, actually we buy the, the sensor from uh, China, the sensor for water monitor, uh, and the chip. Uh, we uh, we the the we use the, the MCU chip STM32, and uh, we also use the um, um, uh, the LoRa the chip LoRa for communication from uh, Santes in uh, US. And this for us we decide the PCB, this PCB, and uh, we uh, we programming the the, the the microcontroller to. Uh, to connect with uh, the the sensor, and then we uh, we say it to the, the 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 network. Okay. So actually, our design uh, we we design the the PCB first. Uh, we design the the PCB uh, to connect uh, to this uh, electric electronics component on the 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 PCB, and we program the the micro controller to uh, collect the data from uh, this sensor and send and uh, and send it to the, uh, the the gateway yeah thank you thank you very much doctor good afternoon to everybody uh, so my name is Yan Chema. Um i'm here to uh, explain to you a little bit about um, what uh, hyperspectral imagery can do to um, enhance the capacity to monitor uh, agriculture. So we are in a, a, a company called Sofia Engineering. We are in the south of France. And uh, within uh, and two years from now, we are going to send the first satellite out of uh, several of them in, in orbit. And those satellites will be having hyperspectral characteristics. So I'm going to go into detail to what it is. Um, so hyperspectral imagery um, is different from multispectral or superspectral in the sense that it has a continuous signal for everything on Earth. That continuous signal permits you to have an uh, enormous amount of uh, spectral resolution to identify signatures. Signatures, as you can see here, uh, upper soil, in the middle water, and in bottom uh, vegetation. Of course, these are just typical signatures, and they change a lot. And in the same way as a human can sign and have its own signature, they are unique to the processes that are seen from the sky. Now. Um, if you look into more detail what it could be, um, it could show very easily the soil type and also the soil health. In another way, it, the water stress and also the water quality. And, uh, and that will be of most interest to us here in agriculture is the crop disease and also the um, enhanced precision in crop yield. So what is essentially a hyperspectral in itself? It's kind of a revolution uh, for agriculture because we are able to go from a, what is a typical multispectral signal, which is very broken, as you can see on the left side, to something that is completely continuous, uh, as you can see in the central part. And um, this example here of, uh, of profiles our profiles that are dedicated to uh, different uh, crystal components or uh, material components. So most of us have already found in the list kaolinite and muscovite, uh, which are a type of argillic um, uh, constructions. Uh, hematite is a ferric, uh, gutite also, 
These are ferric uh, components, and calcite is a calcium-based component. Alunite is an aluminum one. Anyway, so uh, these um, spectral conditions, these signatures, permit us to essentially go from an approximate information to a very detailed information on what you are observing, observing. Sorry, and in a way, we speak about a quantum leap. And we speak about material signature. So what is the actual molecular um, uh, com composition of the material uh, through what we call absorption of molecular interactions. And this leads us to define or uh, resolve patterns of composition of what is inside um, this, um, this, these pixels, these images. As you can see on the lower right, and we will go into it in more detail in the next slide, you can affect colors to types of compositions. So, and see, this is in more detail. Um, so we have a map here um, somewhere uh, in Namibia. And uh, you can see that once we process this information through the identification of the molecular assumptions, we can define very clearly classification on the composition of the soil. So this in itself is a, is a strong advancement um, because most, I mean, most of us that work with uh, crop models, for example, are always in trouble where, uh, um, and generally we use von Genuchen uh, approximations um, and Muhalem, Mang von Gerichen and Muhalem approximations for all that is texture based infiltration and um, hysteresis. So, in this case here, this can be resolved uh, with a higher resolution um, uh, from anywhere in the world, basically. Um, another topic that we are looking at, and uh, I know about it because I am from, the, uh, from Bretagne, and a couple of years ago, with uh, the winter uh, uh, rain, was so high that uh, we lost many tractors into the fields and we had to bring caterpillars to bring them out of the field so much that the um, the water conditions within the field were, were too high and uh, even tractors would get stuck into it. So for this, uh, there is also a way that we can approach the problem with hyperspectral. And that uh, approach is described here uh, in, in quite a simple three maps plus further information. Um, in this case, uh, so the BSI is a bare soil index, so it shows you essentially where uh, the soil is. So you do that on a regular basis, and then you know where the fields are. Uh, on the other side here, uh, you can extract the roads. So you know essentially the access roads, um, which could also be a trouble uh, in some places. And uh, of course, you know, uh, with the water index, uh, you can know if there is water on the field or on the access road uh, leading to the field. So you could uh, imagine very easily to do um, an assessment of the field access for machinery. And in that case, especially if you are in uh, argillaceous soils, uh, deformation of the argillaceous uh, soil and um, direct reduction of the carrying capacity of the machinery will be a problem. So you could create very easily an early warning um, hotspotting that you could display a region wide and say that you know these areas will get into trouble very soon um, if there is more rain coming up in the next week. And that at that point, you can advise farmers to not go into the fields, for example. So this is, this is a very practical uh, way to see that. Uh, of course, this is just an example. Hyperspectral is actually very famous. Uh, this is an uh, aerial photo uh, to extract species. So if you do a, a full land use, uh, land cover mapping of an area with hyperspectral, you can go down to, uh, uh, for example, here, uh, I, platanus is a platan in French, salix is sol, uh, pardon, um, oui, sol. Um, populus is um, peuplier. So, et cetera, we um, have a resolution that is not very much accessible with multispectral at this point. Um, 
in another way, and this is an interesting part, and a lot of uh, articles are, are starting to come up with that, is that uh, you can have a direct assessment of the uh, grams of chlorophyll inside the leaf per square meter. So in the same way as we do LAI, like leaf area index, you can have a, a direct content of chlorophyll. Okay. So of course, this, I mean, we speak about orbital, but in the same way uh, as uh, our friends from uh, AgroDrone were saying, uh, you could have something uh, developed to put on their drones and, uh, and simply uh, do the same computation at a much higher resolution to do precision farming. Um, and finally, uh, another one that is also of interest. Um, so this is a, an image from a, um, a satellite um, above Indonesia several years ago, where there was a, um, a, a fire on a, on a farm. And, um, and that fire actually can be um, very clearly seen with many satellites. But the thing is that it's not compulsory very clear is where the limited amount of um, of particle in suspension uh, can also be detected, and that is what on you see on on the on the right side uh, in yellow color, uh, what I have called the uh, fog here. Uh, that one is not very clear in uh, in multispectral image, but can be defined and uh, clearly seen in uh, hyperspectral um, classification. So that's uh, that. These are uh, practical applications uh, I have been able to put up uh, very soon like that. Now, um, and I want to complete with that, um, even though the pages say nine on 17, it's, it's wrong, we just finished here. Um, the, so we are launching our first satellite in 2026, so the January, February, uh, depending on, the, on how this, uh, this comes up. And um, we are actually very excited to, to put um, quite a high resolution uh, imagery available to everybody. Um, especially in the agricultural sector where I come from, uh, where we know that there is a, 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 lot of, a lot of possibilities, especially for disease detection, and early disease detection in, uh, in cultures. Um, at this point, we are spending a lot of time in um, uh, articles and uh, being able to see what are the possibilities to provide, uh, to make shortcuts and to, to make... Um, the possibilities of these applications um, um, accessible to, to people who are not in, in the scientific field uh, per se, but more in the application field. Um, it's going to be a long, a long road, um, but within two years, we hope that uh, we will be able to, um, to bring something quite interesting in the agricultural sector. I hope you will join forces with us at, at some point, and, uh, and I really look forward to, uh, to collaborate with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon uh, to every uh, everybody. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor Sergio Miranda and uh, Estia, for its uh, invitation. Um, I'm uh, Stéphane Durand, so I'm project manager at uh, Rove Agri, which is an association um, dealing about uh, agriculture uh, robotics. And um, the the main topics I will address are will be um, a short presentation um, of the the association and the um, the autonomous machines from our uh, members. Uh, then uh, talking about the challenges uh, from uh, including uh, agroecology uh, uh, needs uh, the needs of uh, farmers also safety and cost uh, effective tech on the when you build a machine which are uh, important uh, i'll show you again uh, more in detail some uh, um, different autonomous machines and then uh, i'll talk about a program that uh, robagri leads which is um, a great the great challenge for agricultural robotics uh, which is funded by the the state So uh, we did join in, in 2017 uh, to accelerate the sector and um, uh, also to, uh, in fact, to represent uh, the sector among the, um, among the um, 
mainly in France. And what is key is that we represent uh, farmers, a uh, group of, of farmers, as well as um, the machinery sector, and also the uh, uh, robotics in um, the startups in uh, robotics and research uh, sector. So we have a, a transversal uh, approach. Um, at the beginning uh, of the association, uh, the Kuhn um, uh, company, uh, which is specialized in, uh, in tools in, uh, in machines for agriculture, uh, you've got one, which is the, the red one uh, over there, um, had the presidency uh, and did put a great effort for the association. And now our president is uh, Christophe Aubé from uh, Agriculture. Uh, which is a company also in the um, positioning sector and the robotics uh, sector. Um, so what is important uh, for us is to address a different, um, a different subject through uh, working groups, in fact. So you, I talked to, to you about the first um, mission, which is representing the sector. But on the left, we've also got uh, technology uh, transfer, uh, norms for safety, uh, which are very important, and testing robots' um, performances, uh, with also open sources um, uh, uh, approaches. And uh, what is also key is ensuring that the farmers' needs um, and give, giving them the, uh, the, the opportunity to to express uh, it and uh, addressing uh, agroecology and climate change uh, subject and, and detecting new uh, farming systems. So you can see our uh, members uh, solution. What you can see is that it's, uh, there is a great variety of uh, autonomous machines. Uh, it can range from the asparagus uh, harvest uh, at, I'm showing, uh, going to the, the cattle, uh, cattle uh, uh, breeding and feeding, in fact, uh, as well as uh, many machines in the uh, wine uh, sector, uh, which is the, the, the most uh, advanced, uh, but also uh, machines for ir irrigation, uh, in fact, uh, for potatoes. So um, there is a great variety, and this will um, uh, keep on uh, growing. Um, if you watch our, our, at our uh, members, uh, there are, for example, from the machinery sector, as I said, ACO, which is a tractor uh, company, uh, Kuhn, uh, uh, Manitou, uh, Pelanc, and also the startups, you know, uh, such as uh, Nayo's, uh, Nayo, uh, BT Bot, Citia, uh, uh, and many others. Uh, we've also got some su suppliers uh, from the electronic uh, sector, uh, mainly, uh, as well as, uh, for example, Enedis, which is um, uh, playing a role in the uh, energy uh, supply, and the idea being to, to provide the electricity in the field to the, to, to the robots. Uh, then a research um, uh, part, which is the third uh, college, and I want to mention, to mention in 2017, our association was founded by uh, INRAE, uh, 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 before that, and the IRSTEA was the name of the institute, and also by AXEMA, which is a French syndicate uh, for um, machinery. And then you can see and recognize some uh, institutes uh, also in the uh, uh, agricultural uh, part uh, in the wine sector or in, in the um, uh, fruits and vegetables ones. And, and last, this is um, the, the smallest college, but that's the one we want to develop. Um, it includes the, the groups and cooperatives, for example, of farmers. We've got uh, Ciresia, which is a cooperative in the near Reims, in the east of France, with 5,000 uh, farmers, as well as uh, in the Ch Champagne uh, area, uh, le CIVC, the Comité Champagne, and uh, for the southwest, also fruits and vegetables, uh, Blue Whale, which is not that far from, 
euh, Bidar. Euh... A brief sum up of our uh, actions, uh, in fact. Um, we, in 2020, we made some proposals to the French states, and some of them were picked up and put into action. So that was a, we had a 20 million call for, for tender for, um, for farmers, for them to test uh, robots as well as digital uh, equipment. Um, so this was the first result. We also talked a lot about norms and safety. Uh, in link with Axema. And um, our main project started uh, last year is uh, uh, the great challenge for agroecology um, uh, that I will talk about uh, later. later. Uh, so the first um, slide is about um, agroecology and uh, safety and cost effective tech. Um, we made a survey uh, with, uh, with farmers and um, what we see usually uh, is that the, um, the, the wedding, the removing of, of uh, bad weeds um, is nearly every time uh, the most uh, important uh, subject. And this is very understandable because you, uh, you've got a growing pressure uh, with this kind of weeds because you've got less Uh, chemical products uh, being able to fight, and you've got less chemical products, you know, being allowed uh, on the on the market for um, uh, environmental reasons. And then the second one is the crop protection, um, also for the same reason. And then you can find it depends for the orchard or the um, les, les vergers en fait. Uh, Uh, la récolte, uh, the harvest is uh, important, and uh, you know, in grain crops is also uh, the second top priority. And this is uh, well explainable because in grain crops, uh, it's been a long time since precision agriculture uh, has been uh, used with satellites, uh, drones, uh, as well as uh, yield maps. Uh, it's been uh, Um, a couple of decades uh, since it's been used, so this can be this is understandable. So, what the farmer uh, has to deal with, in fact, uh, when you talk with uh, farmers, um, they many of them tell you that they lack time. In fact, um, for the same reason uh, that uh, you know the in the milking uh, sector. Uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, uh, you know, grandparents uh, were um, stopped doing a, a part of the job when it was uh, time to, to, to do the, the, uh, the milking for the, for, the, for the cows. So um, in, this, in this sector, uh, that's where we had the first uh, autonomous uh, robots uh, for, for milking. And now it comes the same for um, for labor. And what you can notice is that the share of um, uh, uh, employee, uh, which is not issued from the family, uh, is growing uh, in France. This, this proves uh, there is a lack of, of of labor. So they want more labor. They want. Um, they want more time and there is no labor. Um, you also got a continuous downtrend for uh, organic mat material in, in the soil, less chemical input, and much more price and climate variability. And one of the answer uh, is the agroecology, uh, which is basically putting the agronomics at the center of the uh, preoccupation and ch changing the way, uh, in fact, the, the, the farmer um, uh, grows. But it means, it means more time because, for example, um, in grain crops, you need to have a, a permanent uh, cover uh, on, your, uh, on your land in order to, to limit the, um, the, the loss of uh, nutrients. But this means to, uh, the, the semi, uh, to, to sow uh, many crops uh, much more than, uh, than before, maybe three or four or on a two years uh, period instead of uh, two or 12 
more or less. So it means more time, uh, more time to uh, watch your, to go in the field and to uh, scoot and monitor the, uh, the bad weeds. Uh, and so, um, whereas uh, there is uh, the farmer has got less time. So this is, uh, scooting is an opportunity, um, a help for, uh, for the farmer, as it was told uh, during the, uh, uh, all these sessions. So one of the benefits of the uh, sensors um, and ecosystem, which includes the uh, sensor that embedded in the, in the autonomous mach machines, uh, is real time or earlier scooting uh, application. I was very impressed by the precedent um, uh, presentation about hyperspectral uh, satellites from the space, uh, which opens um, many uh, solutions. Um, uh, um, um, I, I don't know if you, yes, if you can get me. Okay. Um, so um, if we talk about, um, uh, this, this was about, this was for, for scooting. Um, another benefit, now we're gonna talk about the direct benefits um, from uh, autonomous uh, machines. Um, we can we can make um, uh, on the top right on uh, the shell you know um, a segmentation. You if you have an autonomous machine, you can test you can test take uh, a task and uh, make it better. This is the in blue the advanced task optimization, and this is what happens in the um, two cases in the wine yard and potato. Uh, the first one, you see this machine is um, the, on the tracks ma machine from Exact Robotics, uh, which um, uh, uses uh, confined uh, spraying. Uh, VT bot also the same, so that they uh, recover the um, uh, the product which isn't which hasn't uh, targeted the uh, the leaf, and so you've got saving in chemicals uh, of about. Uh, uh 60 percent so this is a, a great technique that you apply to um uh to the to wine in potato that's be the same you you put less uh water that's pre precision uh, irrigation and then you save also chemicals because um uh, you don't have uh developments of uh, diseases or uh, mildew and um, for the crop uh, then when you get to grain crops and one yard you get to technique techniques that uh, leads you to uh, a system uh, optimization uh, such as uh, um, semi as sowing uh, uh, crop relay cropping uh, different crops between two uh, major crops or, or spreading a trip Co uh, grammar in the um, in the in the core, or also um, you know, putting a ferro uh, as a we saw it uh, with drones. So this changes the system. Um, same as for control natural grass. If you can if you can uh, control your grass in, in your wine, uh, in your one year, that's uh, better. Um, and then the last one uh, in uh, Oxford is uh, dans les vergers. Is uh, it was about uh, 15 uh, or 20 years ago. The system was changed. You know, it's like a fruit wall uh, because it was uh, much too difficult for for an autonomous machine to um, uh, to advance and to um, and um, because there were uh, it was it was. Um, no, it was uh, it was en fait pour avancer par les branches en fait. uh, so it was um, so the system would change in, in fact and uh, then when you lead to this that's a total reconstruction of the system in order to be adapted to the machine um, um, I so on this slide um, uh, yeah, uh, safety and cost-effective technology are prerequisite for robotics um, because the, um, uh, it has a cost. 
in fact, and the um, the, the machinery and um, uh, industrial or, or startup uh, has a has a machine uh, that has to respect has to provide a, a safe machine, so has to make a risk analysis and um, uh, himself and um, it's his liability. liability. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, for the moment, sometimes some machine can be uh, not affordable for certain types of farmer. Uh, this is in part, this is uh, linked in part uh, um, to this and also because of the uh, starting emerging market. At the moment, you've got more or less um, a bit more than 1,000 machines uh, in the field, except, except for the milking machines. And uh, we expect in, uh, in eight years uh, to be uh, uh, more than 10 times the, this, so between 10 and 10,000 and machines, which would mean about 5% uh, or 10% of the farms uh, equipped with uh, an autonomous uh, machines. So I'm going to show you different options uh, for autonomous uh, machines. Um, I was talking about fixed uh, machine machines in the 80s. Then we went to the uh, to the greenhouses and we, where uh, the automatization was uh, very important. And um, we had the first uh, uh, mobile machine in France from uh, NAIO. And then uh, starting from 2015, the advanced uh, moving machine that, that we see in the fields. Um, you can uh, imagine uh, um, robotics in two ways, at least. Uh, uh, you can uh, imagine a man and machine cooperation. Um, this is very interesting because it refocuses the farmer's attention on the task, as you can see uh, with rice transpla transplanting. Uh, the person doesn't have to drive the uh, the uh, the machine, uh, also for the cabbage uh, harvesting, and um, there is another, um, in fact, uh, way to see it. Uh, for example, um, in in wine, for the um, for the pruning, in uh, fact, uh, la taille, and uh, which can be done, uh, the first step can be done by the machine uh, as it is uh, for the moment, but uh, not by an autonomous machine. And, um, and then uh, the, um, the more difficult part of the task is done by the man. And so this is a way you can get uh, cheapest uh, machine, um, uh, if you just do one part of the um, uh, of the work and let the um, the demand finish the the other part, um, this is a focus on uh, one yard uh, with the different types of um, machines, uh, mostly uh, French because French sector is uh, very. Uh, advanced and the, the leading one uh, uh, when you talk about uh, machines um, uh, which are uh, which a uh, um, former uh, can buy uh, in fact and um, you start seeing uh, you know machines uh, which can work uh, also together and this is the um, uh, one of the the coming uh, points uh, when we talk about uh, autonomous machines uh, in field crops, uh, you've got many prototypes, but uh, less, much less uh, commercial uh, robots. And we can focus on the French sector uh, once again, uh, which is um, very advanced. Uh, you've got some machines from uh, Nayo, Citia, Carré, also Kuhn, uh, which are um, either on the prototype or on the market. Then you can see also small size um, robots, meaning there are many ways to, um, and many machines um, that can uh, be, um, uh, take, can suit to uh, 
uh, any kind of farmer. Um, uh, this is the last part of the presentation, uh, which is a great challenge for agriculture uh, robotics. Uh, this was funded by the, uh, by the French states, states and the association. Uh, Robagri is, um, is uh, leading it. So the idea is to deploy new, new uh, robotized agroecological way of growing and uh, new machines for farmers. And when I, when I mean new robotized, uh, I also include the um, uh, data driven, the digital aspect. And uh, the idea is to uh, get to the market uh, competitive solution uh, for the sector. And um, it started uh, last year uh, and it's a five, five years uh, period and it's still open. It's open widely to, to all the sectors. So uh, please join us if you want to uh, contribute. The reason uh, why this was developed are the the same that we talked about and the climate change and the lack of labor and increasing population and environmental uh, aspects. Um, the, what is important is that the, the farmer is at the center of the, of the uh, project because he will, um, uh, he will tell uh, and the different uh, groups of producers will tell what is important for us uh, uh, out of five years, for example, um, um, uh, period. And um, the four steps we we will uh, often we will develop are uh, implementing new practices, so that will be test on the field of existing machine but also um, uh, we will develop new machines according of the, uh, of the, of the needs of farmers and the maturity of technology and the, evol the involvement, involvement uh, of the, the machinery uh, sector. Don't, and also uh, the idea is to make some, some key technology to mature especially in the safety uh, sector, safety and detection uh, sector. Um, uh, and we've also got a lot of action um, about um, telling and giving um, um, uh, key, uh, key numbers and, uh, and, and figures and uh, reference en fait, for, les, uh, for, the, uh, for the farmers. And then you've got the detailed um, uh, graph for the 14 actions, which are guided by two uh, uh, principles, uh, the farmer's needs and also mutualization. Then if you look at the, the top left, the so new uh, agroecological uh, ways of uh, growing, uh, as I detailed uh, before, but also uh, at the at the right, uh, uh, develop uh, new tools, uh, shared tools. So it means, uh, uh, for example, um, shared uh, database and our imaging, um, uh, image database uh, for, uh, to detect uh, bad weeds and uh, also um, uh, algorithm um, database to uh, uh, for vision or detection or any kind of uh, uh, activity which is uh, priority. And um, this is a project in which um, the, the actors are very much welcome and as well as the uh, farmers uh, and groups of farmers, which is a, uh, a sector we want to, um, to have, we want to have a better coverage of the, this uh, representation of this sector. So uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. So yeah, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us and uh, giving this opportunity to uh, present and um, discuss uh, different uh, opportunities and uh, projects uh, we um, 
work on and uh, this is definitely appreciated okay Constantin uh, my name is Constantin I will start so I'm senior delivery manager with hip pump systems we've been there like uh, 12 years and also uh, all of us as all of us we are part of IoT community in the company uh, so and we would go let you to present what we are going to present today and let me pass this to Maxim yep Hi hey everyone, my name is Maxim, so I'm a lead electromechanical engineer and I'm responsible of the hardware as well here at EPAM Madria Lab where we build awesome uh, and sometimes even incredible prototypes, uh, alpha devices and preparing devices for mass production later. Um, so the focus of Madria Lab is to assist our huge software department to deliver um, cutting the edge and up-and-coming devices that will you often can see uh, on the shelf of the store or uh, somewhere uses in their daily life. Nice to meet you all. Uh, hello, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is uh, Vasily, Vasily Slapik. I'm within the pump for uh, like 14 years already and uh, I'm a chief software engineer at the pump, and my primary specialization is devices former, device drivers, low-level programming, uh, basically inflating uh, life in hardware with help of software and firmware. This is uh, what I'm doing. Thank you, uh, my colleagues, for um, making this introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Vladislav Bajowski. Um, I'm Senior Director of Engineering. And as I mentioned, thank you so much for that opportunity. And uh, uh, we say hi from uh, sunny, sunny California. And uh, today, definitely, we would like to join uh, the audience and the colleagues who already uh, presented uh, different uh, topics and shared uh, different experiences from technology point of view, product point of view. Um, and uh, talk about how we uh, can make uh, agriculture, how we make agriculture smarter. Uh, we already did uh, this introduction, but just uh, to highlight yeah, on the colleagues, we have also Konstantin Barabanov, Senior Delivery Manager, Maxim Zvik, uh, Lead Electrical Mechanical Engineer, and Vasily Slapik, our Chief Software Engineer. Uh, so technically, on the video on the screen, uh, you see uh, the promotion materials about uh, Made Real Lab. So we work in the pump systems, and the pump systems is a global uh, IT service uh, provider and uh, technical consultant uh, company. We have uh, offices in uh, various locations. Uh, so we understand that the IoT. Um, is definitely a huge area and very important area which affects a variety of industries, right? And uh, we try to bring awareness uh, to uh, IoT through different uh, options, different uh, ways. Uh, we do have like garage approach where people mostly focus on pure hardware prototyping. Uh, we do uh, various communities where we try to involve people in a simple, without any commitments way, try to gamify the way they learn and uh, get more information from different sources. And we do have uh, our, let's say, global practice we call Made Real Lab. And uh, Made Real Lab is focused on end-to-end uh, -end prototyping of different products. And um, some projects uh, we share today uh, were designed <clears throat> and uh, fully kind of like completed, uh, assembled in Made Real Lab. Uh, so technically, to imagine like the capacity and uh, uh, possibilities of Made Real Lab, we do have multiple locations like Boston uh, in the United States, Poland, Hungary, and uh, usually they have huge facilities, like huge um, uh, space to build uh, products because uh, it's not always about some tiny uh, devices. Sometimes it's about real attempt to make uh, 
a full full copy of of the product on, on a bigger scale. Um, the thing is that through the different approaches, uh, like as I mentioned, garage communities and the made real app, uh, we definitely want to focus as well on areas which bring additional value uh, to people, to the society. And if we move to the next slide, Uh, I would like to give a couple examples of uh, projects uh, we uh, were either working on or consider them as uh, prototypes or proof of concepts. Um, so the first one is about uh, the complete uh, solution. And when I say complete, it's about involving <clears throat> a multiple uh, multiple. Uh, areas uh, where we could use our expertise and knowledge uh, to build a solution. So it was a complete uh, solution about involving multiple sensors, uh, drones for monitoring, uh, and uh, the application itself, which was a complete dashboard uh, to monitor and to manage uh, to manage the data, which was collected and aggregated from uh, multiple sources. So uh, the data which we got was um, different uh, statistics uh, related to, to soil, uh, to weather forecast. Uh, so technically when drone was used to monitor the crops, the fields, uh, because of collected images, pictures, and uh, the AI uh, machine learning analysis, uh, we could better identify uh, areas where we experience uh, issues with um, uh, crops for some reasons and uh, to identify uh, the issue the issue on early stage. So technically it could be related to uh, some pests, maybe uh, wrong uh, conditions of soil, maybe incorrect usage of um, uh, different like uh, stuff and chemicals, uh, whatever. So uh, the best description of this project was early detection of potential issues and problems. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide, it's uh, more about software approach. Um, the thing is uh, we do have in United States and in Europe, uh, there are different uh, public uh, publicly available sources of um, agriculture-related uh, data. Uh, the issue is that uh, in most cases, these uh, sources, they use uh, different for formats. So it could be well-known, easy to use, easy to transform, JSON, XML, like, but at the same time, it could be some kind of like proprietary binary formats. And uh, definitely if you would like to aggregate them all to like uh, extract, transform, uh, collect this data, you face with a very, very potential and uh, actually real issue. Mm, uh, you need kind of like to have uh, multiple solutions to process all this data. Uh, so the idea was to build a solution which uh, follows uh, FAIR principles and uh, gather all uh, possible uh, data sources uh, to aggregate this agriculture data. Uh, the idea was to use it later for um, data models uh, training. Uh, because if, if you're familiar, and today <laughs> most of uh, people who are involved in technology sector, they uh, familiar with uh, definitely machine learning, you know that um, data model is fine. I mean, like development of data model is challenge uh, at some point, but training data model is even bigger challenge uh, because you need to collect this data, to label this data properly. So that solution was actually uh, used to uh, create the, the way of uh, aggregation of this data. And uh, eventually, as I mentioned, based on uh, FAIR principles, uh, it was possible 
to use these multiple data sources uh, and to fully automate uh, the pipeline. So technically, uh, with different approaches such as uh, web crawlers, uh, all this data was gathered uh, on the schedule. Uh, then it was uh, passed through transformation uh, pipelines, and eventually, eventually you get uh, JSON uh, linked data uh, information in a JSON linked data format, <clears throat> which is easy to to use, to read, and to actually uh, share with any 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 other uh, solutions, uh, products, APIs, whatever. So uh, that's just a brief overview. Uh, as I mentioned, we go into uh, mention more products. And uh, now I would like to uh, pass the microphone to our uh, lead electromechanical engineer, Maxim Zwick. Maxim, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. And once again, um, hi, everyone. So. Just to continue on our discussion, uh, we're all aware that nowadays agriculture requires smart and digital solutions. And um, one of the steps to make it efficient is uh, generally to automate monitoring process. Um, get data about soil, air, and plants parameters in real time, and this will allow you to make the predictions. Um, just imagine, for example, reforestation or um, crops monitoring. Um, that could be hard to reach locations or area without or with lack of internet coverage. Uh, we should minimize our manual labor or field work and we should try to minimize it as well. So we challenged ourselves how to solve these puzzles, how to transmit data without internet coverage how to make solutions self-sustainable with uh, energy harvesting. So we brought together a um, skilled team of electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, IoT experts, uh, and prototyped and later tested that solution. I see that's on the background, something happened with the video. Um, yeah, can we move slightly maybe in the middle of it? Yeah, something, something like that. So we brought the whole team of different experts to and decided to prototype that solutions. So a soil moisture and the air temperature sensors with the processing unit uh, as the low pi four as an IoT platform, and we're using long range LoRa uh, radio protocol to send data without internet connection to a remote gateway that's connected to the internet and delivers data further to the cloud. Uh, device has energy harvesting accumulate solar power, and that allows us to be self-sustainable. We assume that the future is of agriculture is digital, and we already are prototyping that with EPAM Madrid Lab. Can I ask you, Kostya, to move to the next slide? So let's slightly talk about the overall solution overview. So generally, um, this is a compact field device uh, made up with soil and air sensors, CPU board, solar panel, battery, and this whole device just gathers data. After gathering the data, this data is processed locally and prepared for transmission. LoRa or long range radio modem uh, transmits this data to the gateway. And this gateway can be located uh, up to 12 kilometers away. So uh, next accumulated data from several devices, of course, we are assuming that we're using a cloud of different nodes or devices uh, that are sending the data exactly on the same gateway. And after that is sent it to the cloud and we're using Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. Uh, after that, through the GSM network, this uh, gateway sends data for um, further analysis and post-processing. Pretty simple, straightforward, and at the same time, reliable solution. Can I ask you to move to the next slide? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, what's about the hardware that we used? And as I am the um, hardware engineer, I'm mostly interested personally in the hardware, what we are using to build that. Of course, um, it's the sensor module uh, to, to monitor moisture and temperature of the soil itself and several environmental condition sensors, also temperature, um, uh, humidity. 
recharging battery with solar panel. That allows us to make the device all sustainable. Uh, low Pi 4 unit uh, that consists of S3C phase P32 as uh, the main controlling unit and um, Semtech long range low power uh, transceiver that acts like um, that actually a long range modem, LoRa modem. Uh, so uh, long range uh, wireless network parameters, um, including gathering and transmitting data, um, and we set up this frequency not less than once in every five minutes, and we easily can adjust it. Uh, we're utilizing adaptive uh, data rate, uh, but generally operating at 868 megahertz band. Uh, and overall, this device um, belongs to class A with an active data receive functionality. So we're just transmitting the data. Um, whole infrastructure is powered by the Chirpstark open software. Um, and this software allows us to utilize radio frequency management, sensor management, uh, LoRa gateways management, and uh, moreover, facilitates uh, transfer of whole data to the Azure Service Hub. And I think that's it about the LoRa project that we've uh, made with our teammates and giving word to, to the next presenter. Thank you very much. So uh, the liner of our story is Smart Greenhouse Project. It was uh, born uh, not from the executive direct directives of top management. It was like kind of genuine concern for global issues and internal initiative. And uh, we were thinking about world hunger and sustainability challenges uh, like facing modern agriculture. So, and team behind it was driven by shared vision to address these concerns using ESG framework. So in its core, it's uh, like this project is a kind of creative mix of uh, environmental stewardship, social responsibility, and robust uh, governance. Our goal was simple, uh, but quite ambitious. Uh, we wanted to create a cost-effective and community-driven innovative greenhouse to improve influence on the agricultural sector. And we were thinking holistically. It was not just about using technology to improve gains and yields. It was about creating a safer, more reliable and sustainable environment to uh, farm environment that could address some of the most pressing issues faced by those who are employed uh, in the sector. And uh, so by focusing on workers' well-being and health of the environment itself, we aim to contribute positively to the communities it would serve. Uh, and uh, our project uh, quickly evolved beyond its initial concept, and we decided to contribute to larger community. And as we were gaining momentum, uh, this project got attention for its low-cost solutions. And those solutions uh, promised to minimize the common errors found in uh, non-automated greenhouse-like uh, over um, now, automated greenhouses like overwatering or inadequate uh, temperature controls and such. So our greenhouse has a set of features like light and watering control, as you see on your screen, temperature, humidity, monitoring, uh, automatic management, um, automatic photography of uh, plant growth, protection against uh, electricity outages and short circuits. And uh, for sure, we have smart monitoring via internet, via web. So most of these features uh, are very cheap and easy to implement. And also because of that, uh, smart greenhouse represents a leap towards uh, precision of uh, agriculture. So uh, technology was just the beginning. Over the course of the design and uh, implementation, the team learned a lot and we collected a huge set of best practices. Uh, this would allow us uh, to continue uh, continually improving and uh, ad um, help us to adopt the system. And by doing so, we think we just uh, set the stage for more sophisticated, and even more intelligent uh, solutions. And these solutions may attract the attention of uh, governments, uh, large corporations, and uh, what we hope the most enthusiasts 
to foster a new wave of innovation in the agricultural sector. Next slide, please. Sometimes um, engineers do things because they can. Sometimes uh, we do things just for fun. I won't deny it was a fun project. And uh, as engineers, we also know how technology transforms the environment and global ecosystem. Something acceptable 20, 30, like probably 50 years ago is no longer acceptable now. Mm, so, okay, our greenhouse is smart. Does it bring any better for environment? Yes, we think uh, it does. First of all, IoT enabled greenhouses can precisely control water, nutrients, and energy use. And that leads to significant conservation of these resources and reducing waste. Second, we uh, monitor real time conditions like temperature, humidity, soil pH, so that we can create ideal environment for plant growth and improve yields and plant health. We also can detect pests and diseases early with computer vision and other technologies, and that minimizes the overall use of pesticides and herbicides and other chemicals. And overall, this leads to less con contamination. And also, like environmental conditions are often changing, and sometimes to extreme levels. And IoT greenhouses can automatically protect plants from extreme weather conditions and reduce risk of uh, crop failure. And also we collect data through analysis uh, and like analysis refine, uh, helps us uh, allow us to refine uh, uh, agricultural practices continually. And that leads to sustainable cultivation methods that can be shared and replicated in other farming systems. Basically. And uh, I'm talking not about only data we collect from sensors, it might be also that most effective hardware and software configurations tied to specific needs might be also collected and distributed uh, amongst uh, enthusiasts. So that's overall description. And before passing a virtual token stick to brilliant engineer who contributed to the project uh, heavily and hands-on, we want to thank Java. <laughs> it's very popular in software development and IoT, and it also helped us to uh, get Oracle Award for the Smart Greenhouse project. So thank Java again. And uh, now it's time for deeper details about the greenhouse. Please welcome Vasily Slapik to the stage. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, so. Uh... Being part of the engineering team, I wanted to provide a bit more details about the, the architecture and the components uh, I've used. But first of all, uh, uh, what about greenhouse? So greenhouse is a about, greenhouse is about growing plants. And uh, here at the pump, we like to play with technologies and we wanted to see how, uh, with help of technologies, we can make the greenhouse smarter. Uh, smarter means uh, using more precise monitoring, more precise actuations, uh, altering the uh, environment inside uh, greenhouse to make the process of growing is more effective. More effective means spending more, uh, spending, uh, spending less uh, water and nutrients and uh, uh, giving more yield. So. Uh, um, First of all, we, we need we needed uh, to uh, build some isolated environment for experiments. And uh, as you saw on the video on the previous slide, we just made a box from uh, acrylic glass. So we, we, we could uh, start growing some something inside that box and put our sensor thing inside the box and uh, we Put, we can we could put the rest uh, uh, outside. So uh, the the most important sensor we uh, we had uh, was uh, temperature and um, humidity sensor. And alter uh, uh, humidity uh, we used automatic uh, uh, 
uh, watering uh, mechanism. Uh, we also um, had lamp, to, so we were able to switch on and off uh, the lamp uh, according to some schedule. We had uh, some air management uh, system, basically fan to move uh, the air. Um, and uh, of course, um, we, we have some central uh, computing board where all the sensors were connected. Uh, we could run uh, our software and uh, uh, this uh, computer was connected to Wi-Fi, so we had remote access. Um, last thing is power, manage power management for all these components. Um, here we have some challenges because of water and uh, voltage, they don't mix uh, well. Mm, and, uh, we we used uh, so we, we used approach like it was prototype uh, style, but for real greenhouse, of course, uh, something more sophisticated would be needed. <clears throat> As uh, Constantine mentioned, uh, we wanted to try to spend uh, not much of money on this project. So we li literally built everything from existing components, from very cheap DUI components. And we uh, wanted to reuse as much as we can uh, for hardware and for software as well. So uh, can you please uh, go to the next slide? So the uh, list of sensors and uh, components um, probably is well well known, well recognized by DUI enthusiasts. So we use Raspberry Pi for a single board computer. We used uh, dig digital temperature and humidity sensors from Arduino uh, DUI, like DHT11. We used uh, existing relay modules. We reused uh, water pump from uh, old car and uh, Basically everything we, we bought, we, we, nothing we, we built from scratch. We just bought uh, all this stuff and uh, connected. Can you please go to the next slide? So yeah, here are the pictures of uh, some components we used. Like uh, we used water pump, for instance, from, uh, from some old car like this on the screen. You can spend just $10 and you, you get your water in management uh, system. Uh, the power supply, you, all, you also don't need to build it uh, from scratch. You can buy it. Uh, humidity temperature sensor, soil moisture sensor, all from DI, DI sets. And we did uh, have a circuit breaker, breaker just in case. Uh, but that's probably was the only thin uh, for protection as i mentioned it's not mature approach but we built kind of prototype not the final solution so it was enough for us for most of the time can you please go to the next slide uh, as for um, central computing unit we used raspberry pi it's very uh, uh, known um, single board computer used by uh, DUI in enthusiasts uh, or the world. Uh, it's very cheap uh, and the, it is a size of credit card, so it's really small. And uh, it has immense uh, computing power. It is sufficient to, to perform way more sophisticated things that, uh, than serving the greenhouse. So we had a uh, lot of room here for running any software we want, and um, you you never hit the limit of computational resources on Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's also very configurable. You can uh, connect any uh, sensors, any peripheral devices uh, easily, and again, you, you need some configurations, but you don't need to write much of software for uh, interacting with external components. Last uh, but not least that this is open source uh, driven. Uh, the uh, operating system uh, drivers, uh, some system services 
means everything is uh, ready for uh, uh, be reused and uh, also you can improve them and share with a community back so it was also a big selling point for us to switch uh, to, to use uh, raspberry pi can you please go to the next slide again as constantine mentioned the uh, the software which served the greenhouse was uh, implemented in java and uh, oracle uh, recognized that uh, we were winner, winners of IoT challenge. Uh, but uh, some people may ask whether it was easy to integrate Java uh, and and force it to work with some sensors, kind of low uh, stuff, low uh, low programming stuff. Yeah, on Linux it was easy because uh, Linux is a typical Unix operating system. So all the sensors, uh, all the peripheral devices uh, represented as files, and uh, Java doesn't have any issues with reading uh, sensors well as uh, through the files, through the uh, file system abstraction. So that was not uh, a challenge. Um, however, we, we do have some issue with uh, one of the one of sensors, and uh, we did have. Um, we did have to implement some uh, wrappers, so-called GNI wrappers, Java native, native interface uh, wrappers, to in integrate the the driver uh, software into the Java. But that was, uh, I'd say, minor effect and uh, effort. And Java on Linux for green smart house um, for uh, it. it it worked well, so not much uh, to quote. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? So uh, in the end, we we built the uh, final prototype. We uh, managed to grow uh, beams. We managed to uh, kind of uh, see how uh, how beams react to different schedules of um watering uh how you need to switch on and off the lamp to grow them more effectively effectively and we uh we saw that indeed it's uh it can be rather cheap solution and a uh, lot of things can be uh reused so you don't need to build something very sophisticated you don't need to build custom hardware and uh, write a lot of uh, software. There are a lot of different components you can reuse and you can spend uh, very little money to uh, implement a smart green cars and uh, achieve many uh, environmental goals and also share your result with broader communities so other people may uh, find the right profile to grow something different, not beans. It was very interesting, uh, challenging project. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's all I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vasily. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's it from us. Uh, yeah, if you do have uh, any questions, uh, definitely we're welcome to address if we can. <laughs> and thank you again for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we have a question here. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation, which is uh, very uh, interesting. Um, you emphasize the greenhouse aspect. Do you have uh, any other external application where you use this kind of uh, approach, integrating sensors in a local network using, as you said, LoRa, using a Raspberry Pi in order to control everything? Um, do you have a digital form somewhere, uh, an external one? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, if I got it correctly, you, you asked about like if we do have an example of uh, integration of all these examples of different technologies into one uh, real like farm, small yes. farm or small greenhouse? Yes. 
Okay, so today I would say no, because the thing is, we, we usually work, um, we, we do our work in two directions. One is when we do invest on our own, when we consider some technology, some idea could be promising or could be helpful in terms of, um, as we mentioned, like CSR uh, involvement. The other is when we do have a project request from our customers. So technically on on the, let's say, prototype level, on the overall uh, idea level, yes, we do have uh, such uh, solutions in mind where could we could combine all these uh, technologies and um, uh, products we were working on. But you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the main idea of all these projects we shared. And in general, uh, Madrial Lab we have uh, is to have all the available components. And in case we have an opportunity or demand to build something like a, as a complete real smart farm, we do have uh, all these components ready. So we just could uh, assemble them as, as a Lego. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, sorry, uh, and then uh, there will be other question uh, near to me. But um, que question concerning the storage of data. Um, it seems in a certain point that you use the cloud from uh, Microsoft, Azure Microsoft. And um, do you have any strategy concerning creation of um, kind of data lake uh, with the data coming from captors, from uh, uh, different... Um, um, device and trying to analyze using um, AI tool, uh, for instance, to de to detect diseases, diseases um, or anomalies in the um, in the crop. So, do you use, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence tools for that, or what kind of approach do you have in the present or in the future concerning this kind of image analysis uh, you you you're taking? So first question concerning the storage itself. What kind of um, DBMS are you using? Do you use a um, NoSQL database or for instance to, to store the data in the cloud? Or, um, and then what kind of um, AI tool are you using uh, for image analysis? Okay, uh, got it. Uh, so um, Maxim, do, do you have information about Laura uh, in terms of um, cloud and uh, data data management for, for Laura? Of course, I have lots of this information. So I would like to highlight that I'm mostly a hardware guy. I'm the guy who builds the hardware. So I can send all of this data about a, a bit later. I mean, with stating uh, how we're using this cloud, to, I mean, Microsoft Azure, IoT Cloud, uh, on all other information, we will just send you a bit later, okay? Thank you, sure. Uh, yeah, regarding like overall, what we usually try to do, so when we consider like for Laura, Microsoft Azure, right? Uh, usually we still try to be, let's say cloud agnostic, uh, because the thing that, I, I, again, this is definitely related to projects which we consider our own investment. Uh, because if we have a customer's request, definitely it's it's up to the customer, <laughs> which which cloud, which infrastructure, which technology to use. But if we speak about our own uh, investment uh, into solutioning some ideas, uh, we try to be, as I mentioned, cloud agnostic, which means Yes, we may use, for instance, like Microsoft Azure for for this Laura project, uh, or like AWS for the project related to uh, the first to the first slide when uh, we consider solution to get the data from drones as a monitoring system to analyze it through AI solutions, uh, machine learning. Uh, but at the same time, we want to have the flexibility if, for instance, tomorrow due to any restrictions, constraints, or I don't know, requirements from anybody, uh, we could move it to any other cloud. So that's that's why we don't have uh, cloud preferences when we consider our own projects. Uh, in terms of uh, what AI tools were used, uh, yeah, I, I need to double check because um, 
in general, all this project, as I mentioned, Hipam is big, big company uh, distributed globally. And uh, in many, many uh, solutions we do, we involve not just like one team uh, somewhere in one location. Uh, we use different uh, teams based on the expertise and availability as well. So uh, regarding exact machine learning AI tools, which were used for uh, crop disease uh, identification, yeah, I could double check a bit later. Uh, Ilad Zhao, one last uh, question. The, <clears throat> the one last two questions, in fact. <laughs> the um, the soil uh, temperature probe that you showed in proto is that a prototype or is that something you're commercializing? Um, I, I I I didn't hear well uh, the part before, um, uh, like commercializing. So uh, the, which the, one? you had one slide where you had a, a sensor system for soil and temperature, humidity, uh, humidity and temperature, and a uh, little, uh, so is that an existent or is that just a prototype? I, I got it. Uh, <clears throat> I would say it's more uh, prototype-like because um, I think I missed it. Uh, I didn't mention it, uh, but um, the idea was it was initially, initially, it was part of the contest. So okay. uh, we uh, were, participating as as a company who supports uh, this contest to uh, design uh, a product solution which is about both uh, components actually three components hardware software and uh, let's say usability of this solution so make it easy to to use by people who do not have a master's degree in computer science uh, so I mean, it was a working solution, but in terms of uh, the, the the future, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, it, it has like as as a commercial product. Okay, and the same with the greenhouse. It was all prototyping uh, with low cost components to do that because it's a difference between just, just a question about difference between um, the cost of you're doing prototyping and then. The cost of moving that up to a an industrial commercial system, mm -hmm. uh, are you would you be? Um, I guess who would your target audience be eventually? This is a great question. Thank you. So for the greenhouse, yes, uh, that's also also um, prototype or just kind of like proof of concept, but. With greenhouse, there is big difference in comparison to probably the the, the first uh, solution we uh, I, I mentioned and you asked about. So, the greenhouse idea was to have a solution which is cheap in terms of uh, components. And yes, you're right, definitely it's getting more expensive if we're considering uh, scaling it to like production ready solution, that, that's true. But still to prove that you could use, uh, and as uh, Vasily mentioned and showed on one slide, some really simple components which you can buy or get from disassembling some, I don't know, old car for instance, right? So that was number one, because uh, many speakers today mentioned that uh, the one of biggest issue for agriculture, right? Uh, especially countries which uh, do not have like uh, financial wealth and uh, it's much more complicated for them to introduce and implement uh, smart solutions because usually they today they're expensive I mean if you don't have proper support so that's number one make it cheap number two the idea was from software part to have it uh, easily distributable through like Linux package. So technically, again, you kind of like get the set of details if you want to try it locally. But if you consider to extend it, yeah, definitely you need to have um, some team of experts. When I say team, it's not exactly something very weak in terms of headcount. But yep, I would say you need some experts to be onboarded to help to scale it. And um, Vasily, do you have anything to add, or oh, Constantine? Uh, 
Uh, actually, I do have. So uh, our like uh, main business is to create uh, something which is ready for production. We have all necessary expertise like in supply chain, and manufacturing, logistics, uh, and how to scale. So we work directly with our clients uh, when necessary to consult regarding uh, upscaling, regarding uh, how to make it possible and how to make it cheap, as cheap as possible. Because initial stages of prototyping are usually quite expensive or R&D even more expensive. And then you uh, need to define how you organize all that production and we help our clients with that. So, but uh, as uh, Vlad mentioned, uh, those are like, we are trying different technologies and we have like uh, semi-ready solutions. As soon as we feel that we have demand, we have something to offer to the market basically. So this is our approach here, especially regarding hardware and embed. And Max, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, slightly about the hardware part of it. We have the, a lot of professionals related to the hardware design. I mean, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, and we can create the custom solution starting from the board. I mean, uh, of course, for the prototyping phase, it will be uh, of the shelf part, but for the pre-production alpha beta version of the device, it will be a fully customized solution that we can not e only uh, manufacture right here. We can uh, provide necessary documentation and everything that's involved there. So uh, in terms of getting closer to the production, it will be a fully custom solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will... Maybe you have it now? It's okay. Okay, perfect. So thank you again. Uh, all of you from FM Systems, really thank you. Okay, perfect. Here we are. So that's the end of the workshop and what a workshop is being. Uh, thank you all for taking part in this workshop dedicated to agriculture and data. We would especially like to thank each speaker for taking the time to join us today and present the projects they are working on. Uh, each presentation was truly enriching, so thank you again for that. Uh, I'd also like to thank Istia and its team for hosting this workshop, which is part uh, of the launch of the European Deep Farm project. Uh, as we mentioned el earlier, uh, the replay will be the replay of the event will be a, uh, available in a few days on Istia and Datum Academy YouTube channels, and you will also have the the integrality of the presentation document on both websites, so on Istia website and Datum Academy website. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the workshop as much as we did, if not more. Euh, maintenant, pour euh, l'audience francophone, donc euh, c'est la fin de ce workshop. Merci d'avoir été là avec nous. On aimerait euh, bien évidemment euh, remercier euh, chaleureusement les, euh, le, le panel d'experts, euh, d'intervenants qui euh, qu'on qu a accueillis aujourd'hui, que ce soit euh, sur site à l'Estia ou en distanciel. Merci beaucoup d'avoir pris le temps de nous rejoindre aujourd'hui, d'avoir présenté les projets sur lesquels vous travaillez, des projets qui étaient particulièrement intéressants tous les uns comme les autres. Euh, on aimerait aussi euh, accueillir... Euh, pardon, pas accueillir. On aimerait aussi euh, remercier chaleureusement Lestia et toute son équipe euh, technique euh, d'avoir... Euh, accueilli euh, ce workshop qui euh, est dans la continuité du projet Deep Farm, euh, projet qui a été lancé officiellement euh, hier, projet européen. Euh, donc euh, merci beaucoup à Alestia et, et toutes ses équipes. Euh, et comme on l'a mentionné, comme vous le voyez euh, à l'écran, euh, le replay euh, de l'événement sera disponible sur les chaînes YouTube de Lestia et de Datum Academy. Euh, L'intégralité du document de présentation de chaque speaker sera également disponible euh, sur les sites internet de l'Estia et de Datum Academy. Donc n'hésitez pas, si vous avez voilà, raté euh, quelques présentations ou quoi, vous pouvez toujours les, les revoir et parcourir ces projets euh, très très intéressants. Euh, merci encore à tous et, euh, et voilà, c'est la fin de la journée. Donc, euh, très bonne journée à tous. Have a nice day, everyone. And thank you. Thank you again. Bye.